What is up, everybody? Welcome to part two of the iMessage build. My name is Shadi, and if you are new here, this is part four of a multi-part tutorial series I am doing, so please check out part one. It is available somewhere at the top of the screen. Also, I have a Discord server where you can get direct access to me to ask me any questions about the project or to just chat about anything you would like, so please join that. The link is in the description. I would love to see you in there. So, I have not recorded a video for a while. I think it's been about six weeks or so since uh, I released part three of this series. And for those of you that saw my community post on YouTube, which I posted about six weeks ago, I was out of town. I was in New York City for about a month, so I was not able to record. However, I am back now and ready to release the remaining parts of the series. So once again, I apologize for the delay. I initially intended to have this series completed prior to leaving for New York. However, my schedule didn't go as planned and so I had to postpone this project. So thank you for your patience and thank you all for watching this series and supporting this channel. I really appreciate it. So a lot has changed in the past six weeks in the web development space. A lot of new packages have been released, specifically Next.js 13. For those of you that don't know much about Next.js 13, uh, they released, I think it was late October, I wanna say. So Next 13 introduces sort of a brand new way of developing Next.js applications that is completely different from Next 12. Okay, so for those of you that are interested, I'm just going to head over to the Next.js 13 documentation here. Um, and basically just very briefly talk about what changed and how it affects our project. Basically, the main change is that they introduced this new app directory into Next.js applications and it totally changes how you should develop your apps. So something that is important to note is that this app directory is currently in beta. And if you didn't notice, we are actually in the beta Next.js documentation. This is not the stable Next13 documentation. So this app directory is available to use and experiment with in Next13. However, you do not have to use the app directory in Next13, it's only experimental. And they're still recommending to do things the Next12 way. So if you look at the stable documentation um, up here, it would still have these same patterns as Next 12. So for this project, we are going to be updating all of our front end packages to the latest version because a lot has changed in six weeks. Um, so I think it's best to do a upgrade. It's very simple and we're actually not going to be using the app directory in Next 13. We're just going to use Next 13 um, as it is recommended currently in production by Next JS. We're not going to experiment with the app directory. Um, I'm working on future builds right now actually that do use the app directory um, and hopefully over the next few months they will move it out of a beta phase and into their stable phase. If you are interested in learning more about the app directory, I recommend just reading the documentation and just doing a YouTube search on uh, Next13 app directory or something and there's a, there's a lot of good videos out that give a good summary. So to summarize all that I just said, we are going to be updating all of our front end packages to their latest version, which will include Next13. However, we will not be using the experimental app directory and we'll continue using the stable recommended patterns in Next13. The other very notable change that has happened since I have been gone has been the release of Apollo Server V4. So if we go to the Apollo server documentation here, you'll notice that there is a new section on the V4 version. Before I left, V3 was the latest, and now it is V4. So what does that mean for us? So basically in Apollo server V4, they totally got rid of this Apollo server express package, and they also got rid of Apollo server core, and they just introduced a single package called Apollo server. So basically what's going to change in our app is we're going to be removing these two packages and just installing that in one new single Apollo server package. And we're just going to have to make some minor changes to the way our server is set up because some of these classes are going to be coming from that new Apollo server package. Now, luckily, as usual, Apollo provides outstanding documentation on how to do this, and they provide a very uh, clear set of steps to do that, and I'm going to be walking you through all of this. It's very, very simple, and it should take just a few minutes. And so that is how we're going to open up this new part is essentially just doing this upgrade of all of our packages, both on the front end and the back end, and then just doing these minor, minor refactoring 
just so that everything is up to date for you guys because I don't want to be teaching you guys old patterns. So I think it makes sense to do this upgrade, spend a few minutes refactoring the code so that we are doing things in the latest patterns. So we'll get all this out of the way so that we can jump quickly back into the actual fun parts of writing out the logic of the chat application. So for our refactor, we are going to be starting on the backend by installing this new Apollo server package, and we will refactor our Apollo server setup a little bit, and then we will jump to the front end and handle the next 13 upgrade. So in these Apollo v4 migration docs, we want to go to the section on migrating from Apollo server express. So here that is here. So we are currently using Apollo server express, as we can see up here in the code, and actually I'm just gonna zoom in there. So all we need to do is follow this set of steps here, install a few packages and adjust our code as they are showing here. They're showing you the Apollo Server 3 version and the Apollo Server 4 version. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is install these three packages here that they are recommending. So what I'm going to do is open up a new terminal to our backend directory here, and we're going to install these three packages here. The first one is going to be at Apollo slash server. The second one is going to be cores, and the third one is going to be body parser. All right, we will let those install here. So now that we've installed those packages to actually know what we need to change in the code uh, to make it a little bit easier, what I'm going to do is just go to my demo project because I did this exact migration in my demo project already. Uh, so if I go to this particular diff commit here, um, I'm just going to scroll down to the index file, our backend source index. I'll zoom in a bit here. I'm actually just going to make this a little bit bigger for now, shrink the code, and then when we're when we're done with this, I'll uh, I will put it back to the normal size. So essentially, what we're looking at here, um, I lost the file here. What we're looking at here is the difference between v3 on the left and v4. It shows us everything new that we need to add and everything that we need to remove. So things essentially just get rearranged a little bit, like our context is being moved down here into this express middleware function that is new. And I wanted to pull up this particular diff in GitHub because it really helps us visualize how our particular project is changing with v4. So we have these new packages installed, so let's go ahead and make these changes. So on the left here, what I'm going to do is just remove these top two imports from Apollo Server Core and Apollo Server Express. Just going to delete them. And you can see in this diff here, rather than using those two imports that we just got rid of, we are going to be using these three new ones. So I'm gonna copy these and just paste them at the top here. So this is that new Express middleware function that is coming from the new Apollo Server package, which is replacing Apollo Server Express. Okay, let's keep scrolling down here and see what we should do next. So what I'm going to do is remove this cache value from our Apollo Server, and I'm just going to comment out this context function as well. Um, what is going on here? All right, and all of this is going to remain the same. We can actually just remove this Apollo Server plugin landing page local default. That's a giant function name that is uh, not that fun to say. Um, okay, and then we can just keep, keep scrolling down here, and this is kind of where the major changes are coming with this uh, express middleware function. So we can completely remove this server.apply middleware function here, and instead we are going to be using our app instance from Express, and that is where we're going to put in our cores options as well as this new express middleware function. And that is where our context is going to be defined. So I'm just going to copy this lines uh, 98 to 109 here and just put that underneath here like this. And I think our cores options object is still defined up here, which is fine, but I'm just going to move it down here um, to kind of make it closer defined to where it's actually being used. And we can now get rid of this context here. All of this looks good. This looks fine, okay. And the last thing we need to do is just change this HTTP server dot listen function. So uh, if you scroll down to the diff here, rather than calling this dot listen function on HTTP server, we're going to be creating a new promise and inside of that promise, we're going to be calling that function. So we can just simply remove all of this and we can paste in this newly defined promise. And all of these differences are exactly what they're doing in the documentation. And then we can just put on this quick console log underneath this promise here once it's resolved to say that we are successfully listening on our server port 4000. So what I'm going to do is try to run this server here. It looks like it's running completely fine. Let's restart it and um, 
confirm that. Cool. So if you made all of those changes and they are correct, you should be able to successfully boot up your server and not see any errors and just see that it is successfully running on port 4000. So that is all the changes that we need to make to this backend index file here with our Apollo server. Everything seems to be working completely fine. What we're going to do now is uninstall those deprecated packages. So I'm going to run an npm uninstall Apollo server express and Apollo server core. Now, after running that, if we go to our backend package.json file, they should be gone from here. And the only Apollo package we should see is this Apollo server package. Now, after uninstalling those two packages, we're going to get this issue here saying that we do not have the types for cores installed in our repository. So we need to go ahead and do that. So it gives you a command here that we can run. So let's copy that and paste that in our backend directory. And that should remove this error here in just a second. Cool, so that is resolved. Now, after uninstalling those two packages, we are going to run into some issues in some of our other files because we're using those two packages in our other files. Like in our type definition files, we are using this GQL function from Apollo Server Core, and so we will need to fix this. And the other files you're going to see that have issues are going to be our resolver files because in V3, we were using this Apollo error function coming from Apollo Server Core, and that no longer exists. So what we need to do is essentially just remove this line from all of our resolver files and replace all invocations of this Apollo error function with a different function. And the new error function that we're going to use is going to come directly from the GraphQL package. And this is going to be GraphQL error. So what I'm going to do is do a code base wide search for invocations of Apollo error. I'm just going to replace this all with GraphQL error. So we don't have to do it manually. So let's replace all of those seven occurrences. So we can save that. So our user resolvers are good. Let's go look at our other ones. So conversations. We just need to change this import here from Apollo Server Core to GraphQL, just like that. And conversations is good. If we go to scalers, that one's good. And if we go to index, that is good. So it's only user. So yeah, so currently we only have user resolvers and conversation resolvers. So those are the only two files that we need to update that import to be this GraphQL error. So that concludes the error handling change. The other change is the first one I mentioned, which is this GQL tag function coming from Apollo Server Core. So let's start off with messages. What we're going to do is just remove this package and we're going to install a new package called GraphQL tag. So let's come to our backend terminal here and let's run npm install. And this is going to be called GraphQL, GraphQL dash tag. Awesome. And now what we need to do is just come up here and import GQL from GraphQL tag, just like that. Okay, so I'm going to copy this import statement, come into our user type defs and replace it here like this, as well as in our conversation type defs. Awesome. And so those are all the changes that we need to make in order to successfully migrate from Apollo v3 to v4. And what I'm going to do for your convenience is I will link this diff in the description of this video so that you can directly access it yourself and you can see all of the differences in the Apollo v3 to v4 migration. And that will be this commit here. You'll be able to see all of the differences in all of the files that happened um, when migrating from v3 to v4. So I'm going to call this commit Apollo v4 migration. I will commit that and I'll push it so that you have access to it. Cool. So let's just make sure our backend is still successfully running. <laughs> uh, it seems to be running completely fine. So we should be good to go and we can now move on to our front end. So what we're going to do is I am going to open up a terminal window, but to our front end directory here. And for our front end, instead of just upgrading um, a few of the packages, we are going to be upgrading all of our packages. Um, and I actually didn't know how to do this before this tutorial, I actually learned how to do this uh, just a few moments ago. But yeah, essentially, uh, there is a way to upgrade every single one of your packages in your repository, if that is what you choose to do. Um, so in our case, we are going to do that. And the solution I found that I liked was um, on this Stack Overflow article here, and I will link this in the description for you guys. But essentially what we're going to do is be installing a package called npm check updates, and then we can run this 
command from that package and then it will update our package.json to have all of the latest package versions that are available on NPM and then we would just install those packages. So I've already installed uh, NPM check updates globally. So we'll go ahead and run this command. I'll zoom in a bit here in case it's a bit small. And then in this front end directory, we want to run the command ncnu u. And this is going to go and reach out to NPM and it's going to give us a list of all of the packages that need to be updated and the version that we currently have, as well as the version that it's going to be upgraded to, which is the latest version on NPM. Now, it looks like pretty much all of our front end packages uh, need upgrades or have been updated since I last worked on this project six weeks ago. Um, but the ones that I want to point out here are Next. So we can see here that previously we were working with Next 12 and now we are in Next 13. And the other one is Apollo Client. Previously we were on 3.6.9 and now we're going to 3.7.1. And there is a minor change that we're going to have to make in our front end code um, that is new in 3.7.1. So running that ncnu-u command that we just ran, uh, if we go take a look at our package.json in our front end, all of the package versions have been updated. So you can see, for example, that next is now 13.0.6. However, we have not installed these versions yet. So to do that, we just, we just need to simply run npm install. So go ahead and do that so that our node modules are actually upgraded to these versions. But let's go ahead and make sure that this is successfully going to work with all of these new packages. Okay, so the front end is running. Our back end is running. So if I go back to the app and just refresh, let's make sure that everything loads up properly, <laughs> which it does not. Okay, we're getting some weird errors here. Cannot resolve modules. Okay, I didn't actually see this in my uh, demo project. Let's go to localhost 3000. Type error matches dot sum is not a function. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on here. What I'm going to try to do is, hmm, I'm gonna to attempt to just delete the node modules. Sometimes this, this works. Um, so I deleted the front end node modules folder. And I'm also going to delete this next folder here. This uh, next folder is basically just like a cache build of uh, your development application. So I'm going to shut down our front end, which it's not seeming to let me do. I don't know what's happening here. It seems to be like freezing up. <laughs> what is going on? I'm going to terminate this process. Our back end's fine. Um, it's because I had the front end running on two, two things. What directory am I in here? Uh, okay, so I just, maybe it was because I was, I'm not sure what was happening there, honestly. Um, I'm just going to try to reinstall the node modules by running npm install. So yeah, if you ever delete your node modules folder, make sure you run npm install again to reinstall all of those packages. This is taking a few seconds here. Okay, that's done. Let's go ahead and try to run this one more time. If the issue persists, I might have to look into this a bit more. I'm not too sure what's happening. Okay, that seemed to solve it. Okay, but I think we're going to need to regenerate our um, Prisma client. Yeah, because we deleted our node modules. So what we're going to do, I'm just gonna shut this down for a sec, and I'm going to run that uh, Prisma generate command, which is going to be npx Prisma generate, and then we're going to tell it where our schema is. This is going to be in the Prisma schema dot Prisma file, just like this. That regenerates our client. Let's rerun our development server for the third time. Refresh, and hopefully this works. And it does, amazing. Okay, so yeah, deleting the node modules and then just reinstalling the packages seems to work. Usually when I get those really weird type errors, like the one we just saw, where it's like some function that we haven't even defined in our own code base. Um, usually it's it's some dependency in, in the node modules. So if you ever see a weird error, I would recommend trying that as a first step. And if the issue persists, then dig into it a little bit more. But it seemed to solve it for us here. Um, 
and we seem to be exactly where we were before. However, now we have all of these upgraded packages and we are using the latest packages available to us at the time of this recording, which is December 4th, 2022. So that is it for our front end refactor. We actually didn't even have to refactor anything. We just upgraded all our packages and we can now proceed with continuing to develop our chat application. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to close all of these files here. So the place we're going to pick up on is going to be inside of our feed wrapper component. Uh, if you remember from part three, the last uh, component we created was this message header component. Um, and now we're going to get very heavily into the flow of creating messages. Uh, I believe I mentioned that at the end of part three, but that is what our focus is going to be now, which is probably uh, some of the most exciting stuff of this build. That's the fun part of a chat app is actually sending messages. Essentially inside of this feed wrapper component, we are going to create the actual input that users are going to type these messages into. So what we're going to do is inside of our messages folder here, we are going to create a new component called input. So we can create a file called input.tsx. So let's go ahead and create this component. So I'm gonna call it message input. And this is going to be a functional component here. And then at the bottom, I'm just going to export default message input like that. And let's define an interface for our props. So we can say interface message input props. And this is going to take in two props. The first one is going to be our session. So we want to import session from next auth as well as the conversation ID so that when we send a message, we actually know what conversation we are sending it to. Okay, inside of the input here, I'm going to destructure the props and these props are going to be of type message input props. So we can grab the session as well as the conversation ID off of those props. So as the name message input suggests, we are going to have to create an actual text input for our users to type into. Let's go ahead and create the structure. So this component is going to return a box component. So import that from Chakra. And we are going to give this a padding of four in the X direction, a padding of six in the Y direction. And we're going to give this a width of 100%. Okay, and for now, just so this shows up on the UI, I'm going to show uh, some text. Here is the input. <laughs> okay, and then in our feed wrapper, um, we need to place this component and this is going to actually go outside of this flex container here. So we can import, um, we can, so, so we can use our message input component, just like that. And this is complaining. Okay, we just have to wrap this in a fragment. There we go. Okay, so now this is showing up on the UI. We have, here is the input. So now let's go back into that component and actually style it. But first, actually, let's pass these props in. So you can say session is equal to uh, session. And we want to pass in our conversation ID. And this is going to be conversation ID. I'm just going to shrink this down a little bit here. Perfect. All right, let's go back into this input component here. We are going to wrap our input in a form so that the user can press enter to submit the form. And our form is going to have an on submit function, which we will define in a second here. I'm just gonna make this an empty callback for now. Inside of this form, we are going to define an input, and input, sorry, import this input <laughs> from Chakra, like this, do a self-closing tag. And we are going to need to create some state for this input to represent the text that the user is actually typing into the input. So at the top of the component here, let's define that. We can call this state message body and the set function can be set message body. And we are going to pull in the use state hook from React and we can initialize the state as an empty string. All right, so now we can use that state on our input to make it a controlled input. So the value of our input is going to be message body. And the on change function for this input is going to be a simple callback function that takes the change event 
and pulls the value from the target of that event and sets it as the message body. So we can say event dot target dot um, value. And that is going to be the text that the user has typed into the input. So you can see here that this is showed up on the screen. It looks pretty nice. It's at the bottom here. The width is 100% and um, the padding looks looks pretty good. Uh, I think the default size of this is medium, but for some reason in the demo, I have a size medium. I'm not too sure. I think we are safe putting that in there, size medium. And we want to give this a placeholder. So we can say placeholder and the placeholder is going to be new message. Cool, that looks really good. And we want to add some focus and hover styling here. So let's move this um, on change up a bit. I like to have my value and on change as the first two props uh, as an input and kind of the placeholder as the third and then everything else like styling and sizes and whatever can go underneath that because these are sort of the, the main most important ones I think. So let's define some focus state here. So we can use our focus pseudo class selector underscore focus. When we are focused we want to have a box shadow of none we want to give this a border of one pixel solid, and we want to give it a border color of white alpha 300. And underneath this, we're going to give it some hover styling. And the hover styling we're going to give it is going to be a border color of white alpha. Am I getting, uh, why am I not getting autocomplete on my colors? I think I used to, that's weird. White alpha 300. Awesome, okay. So, um, awesome, okay, so that seems to be working. I think the hover and the border, I think without this, what happens without this? I don't really know why I have that defined in the demo. I don't think we need this, actually. <laughs> okay, let's get rid of that. Maybe there, maybe there was a reason, but it doesn't seem to be. But now on focus, there isn't that annoying, like, um, two pixel border or outline, uh, which I, I personally didn't like. Plus in the real iMessage desktop application. Okay, and we're also going to pass in a resize value of none. And what this does is it essentially prevents the input from resizing um, on its own when the screen size changes. So this looks good. This looks like a really nice chat application interface, both on mobile and desktop. And you can see what it looks like uh, kind of without the console open there. And this is kind of to, and this is kind of how the classic chat application looks. You have, you know, your feed here at, uh, as your main content and then the input at the bottom and I can type into it, blah, 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 blah. And that input is stateful and we can confirm that by just taking a look at this input. We can see that state inside of our message input is currently empty. And if I start typing into it, it updates, so we have a stateful controlled input, which is great. Let's define what is going to happen when the user actually submits this form and sends a message. So there is quite a bit of work to do there because it's a kind of uh, important task. So what we're going to do is define this on submit function that should go on this form. So we can call this function on send message. And this message is going to be communicating with, sorry, this function is going to be communicating <laughs> with our back end. So it is going to be asynchronous. And this function is going to take in a react.form event because the user can press enter to submit the form uh, and that event is going to be sent to this function and the type of that event is a form event. So in this function, what we want to do is prevent the default behavior, which is refreshing the page. We don't want to refresh the page when the user sends a message that is terrible user experience. And then we're going to define a try catch block in here and inside of the try block is where we're actually going to fire the send message mutation, which is going to write the message to our database and put that message into our feed in both the sender's UI as well as the uh, receiver's UI. And this is uh, another subscription that we're going to have to define because it is real time behavior. So inside of this try block, I'm just going to leave a message, um, sorry, a comment <laughs> that, that says, um, call send message mutation that is coming soon. And inside of the catch block, what we are going to do 
is first type this error as any, and we're just going to log the error. We're going to say on send message error and log the error. And then we can also display a toast.error to our user to give them a nice UI experience. And we can say the body of that toast error is going to be the error message, just like that. What would be the next logical step? I think the next logical step would be to define the send message mutation. So what we're going to do is go to our backend now and set up our backend to define this send message mutation um, so that when that's all done, we can just come back to our front end and easily call that mutation via the use mutation hook and our backend will just do everything it is supposed to. Okay, so let's put a pause on our front end for now. So I'm gonna close this uh, folder here. And inside of our backend, we're going to go first, define the typedef for our new send message mutation. So we can go into our backend source, GraphQL, typedefs. We want to go into our messages file. And inside of our typedefs GraphQL string, we're going to need to define the send message mutation so that it can be added to our GraphQL schema. So to define a mutation, as we've seen before, we can say type mutation. And the name of this mutation is going to be send message. It's going to take in some inputs that we'll define in a second here. And the return type is just going to be a Boolean of whether or not the message was successfully sent. We don't need to return anything here like the new message because this is going to trigger, this is going to trigger some subscription that is going to fire on all of the clients that are involved in the conversation. And that subscription is going to be responsible for sending the new, the, uh, new message to the clients so that it can be updated on the UI. We don't need this actual mutation to return anything. The subscription is going to handle sending the payload of the message to the clients that are involved. So what arguments do we need to pass to our send message mutation? The first one is going to be the actual ID of the message, which is going to be of type string. The second one is going to be the conversation ID because we need to know what conversation this message is being sent in. We need to know the sender ID. So we can create a variable called sender ID. This is going to be of type string. And we also need the actual body of the string, or sorry, of the message, which is of type string. And the body is the stuff that the user is actually typing into the input, which is in pretty, which is pretty important information for us to know. And that is it. That is all um, we need to do here. And while we're here in our messages typedef file, I'm actually going to define the subscription that is going to fire when a message is sent. And that is the subscription I was talking about just a few moments ago uh, that is going to be responsible for transmitting the payload of the new message to all of the conversation clients. And I want to define this here now just to give some insight slash foreshadowing as to where we're going so that you kind of can build this context in your head so that um, you can kind of start to piece together the big picture here. So we can define the subscription by saying type subscription. The name of the subscription is going to be message sent. So this is going to fire every time a message is sent, hence the name message sent. And the only input we're going to need to accept in this message sent subscription is going to be the conversation ID. And why that is will make more sense when we actually build out the resolver for this subscription. And this is going to return a entity of type message. And so that's what I was saying, where the subscription is going to be responsible for pushing the whole message structure to our client. Uh, this send message mutation does not have to do that because this is going to do that. So now that we have defined our type definitions, let's go and define our send message mutation resolver function. Inside of resolvers, we actually have not yet created a file for our messages because this is the first time we're dealing with message mutations and resolvers. So let's go ahead and create that file, message.ts. So inside of this file, we're going to create an object called resolvers, and we're just going to make that the default export, just like our other um, resolver files. And inside of here, we are going to define our section for query. For now, it's going to be an empty object. We are going to have mutation, is it mutations plural or singular? Mutation is singular. Mutation as well as subscription, empty object. Okay, 
And to actually make these resolver functions available in our GraphQL schema, we need to go to our index resolver fun uh, file here and import that in. So we can say import message resolvers from slash message. And all we need to do is just simply add that into this merged um, instance here. So message resolvers, just like that. So now our message resolvers will be available on our GraphQL schema because we have defined the type definitions as well as the resolvers. So let's go see if our backend is throwing any errors. It doesn't seem to be, so our schema should be totally fine um, because in order for our server to successfully start, our types and resolvers need to line up. So we should be good to go. So what we're gonna do now is start writing out that um, send message mutation. And the query, and just uh, to give you some insight into where we're going in a little bit here, the query section is going to have a query called messages, and this is going to be what fires to actually fetch the messages in a particular conversation. So when I click on this conversation, we're going to go fetch all of the um, messages in that conversation and display them on the UI. Um, so that is what is going to be in here coming soon. Uh, mutation is going to have our send message function, which we're going to build out right now. And then subscription is where we're going to define that message send subscription. Let's create that function send message. So we can define that function as an asynchronous function. And the arguments for this function are going to be very similar to our other resolver functions. So what I'm going to do is just go ahead and copy and paste um, these inputs from a different resolver file. And we'll just adjust them as we need. So let's paste those in here and import our GraphQL context. And this function is going to return a promise with a Boolean inside of it. Promise Boolean, just like that. Okay, and we need to just finish defining this. What is going on here? So I have some sort of syntax error. Oh, I don't need the arrow function. There we go. Okay, and then I'm just going to return true to make that TypeScript return uh, error fall, uh, go away. So for our send message arguments, we are not taking in a username, so we need to define an interface that represents the structure of that input. So let's go ahead and do that. And we are going to define that in our backend types file. So let's go to backend source util slash types, and let's create a message section messages. Cool, and I actually saw a mini typo up here. Se sever, severe, sever configuration, <laughs> server configuration. I wonder how many of you noticed that when I first did that, I did not I did not obviously. So uh, under messages, uh, the first, so we're, so we're going to have a, a bunch of different interfaces for our messages, but uh, the first one here that we're interested in is the, is the one for our arguments. So we can say export interface, send message arguments. And as we saw from our type definitions, these are the inputs that we are going to need to take in. So I'm just gonna split screen this um, to draw the parallel here. So on our send message arguments, we are passing in an ID, which is of type string. We are passing in a conversation ID, also type string, a sender ID, as well as a message body type string. All type strings. Awesome, so now if we go back to messages, we can type our arguments as send message arguments. Perfect. Let's close this off. So what we're going to do is, as usual, we are going to destructure our context and we're going to grab off our user session, the Prisma client, as well as our PubSub instance. Now, the first thing we're going to do is check that the user is authenticated. So we're going to say, if there is no session.user, let's throw a new GraphQL error. Make sure that imports from GraphQL. And the error we want to pass is just going to say not authorized, as usual. All right, if we make it past this if statement and the user is authenticated, we are going to go ahead and destructure the ID from that session so we can get the user ID. Uh, why is this complaining? Property does not exist on type session. 
sorry, this is session <laughs> dot user. There we go. And we are going to destructure our arguments. And the things we want are ID. This is going to be message ID. I'm just going to alias this as message ID so that there's some clarity because we have a bunch of IDs. Our sender ID, conversation ID, as well as our body. And actually also what we're going to do is we're going to add some server side verification that the user making this request, um, which is the sender ID, matches the ID coming from the session on our back end. Okay, and this would add some security and prevent people from sending messages on other people's behalf. This isn't something you would totally need to add uh, because obtaining another user's ID would be challenging, um, but it just adds some security. And so I kind of want to show you guys how, how to do that. So we want to tell them that they're not authorized to send a message unless they're signed in, which is what we're currently doing with this if statement here. But we also want to verify um, that the sender ID matches the session of the user that is currently signed in. Um, and we also want to throw a not authorized error if that is the case. So we want to say if user ID does not equal sender ID, we want to throw the same unauthorized error here. And why is this not happy? Whoops, um, we're just going to need to put this up here. There we go. All of this can just go up here. There we go. So we are saying that if they're not signed in, you cannot send a message. And if your ID does not match the ID of the currently signed in user, you are also not authorized to send a message. So this would prevent people from sending messages on other people's behalf should they somehow obtain another user's ID. Okay, now underneath here is where the core logic of this function is going to live. So we're going to create a try catch block. And inside of this try block is where we're going to actually create the new message entity in our database, as well as update our conversation entity to make the latest message ID the ID of this new message. And also we're going to update our conversation participant entities um, to indicate whether or not they have read this latest message. And uh, we will see that very shortly. So let's comment our code here. So we can say create, create new message. If I could type properly, <laughs> I can't seem to type today. Uh, okay, so create new message entity. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to create a new variable called new message. And this is going to communicate with our database so we can use our Prisma client and we want to create a message. So we can say prisma.message and call our create function. Inside of here, we're going to pass in a value for our data object, which is going to be the structure of the document that we're actually storing. So this is going to need an ID, and this ID is going to be message ID. We are going to make, okay, we are going to set the sender ID to be the ID sent via the arguments. We are going to put in the conversation ID as well as the body. And how, again, nice is it that we get this autocomplete with TypeScript? I love it. I just love TypeScript, it's just like too good. <laughs> okay, and now we can specify the data we want returned from Prisma and our database um, on this new message entity. And so we want to make this a populated message so we can use our message populated instance, which I actually don't think we have created yet. Um, no, we have not. So if you remember, if I go into conversations, it's been a while, so I'll refresh your memory here. Um, if you go into conversation resolvers, if you go to the very bottom, we used to, we created these Prisma validator um, variables here that represent the structure of the entities that we wanted returned from our database. And so we created these variables called um, conversation populated, participant populated, which essentially just represents the full structure of the entity that we need and want on our front end. And we were just specifying what values we wanted to include from this particular uh, entity in our database. So we're going to do the same thing for our messages. Let's come down to the bottom here and create this message populated variable. And this is going to be created using the prisma.validator. And so let's import prisma from prisma client. Okay, and this is going to take in a generic type, which is going to be of type prisma dot message include, which is given to us by our Prisma client when we ran that npx prisma generate command. 
then we can invoke this function, and then we can specify what values we want included on our populated message entity. So we are going to want information about the sender of this message, and the fields we want are going to be the ID, so we can select ID and select the username. So we can say ID and username are going to be of type true. And so now when this new message is created, those fields are going to be automatically returned to us on that new message. So now if I were to say new message dot sender dot username or ID, they're available to us. Without this, if I were to remove those, we would not have those fields available to us. So now TypeScript knows, well, oh, you didn't specify on your message populated entity that you were returning this information about the sender, so therefore I, I, I don't know that it's there. Uh, whereas if I uncomment this, now TypeScript is like, okay, you specified those things are going to be included, therefore I know that those values are going to be on this new message entity. So TypeScript being a superhero once again, <laughs> pretty cool. So now after creating our message, we've successfully taken this new message and written it to the database, we want to update our conversation entity. So we can say update conversation entity. What do we want to do to our conversation? Well, we want to update the latest message ID to be the ID of this new message, which can safely be considered the latest message. And we also want to update the conversation participants to have this message be marked as unread. Okay. So we're going to create a variable called conversation, and this is going to represent the newly updated conversation. And we are going to want to call prisma.conversation.update. And inside of here, we want to specify which conversation we're updating. So we want to update the conversation where the ID is equal to the conversation ID. And then inside of the data object, we can specify what updates we are making to this particular conversation. So what we're going to do is update our conversation's latest message ID to be the new messages ID. So we can say new message dot ID. And again, as I mentioned before, we want to update our conversation participants to either have seen this latest message or have not seen this latest message. So inside of participants, what we want to do is update a few different things. Um, the first update we're going to make is going to be to the participant where the ID is equal to the sender ID. So we're updating the per, uh, conversation participant entity that belongs to the sender of this message. And the update we're making to this conversation participant entity is we want to say has seen the latest message. We want this to be true because we want to mark this message as read for the sender of this message because obviously they've read it they wrote it. So we don't want to make it unread to them. That'd be kind of weird if um, I sent a message in a chat and then I got a notification saying, oh, this conversation has a new message in it. Uh, and this message is sent by you. That just doesn't make sense from a user experience point of view. So on the flip side of that, we want to update all of the other participants in this conversation who are not the sender to make this converse, sorry, to make this message unread. So to do that, we can say update many because we are updating uh, more than one conversation participant entity, or we're, we're, so we're updating one or more than one conversation participant entity. So we can say update many, and we want to say where. So if I do uh, in control spacebar, you can see all of the options we can do with Prisma here. So so we are going to use this not operator. So we're going to say we want to update all of the conversation participants in this conversation that do not have a user ID that is equal to the sender ID. So this is everyone but the sender. The update we're making to all of these entities, which we can put inside of this data object, we want to make the has seen latest message false. So hopefully this makes sense from a chat application logic point of view. Shadi sends a message to Dua Lipa and Elon Musk. Shadi has obviously read that message because I wrote it. However, Dua Lipa and Elon Musk have not seen that message. Therefore, we are going to say um, Dua Lipa and Elon Musk have not seen this, so has seen latest message is false. For Shadi, it's going to be true. So this is why I love Prisma so much, is because we can update all of these relational entities in just like a single statement. Like, yeah, this kind of looks like a, a, um, a lot of lines and kind of confusing, but once you learn the syntax of Prisma, 
this is so powerful. Like doing what we're doing here without Prisma would suck. It would require just a bunch of manual separate operations. Like I'd have to fetch the conversation from the database and then I'd have to fetch the uh, conversation participants from the database and manually update them according to this logic. And it's just so easy in one write, we can do all that with Prisma. So uh, hopefully you're seeing the value in Prisma and why it's so powerful. Now, after successfully writing the new message to the database and updating our conversation entity, there are a couple things we have to do with subscriptions here. The first one is we want to update all of our connected clients that a new message has been sent so that they can receive that message in real time. And this is where that message sent uh, subscription is going to come into play. And we also want to fire off a conversation updated event, which I don't believe we have defined yet. Um, conversation created. Yes, we do not yet have the conversation updated subscription event, but that's going to be coming soon. Um, but essentially, because we've updated our conversation entity to have um, this new information on it, we need to also alert our clients of that event so that they can receive that latest updated information so that their browser knows, okay, something happened on our backend, our conversation entity was updated. Um, I need to be aware of that so I can update the UI for our users. And it's through that subscription that we're going to be able to display that latest message text on this conversation item thing in the side, side uh, panel here. And also through that subscription, we're going to be able to mark these conversation items as read or unread. So that is why we need to create the conversation updated subscription. So as we've seen before, to do that, we need to call our PubSub instance and publish these two events. So our first event is going to be a message sent event. And this is going to call the subscription message sent. And this is going to pass the new message to that subscription. Okay, we have not yet defined the subscription down here yet, but we will very shortly here. And the second one we're going to define is going to be that um, conversation updated subscription event. So that is going to have the key conversation updated updated and this is going to call the conversation updated subscription, which we have not yet defined. And this is going to pass in the conversation entity. And this conversation entity is this newly updated conversation that we just did all these updates to. And that is how we're going to pass these updates to our client. Inside of the catch block, what we're going to do is just log the error as usual, send message error. And we will also throw a new GraphQL error that says error sending message. Okay, and yeah, we can leave this return true statement here because if all of the try block succeeds, that means everything went as planned. We can just return true, meaning that the message was successfully sent and all of the related relevant entities were updated. That is it for our send message mutation and it should now be ready to be consumed by our front end. What we need to do is still define these subscriptions. So I'm just gonna comment out this conversation updated subscription because we haven't even defined uh, this in our type definitions. And we are now going to look at defining this message sent subscription resolver function down here. So as we saw before in our type defs, for our messages, we just a few minutes ago defined the subscription so we are safe to define our resolver function for that subscription. So let's come down to the uh, subscription object in our message resolvers, and let's define message sent. Now, with our message sent subscription, we are going to want to use that with filter function that we saw um, with our conversation created subscription, because we want to control which clients this event is published to, right? We don't want to tell every single one of our chat applications users that a new message was sent because that just does not make sense. Could you imagine if you were notified or if your browser <laughs> was notified every time any Facebook user on the planet sent a message, uh, that would be absolutely terrible and it would not scale and things would just, that just it makes zero sense. So it's very clear why we'd want to use the with filter function because we want to control who we're sending these events to. We only want to send that event to the other people in that conversation. Uh, so hopefully that makes sense and is intuitive. 
Okay, so for our message send subscription, we are going to define a subscribe function, and this is going to call that with filter function. So make sure that imports from GraphQL subscriptions. And the with filter function, if you recall, is going to take the same three arguments as any regular resolver function, which is going to be the parent, the arguments, as well as the context. Uh, we don't need the first two in this case, so we're just going to say underscore for the parent, double underscore for the uh, arguments, because we're not taking in any arguments to this uh, with filter function, as well as the GraphQL context. So this is going to be of type GraphQL context. And we're not getting autocomplete because I think we need to define the function like this. Okay, I've done something royally incorrect here with defining this function. Um, wait, no, I, I don't see. Okay, sorry. <laughs> the first argument is a callback function. Sorry, it's been it's been a while. You can tell it's been six weeks since I've recorded um, this series. <laughs> Need to refresh my memory. And the second argument is going to also be a callback function. And this is where the logic of our function is going to go. Okay, so I'm going to paste these arguments in here like this. And this with filter function it needs to return, if you remember, the pub sunk, pub sunk. Oh man, I was trying to say pub sub and async at the same time, pub sunk. <laughs> so our with filter function needs to return a pub sub async iterator invocation with the actual subscription event name, which from our conversation created, you can see it was this all caps conversation underscore created. And for our message sent, we have defined it as message underscore sent. So let's do that. Let's return our uh, pub sub async iterator. But to do that, we need to actually access our pub sub instance, and we can do that on our context. Is equal to context pub sub. Okay, and we just want to return pub sub dot async iterator, and the this is going to take in an argument of all the um, events that we want to be listened to here. And the only one we care about in here is message sent. This second callback function in the with filter function is going to take in a payload arguments as well as our GraphQL context once again. So for these three here, we are going to have a payload, payload, and this is going to be of type message sent subscription payload, which we're going to define in a second here in our types file. Actually, you know what, let's just go do that now. We'll say types in our backend types in the message section here. We're going to define that type. So we're gonna say export interface uh, message sent subscription payload. And this is going to have an object. Okay, and the structure of this, there's going to be a key with the subscription name. So this is going to be message sent. And the payload that the subscription is receiving is going to be a populated message because if we go back to um, this section here, where we're actually calling our, or sorry, we're publishing our message sent event, we are sending this new message as a payload to that subscription. And so inside of our subscription, we are going to be receiving an object with message sent and the type is going to be message populated. Okay, and we need to define the type of message populated because we have not done that yet. And just like the conversation and participant populated types up here. We are going to use our Prisma client to do this. So we can say export type uh, message populated. This is going to be equal to Prisma dot message get payload. And this is going to take a generic type with the include statement of our message populated. Why is this not populated? Why is this not auto importing? Hmm, that's super weird. Let's come up here and manually import it. So we can go up GraphQL resolvers message and we want to do message populated. No clue why that did not import and it's still not. Oh, wow, okay, sorry, I'm so sorry. This is supposed to be the type of message populated, not the message populated entity itself. Okay, back in our, um, message send subscription. We now have this type defined, so let's import this from our utility types. And the second argument that this is going to take is going to be our actual args 
input, and this is going to only have a conversation ID, and this is going to be of type string. And if you remember from, again, our message type defs, we have defined that in here, that the subscription is only taking a single argument, which is the conversation ID. And the reason that is, is because we need to know which conversation we want to emit this subscription to, right? And that goes back to what I was saying before with the whole with filter function. We need to know um, which users to send it to, and we want to send it to all the users in this particular conversation. Therefore, we need to know what conversation it is, and that is why we are passing in the conversation ID as an argument. Okay, and the third um, input to this callback function in the with filter is going to be our context, and this is of type GraphQL context. Okay, this is a super mad because we're not returning a Boolean. And just to refresh your memory, the with filter function must return a Boolean, and that Boolean represents whether or not we should emit this subscription event to a particular client. Now, we only want to emit this event inside of the conversation that this message was sent. So we can say, we want to return a Boolean, and that Boolean is going to represent the statement that the conversation ID of the sent message matches the conversation ID of the arguments. So the message sent event is only going to be fired for this particular conversation. And this should make more sense once we go back to the front end and start querying for messages in this conversation. Because what we're going to do is query for the messages using a conversation ID, and then we're going to define a subscribe to more function like we did with our conversations. So we're going to subscribe to new messages in this conversation so that I can get those real-time updates and those newly sent messages when I'm looking at a particular conversation. And therefore, we only want to emit this event for that specific conversation that the user is currently viewing. So now that we have a way to send messages via the send message mutation, and we have a way to send those new messages to our clients in real time, via this message sent subscription. The last thing we need to do with this message flow is define our initial message query. So as I was kind of saying before, when I click on a particular conversation, I want to query for all of the messages in that conversation so that I can see them in my feed. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. We're going to head back to our message type defs and add this query to our type definitions here. We'll do that uh, between the, the message type and the mutation type. So we're going to define a new query. So we're going to say type query. And inside of here, the query name is going to be messages. And this is going to take in a single argument. And it's going to be the conversation ID. And we're only querying for messages in a particular conversation. And this is going to return an array of message entities. So we can save that. So now we have it defined in our type definitions we can come back to our resolvers. So let's define that. So we can say messages. This is going to be an asynchronous function. And this is going to take in those same three parameters. So I'm gonna copy these here, paste them in. Um, we are not going to have arguments of structure send message arguments. The arguments for this query, as we just saw in our type definitions, this is going to be a conversation ID, and this is going to be of type string. This is going to return a promise, and inside of that promise is going to be an array of populated messages. So we can bring in our message populated types. Okay, so I'm just going to, to remove this um, that type script return error. I'm just going to return an empty array for now. Okay, so inside of this function, we are going to, at the very top here, do the usual context destructuring. So we can grab the session as well as Prisma. We do not need our PubSub instance inside of this query because we're not going to be publishing any events. And we're going to destructure our conversation ID off of our arguments, just like that. Inside of this resolver function, there are a few things that we want to do to ensure that this user is authorized to actually perform this query. The first one is going to be our usual, making sure that the user is actually signed in. So we can say, if there is no session user, throw an error that says not authorized. Okay, next thing we want to do is verify that the user making this query is actually a participant in this conversation. 
right? Because we're passing in a conversation ID to this query. Um, we want to make sure that this user performing this query is a part of that conversation. Uh, so if you look over at the browser here, we can see that the conversation ID is in the URL. So let's say that um, Apple and Google <laughs> are having a conversation in this application, and that conversation has some particular ID. And let's say now that Amazon <laughs> obtains that ID somehow. They, they know the conversation ID. Um, if they were, if Amazon were to visit this URL, they would be able to receive messages between Apple and Google in that particular conversation. Now that's probably not good. Uh, we don't want users being able to view messages in other conversations that they're not a part of. So that is why we want to make sure, okay, is the user making this query a participant in this conversation? So how do we do that? So we can grab the user ID from the session uh, ID, and then this is going to be the user ID. Okay, so this is the ID of the user that is making the request. And I'm gonna leave a comment here that says, verify that user is a participant. So the first thing we're going to do is check and make sure that this conversation exists in the first place. So let's try and query this conversation from our database. So we can say const conversation is equal to await and call prisma.conversation. And we want to find unique because there should only be one conversation with this particular ID. And we want to see if there's an conversation that exists where the ID is equal to the conversation ID that is passed as an argument. Okay, so what we can do is we can say, if there is no conversation at all, we can just throw a new GraphQL error that says conversation not, uh, not found. So let's say that in my browser, um, I were to visit some like random ID, conversation ID, there is not a conversation with this ID. Um, so we want to alert the user that that conversation does not exist. So this isn't really part of our security thing. It's just part of like checking and making sure that um, that conversation is exists. Modify this comment, make sure, or I guess um, verify that conversation exists and user is participant. Now let's verify that the user is allowed to view the messages in this conversation. So what I'm going to do is define a utility function called user is conversation participant because we're going to be using this function in a few different places throughout our application on our backend. So we're going to define a function that can be reused rather than having to rewrite uh, logic. So I think we have a utility function file defined yet and it's currently empty. But in here, we're going to define a function called user is conversation participant. Now, this function is going to return a Boolean that represents whether or not the user of interest is part of the conversation of interest. So what we're going to do is make this function take in an array of conversation participants, as well as a user ID. And we're going to check, is there a, is there a participant with the ID of this user? So we can say that the first argument is of type array of participant populated, and the second argument is going to be that user ID. This is going to be of type string. Essentially, all we need to do here is a simple search, right? We're just gonna loop through this array and say, is there a participant with this user ID? All we need to do is return a Booleanized result of participants.find, and we want to essentially loop through all of the participants and say, is there a participant with the user ID? that is equal to the argument user ID. And this double bang operator, to refresh your memory, will turn this into a Boolean true or false because the dot find function returns undefined if it does not find one. So we need to convert undefined to false if that is the case. And if it does find one, it will return an object and we want to um, return true in that case. And that is what the double bang operator will do for us. Okay, so we can close this and now Back inside of our resolver function, we can create a new variable called allowed to view. And this is going to call that user is participant. I don't know why it's not auto weight importing. User is um, conversation participant. Is this going to auto weight import for us? No? Huh, that's so weird. Okay. Um, 
Let's come to the top here and let's import that. So we'll say go up two directories, I think, and then go into util functions. And we want to import user is conversation participant. So the two arguments that we need to pass in here are the conversation participants and the user ID. We can get the conversation participants from our conversation entity, um, which for some reason are not showing up. Oh, okay, you know why? <laughs> it's because on when we were querying for this conversation, we did not include that include statement. We want to um, retrieve all the values that are on our conversation populated entity. So now if I, whoops, come back into here, now that it is a populated conversation, we have access to our participants. Okay, that's our first argument. And our second one is going to be our user ID, just like this. So we are creating a Boolean here called allowed to view. And this is basically saying, is this user allowed to view the messages in this conversation? So what we want to do is say, if they're not allowed to view, then we want to throw an error and tell them that they are not authorized. Perfect. Cool. So if we make it past this point, that means that the conversation actually exists and that this user querying for the messages in this conversation is in this conversation and is therefore allowed to view these messages. So we can safely retrieve the messages from our database if that is the case. So we're going to have a try block and it's going to be quite straightforward. All we're going to do is literally retrieve the messages in this conversation. Okay, in our uh, catch block, let's do our usual little shenanigans here. Let's do a console log and we'll say uh, messages error and then we will throw a GraphQL error with the um, message from the error, just like this. As I said, in the try block, we just need to query the database for the messages in this conversation. So we can create a new variable called messages and we're going to call our Prisma client and query the message model. The function we're going to call is called find many because we are finding several documents and we want to find all of the messages where the conversation ID matches the conversation ID of the input. So we're getting all the messages in this conversation. We want the structure of this messages. We want the structure of these messages to be the structure of our message populated. And we also want to add another condition here. We want to tell Prisma to order these in a descending order. So we're going to order it by the created at field, and this is going to be descending so that we see the messages in a reverse chronological order because that makes sense in a chat application. That's exactly the behavior we want. Okay, and now what we need to do is just return an array, but not an empty array. We want to return the messages array. Perfect, so that is it for this query. Hopefully all of this verification makes sense. Also guys, let me know about the pace of these tutorials and what you think. Um, I'm still getting used to creating this type of content. I'm still very early on in my YouTube journey. Um, although I've created a few tutorials, I'm still very early on. So I, I really would appreciate your feedback on what you think of both the pace as well as the detail I go into on specific things. Okay, so that wraps up this query. And I think that wraps up all of the backend work we're going to need to do for sending messages. So that's pretty exciting. We can now go back to our front end and actually just consume our back end API. Let's jump back to our front end, test this out, um, write the logic up there and see if we run into any issues. And if we have any errors, we'll come back and fix it when that happens. So let's close our back end here and let's go back into our feed wrapper. So the component we're going to be or I guess the components we're going to be focusing on are going to be, again, this message input. We're going to go and uh, finish off this send message function. And once that is done, we are going to build this messages component. And it's inside of this messages component where we are going to query for messages. Uh, we're gonna call this messages query that we just defined in our resolvers here. And uh, we're going to be displaying all of the individual message items inside of this messages component. Okay, so actually to start this off, let's um, let's create this component right now and we'll go and actually write the query. 
Um, and even though no messages exist, and we'll just get an empty array back. But let's go write the structure of this component because that is where our subscription is also going to um, be initialized. So inside of which directory do we want to be in here? So inside of messages, let's create a new file here called messages.tsx. Okay, inside of this file, let's define our messages functional component. This is going to be a function that returns a React functional component. So we can say react.fc, and this is going to take in an argument of type messages props. So let's pass this in messages props. Okay. And we're just going to return an empty div for now. And why is this? Oh, so, and then underneath here, we just have to export default messages. Just like that. And actually, I think in this input uh, component, we defined the, we used a different syntax. So I want to actually use the same syntax in this message input here. So I think I uh, did not include the return type. So what we're going to do is change the syntax here a little bit. We're just going to, uh, back in our input, we're going to change the return type of this message input functional component to be a React functional component. And this is where we're going to pass in uh, the props. So we don't need this type over here. Okay, and we can go back to messages. Now, inside of messages, this is going to be a pretty simple component. Uh, it's essentially just going to be the wrapper component of this whole sort of feed and it's going to be the parent of our message item components. And each uh, for each message, we're going to create a message item component. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll define the HTML structure of this component, uh, and then we will write the query for our messages using the use query hook. And then once we have the messages received uh, on our front end, we will work on the message item component. The outermost container is going to be a flex component, and we're going to make the direction of this column. And we're going to add a justify property. Okay. And we're going to add a justify property of flex end. And we are going to make the overflow value hidden. And all of these CSS properties will make a bit more sense once this component is actually built and there's data being displayed here. Because um, it's kind of hard to tell why we're doing these things without any stuff in there. Uh, so bear with me as we write out this this logic here. And actually, uh, inside of this component, we kind of need to, we, we need the result of the messages query to really do anything in here. So we kind of need to um, write that out. And before we can use our use query hook, we actually go, we actually need to go and define the messages query string in our front end query strings. So what we can do is come over here. Uh, we want to go to GraphQL operations and we have not yet created a message file for our message query strings because this is going to be our first one. So let's go ahead and do that. So inside of GraphQL operations, we want to create message.ts. So this is where all of our message related operations are going to go. So we want to import GQL from Apollo client. So let's bring that in. And inside of this file, just like the other ones, like conversation, we're going to export this object here with all of these query strings defined. So let's say export default. This is going to just be an object. And inside of here, we're going to have query, mutation, and subscription. Just like this. All right. Now, the first thing we're going to be defining is that message query. So inside of our query object, we want to define a key messages because that is the name of our query. And the value of this is going to be a GraphQL query string. So we can use the GQL with the backticks. Now inside of here, we want to define a query string. So we can use the keyword query and the name of this is going to be messages. And as we saw before, if you go back to our message resolver on our backend, this is just going to take in a single argument and that is going to be the conversation ID. So inside of here, we can declare that with the dollar sign conversation ID. This is going to be of type string and we will have the bang operator to make it required. Okay, then we can open up a set of curly brackets. Okay, and inside of here, we need to specify the exact name of this query. So that is going to be a lowercase m messages. 
and we want to declare that input. So this is going to be conversation ID. And the value of this is going to be the one we declared just above there. So as we know, the way we've defined this message query on the back end is it's going to return an array of populated messages. So what we can do is similar to what we did with our conversations. We go back to our conversations operations file. You remember we defined this object here called conversation fields, and it was basically just a reusable GraphQL query string that we can use inside of our um, other query strings so that we don't have to write out this giant piece of string in all of the places that we're using it. We can do the same thing with our message fields. So that is what we are going to do. So we're going to create a reusable message fields object that is going to be a string that can be reused in our GraphQL query strings. So we can say export const message fields, and we want this to have the structure of a populated message entity because that is what we are returning from this resolver on the back end. And that is going to have an ID. It is going to have a sender. The sender is going to have an ID and a username. The message is also going to have a body as well as a created at field. Now inside of here, we don't have to write all of that out. We can just simply say message fields. And we're actually going to use this also in our conversation operations. Because if you remember, um, we are on our conversation fields, we're querying for the latest message, which is part of the populated conversation. So now we can replace this with those message fields that we just defined because it's the same thing. So it makes it even cleaner. So what we can do is just get rid of this and we can say, okay, well, on our latest message, we're just going to simply have message fields, which we have defined in our message operations file. Perfect. Okay, so we can close our conversation operations. Awesome. So that is all we need to do for our messages query. So while we're here, let's define our send message mutation query string, as well as our message sent subscription query string. Okay, so now let's go ahead and define the query string for our send message mutation. So inside of our mutations object, let's create a new key called send message. And as usual, this is going to have a value of a GraphQL query string. And we are declaring a mutation query string here. And the name of this is going to be send message. And if you remember, if we go take a look at our um, message resolvers, this is going to take in four different arguments. If we go take a look at this type here, we have these four things here, ID, conversation ID, sender ID, and the body of the message. So uh, if we go back to this file here, we need to declare those four things here. So the first one is going to be the ID. This is going to be of type string, and these are all going to be required arguments. So I'm going to add the bang operator. The second one is going to be the conversation ID. Again, of type string, these are all type string. Third one is going to be the converse, sorry, the sender ID, who sent this message. Last one is going to be the body of the message. Okay, all required. And then inside of here, we can specify the name of our resolver function for this mutation. So that is going to be send message. And then we just need to pass in the variables. So ID is going to have ID conversation ID. This is kind of tedious to type out. <laughs> uh, we have the sender ID and the body. And if you remember, this particular resolver send message is just returning a Boolean. So we don't need to specify a return type here. It will just know that the return type is a Boolean true or false. Let's come down here and define the message sent subscription. So our subscription name is message sent find the GraphQL query string. This time we are declaring a subscription query string. So we want to use the keyword subscription and we want to call this message sent. The only argument that this is going to take is going to be the conversation ID. And this is going to be of type string, again required. So at the bang operator, open up a set of curly brackets and specify the name of the resolver function corresponding to this subscription. And that is going to be message sent. Let's declare the input here, conversation ID. Now for the return type of the message sent subscription, this is going to be a full populated message. Because if we go back to our resolvers and scroll down here uh, to message sent, we are going to be 
the payload, I guess, is going, the payload of the subscription is going to uh, be this message sent subscription payload. And if you just go into that, it is going to be a populated message. So how do we do that? Well, we can just reuse our message fields as the return type here, because this message field, again, represents the structure of our populated message. So we can just say that the return type of the message sent subscription is going to have all of these fields here. Cool, okay, so that is it. This is literally all we're going to have in this file for this entire application. So uh, we only have these three things for messages. We have the actual message query, the sending of messages mutation, and the message sent subscription. So that is really all the logic we need to have a functioning chat application, which is pretty cool. Now, if we go back to the messages component, we actually have a query string that we can use in the use query hook. So let's come back up here. So at the top of our component here, we want to perform the messages query. So we want to bring in our use query hook. So we can say use query, bring that in from Apollo client. And we want to make this type safe. So we want to define some interfaces for the data that this query is going to receive, as well as the variables that this query is going to accept. So we are going to go to our um, types file in our front end and define those two types. So we're gonna come down here and create a new section called messages. And we are going to define those two interfaces. So we're going to say export interface messages data. The structure that the data is going to receive is going to have the query name on it, which is messages. And the value is going to be an array of populated messages. So we want to import message populated. Perfect. Now let's also define an interface for our messages variables. So we could say messages variables, and we saw that this is just going to take a conversation ID of type string. Okay, so we can go back here and pass those two types as generic types to our use query hook. So the first one is going to be the structure of the data that is going to be received back from our API. It's going to be messages data. And the second one is going to be our messages variables. So now when we actually come into the use query hook, we will have type safety on the um, on the variables, and then when we're working with the data object returned from the use data hook, sorry, the use query hook, it will know the structure of that data. For example, if I said data, it would know there are messages on it, and it would know what is on all of those messages. Okay, so the first argument that we need to pass to this hook is going to be the query string for the query we are actually performing here. So that is going to be our messages query string that we just defined a few minutes ago. So we're going to need to actually import those. Let's come up to the top here and we'll say import message operations from, we want to go up to a lot of directories <laughs> to GraphQL uh, operations and then message. Cool. So our query string can be accessed on message operations. We want to access the query object and then on there we want the messages value. Now as a second argument, we want to specify the variables that this query is going to take in. So we can define variables and this should have type safety, which it does. So it knows that we are expecting a conversation ID to be passed to this query. Now currently, we do not have a conversation ID defined in our messages component, but it is going to be passed in as a prop. So let's go ahead and define that on our props. This is actually going to take in two props. The first one is going to be a user ID, which is a type string. The second one is going to be a conversation ID, also a type string. We can now destructure those from our prop interface. And now we have access to that variable on our query. Another thing I want to quickly show you is another way to do error handling with your GraphQL mutations and queries. So if we come down here, just beneath this variables object, and I press control spacebar, there's actually a bunch of stuff in here. There's, um, there's a lot going on, um, and I'm not going to dive into like all of these. The ones that I mainly use are on completed and on error. So Apollo, out of the box, gives us these two callback functions that will fire when these specific events occur. So if an error occurs when Apollo attempts to perform this query, the on error callback function would fire. So basically we can define a custom function. If there's like something specific we want to do 
when an error happens with this query. Another interesting one is on completed. On completed is cool because it's very similar to on error, but it's for a different event. It's when this query successfully completes, this function is going to fire and we can write some custom logic if there is something particular we want to do when this query completes. So we're going to be using the on error callback provided to us. So the cool thing about this on error function is that it's going to receive a bunch of information when it fires. So if we just open up an object here and press control spacebar, we can see the structure of all of the data that is going to come back, that is going to be sent to this on error function. So there's things like message, name, network error, etc. cetera. Um, so the thing we're going to be interested in is going to be the error message. So we can destructure the message from all the data that this function receives. And we just want to simply display this error message to the user in the form of a toast error. So that's pretty simple. That's all we're going to do for error handling. There are some more robust things you could do, um, but this is pretty simple and pretty much all we need. And I just wanted to show you these cool callback functions that you can use in your mutation hooks from Apollo. Okay, so let's come back up here and there's a few more things you want to grab from the result of our use query hook. We're going to want to know the loading state as well as if there was an error. And we're also going to grab the subscribe to more function because this is what we're going to use to subscribe to new messages via the message sent subscription. So let's come back down to our HTML because now we actually have stuff that we can use in the HTML. Um, the first thing we're going to do inside of here is check if loading is happening. Are we currently retrieving data from the network? If we are, we want to display some sort of something on the UI to indicate to the user that data is being fetched. So we currently have not yet defined our skeleton loader component, which we are going to do shortly actually, maybe even um, just after we write out the HTML here. But what is going to go here, if the message query is in a loading state, we are going to display a stack component with this skeleton loader component that we have yet to define. So I'm just going to comment this out and for now, just to test this out, I'm just going to add a div that says loading. Actually, I'll just add some span text that says um, loading messages. Okay, still can't type. <laughs> loading messages, okay. The more exciting part is the actual messages, right? When, once, we fetch the messages, once we fetch the messages from the backend, we want to render them on the UI. So what we can do is we can check if messages exist inside of the data object that is coming from our use query hook. If there are messages inside of the data, we want to display basically the feed of messages. And this can be represented by a flex component. I don't know why it doesn't automatically create the closing tag. Uh, this flex component is going to have some CSS properties. So we are going to make the direction of this column reverse. And again, I will explain the CSS a little bit more once we actually have some data being rendered on the UI. We're going to give this an overflow Y of overflow, sorry, of, <laughs> of scroll. This is so our feed is kind of scrollable. And we are going to give this a height of 100%. Okay, inside of this flex container here, we want to go through all of our messages and for each one, we want to create some sort of HTML to display the data inside of that message. So you can say data.messages.map and we can take each individual message and for each one, we are going to return a component called message item. We have not yet created this component, so I will just comment this out. And so for now, just to make sure that this logic is working with our query, I'm just going to display the message body. And once we have the whole query working and everything, we will go ahead and define the actual message item component. So something's going on here in our console. I think there's probably an issue with our GraphQL query. We probably have like an error in the way we've defined the query that it's not happy about. Uh, connection to failed. Subscription, unhandled subscription error. Okay, let's go to our console here. Okay, here, so unknown type string. Did you mean string? Okay, we probably have a lowercase s somewhere. Where's this uh, coming from? Um, I'm going to assume it's from our, our new, 
one here. Uh, unknown type string. Okay, let's go to our messages type defs. Okay, it is right here. So when I was defining this messages query a few moments ago, which is probably like an hour ago at this point, <laughs> um, I accidentally forgot to capitalize this because our GraphQL types have capital letters. This is not TypeScript, so lowercase, it does not work. We are in GraphQL, so uppercase is what we must do. So let's see if that solved the problem. Okay, so our server is successfully running now. Let's see if we can perform this query without any errors. Okay, so there's no errors. So the query was probably successful, but we don't have any messages in our database. But first, okay, wait, wait, I don't even think we've executed the query. Let's, let's execute a query. Okay, so we just clicked on this conversation with Safari. I'm gonna get rid of this here is conversation log from our conversation item, because it's kind of distracting and we're not really working with it anymore. Where is that? Here is conversation. Okay, so let's close that. The data we're interested in now is actually going to be that um, the messages data. So let's go to our messages component and let's see if this data is being received. Here is messages data. We should see is um, basically an object with an empty array of messages on it. So if I refresh this page, we are not seeing that. This query should fire every time I go into a new conversation and it is not. Let me make sure that we're actually, I don't even think we're, are we rendering messages? I don't think we are. That's probably why. We're not, we're not, that is why. Okay, so there's probably not an error with the schema. Well, I don't wanna say that too confidently because you know, I'm me and I have some typos sometimes. Uh, but we were not executing the query because the component was not even being rendered. So classic. Oh boy. Okay. So let's import this from, uh, that file here. And this is throwing an error because we need to pass in the types, sorry, not the types the props. I need to eat something. I, it's, <laughs> I haven't really eaten anything today and I'm finding that my thoughts are not gathering as quickly. Um, <laughs> so I think I'm going to, I'm going to finish this, this slew here and then go get some food, come back and finish. Hopefully my thoughts will be more clear. So I apologize if I'm not being clear in any portion of this video. So what do we need to pass in? We need to pass in the user ID. This is going to be the user ID, which do we have available? We do. And the conversation ID. Conversation ID. Just like that. There we go. Okay, so we saw that the loading thing happened here. The query actually fired and it returned an empty array. So let's just uh, refresh the page and look here, I'll say loading messages because it's in the loading stage fetching from the database. And it's this particular one here. So we are successfully communicating with our backend. We are just not yet receiving any data because um, there are no messages. If I were to go to our backend for fun, <laughs> um, our messages resolvers, and rather than returning this messages array, what I'm going to do is return an array and just create a fake message. Uh, we're only displaying a body on our message. So I'm just gonna say, hey dude, this is a super sick message. It's so unnecessary. It's an unnecessary length. And I'm just going to typecast this as a populated message so that TypeScript is kind of happy. Anyway, if I refresh this page, we should receive that on our front end, which we are now, right? Because in our uh, messages component right here, we're mapping through and displaying the body. Uh, if I go to the console, we have an issue here. Oh, let's add a let's add a key to this to get rid of this ugly error message dot body. Um, we can see here is message data. If I go into messages, we can see that that fake message is there. All the other fields are null though, because we just created that fake one that doesn't actually have any real data on it. I just wanted to show you that so that we can see that data is being fetched from our backend and displayed on the UI. So now what we can do is um, work on the send message mutations that we can actually create real messages. And then we'll work on the message item component so that when we fetch those real messages from our backend, they will look super nice. We'll actually go ahead and create the message item component. So that is coming next. 
Okay, so now we're going to start working on the actual sending of messages, and we're going to go work on that send message function. But before we do that, I want to tie a few loose ends that we have in our front end, uh, particularly that skeleton loader component. Um, this skeleton loader component is basically just going to be a wrapper of the skeleton component from Chakra UI. For those of you that do not know what a skeleton is, it's essentially just a really nice component uh, that looks like this, kind of has this wavy textured animation to it. Um, you may have seen these on some popular websites. Basically, it just represents that the data is loading and you can um, style these rectangular things to be the shape of your actual components. And then you can place these loaders uh, as a placeholder while the data for your real components is being fetched from the server. And it just dramatically improves the user experience, in my opinion. I love these loaders. Um, you can probably, you've probably seen them before. <laughs> they're, they're pretty popular. Um, so we're going to have some here in our conversation items and we're going to have some here in our feed. You may have saw in the demo um, at, at, way back at the beginning of part one, uh, you may have saw those loaders. So that is what we're going to do. We're just gonna quickly create that component and then place it where it is supposed to be placed so that we can get that over with because I just booted up the project and I refreshed the page and you'll notice that nothing's really here uh, while the data is being fetched for these conversations um, and I want to put that loader in there. We're gonna go to our front end. So I'm just gonna close this back end directory here. Let's go into components and let's create a folder called common. Now, usually I like to create a common folder inside of my components folder, and this is where I put like app-wide reusable components, and this loader is a great example of one of those components. So inside of here, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a bit of a frog in my throat these days that doesn't seem to want to leave. <laughs> we're gonna create a file called skeleton loader. Okay, so we're gonna say const skeleton loader and this is going to return a React functional component. So we can say react.fc, and we're going to define the props interface in just a second here, and this is going to be a function. And let's make this the default export. Export default skeleton loader. Not like that. <laughs> skeleton loader. Okay. And at the very top here, let's find an interface for the props, skeleton loader props. So essentially what we're going to do here is like I said, we're going to create a sort of custom component that is a wrapper of this chakra skeleton component. And we're basically going to make it reusable so we can drop this anywhere in our app and pass it props to give it a specific shape depending on where in the app it's being used. So obviously in the conversation column here, it's going to have a different shape than it would in the message column. Uh, by shape, I mean things like the width, the height, how many of them there are, etc. So we're creating this skeleton loader custom component to allow us to customize what the skeleton component from Chakra is going to look like. Sometimes you want three, sometimes you want 10, sometimes you want two, sometimes you want them to be fat, tall, whatever. So that is why we're creating this wrapper component. So the props that we're going to take in to this component is going to be a count. So how many of these things do we want? We're going to take in a height, which is going to be a string, as well as a width, also going to be a string. And then we can pass that as a generic to this React functional component. Inside of this function, let's return a React fragment. And inside of this fragment, we are going to bring in our skeleton component from Chakra. So this is what I mean by this is a wrapper component. And we're basically going to use these props that we're passing in to determine how many of these things we're going to create and their size. So let's destructure those three properties from our interface. We have the count, the height, and the width. We have this fragment here, but we need to know how many of these things to create. And we're going to do that based on this count prop. So uh, a way I figured out how to do that was inside of this fragment is we can basically create an array of length count and then f and then essentially map through that array and create a skeleton for each one. So this array is just essentially just going to be an array of dummy elements and there's going to be count number of dummy elements in this array and that's going to allow us to create count number of skeletons. Hopefully that makes sense. So inside of this fragment, let's write some JavaScript here. We're basically going to 
create an array and pass in count parameter. So essentially we're, we're, we're using the array um, instance native to JavaScript and we're, we're creating a new one of length count and then we're spreading that array. And this is the result of this is going to be an array of length count. So kind of a cool way to, to do that, create this like dummy array of a certain length. Now we can map through this array and essentially all we need is the index of the elements. We don't need the element itself because it's a dummy element. Okay, so inside of map, we're going to create a callback. The first element um, in the callback is going to be the element itself, which we've seen before. That's how a map function works. And the second one is going to be the index of that element. Then this is going to be a function here. And for each one, we want to create that skeleton component. Okay. Then we can use these properties to customize what this looks like. So now if the count is eight, we are going to have eight skeleton components. As you can see here in the documentation, um, for this example here, there's three of them that they've sort of hard coded. And now we've just created this functional component that can dynamically determine the number of these things and create them. Okay. So maybe this is a little bit confusing to you. So let's drop this in to our um, conversation wrapper component here. And, um, and then that, that should make more sense once you see a little bit of a visual. So let's um, open up our conversation wrapper component. And I think I may have commented that out. Yeah. Okay. So here from way back two months ago, wow. On October 1st, it is December 5th today. <laughs> that is a long time. So you may probably don't remember. I barely remember. Um, so this is where we're going to put that in. And if we go up, we should have a loading state, which we do from two months ago, that we can use as a condition to display or not display this skeleton loader. Um, so as we're querying for conversations, there is going to be some sort of loading state. There's a loading period when that data is being fetched from the server. While that's happening, we want to display this component, which is a loader component. So before we bring in the skeleton, let me show you what I mean by loading state. So I can say, if conversations loading is true, I'm just going to show a div that says loading conversations so that you can visualize what this looks like. So keep your eyes over here uh, on this conversation wrapper component. What I'm going to do is refresh and just, okay, you saw for a split second there <laughs> that um, there was that, that component. The styling is all messed up, but we're going to fix that. We want to, instead of this disgusting div with <laughs> random text in it, we want to display our skeleton loader component. Okay, now this is mad because we are not passing in our props. So what are the props? We need to pass in a count. So the count we're going to pass in here is going to be seven. You can do whatever you'd like with this. I'm just gonna, I just pick seven. The height of these things, we're going to make 80 pixels. And the width is going to be 360 pixels. Okay, so what I'm going to do is Actually, we're going to make this a ternary operator because we only want to show, yeah, there's like two conditions. If loading is true, we're going to show the loader. If loading is false, we're going to show the conversations list. So we're going to turn this from the double ampersand here to a ternary operator and just change the syntax a little bit here. So we're going to say, is conversations loading true? If yes, show the skeleton. If not, show the conversations list. So as we're developing this out, this loader, I'm just going to make this true so we can see this at all times. Um, okay, this thing got mad. What is this here? Oh, skeleton loader. Let's pass in the key. That's why we're bringing in this index in the first place, in case you were confused. We just need a unique index there. Okay, so this is not working. Let's refresh. Hmm, okay, so the loader is not showing. Um, oh, okay. I know what happened. Wow. Okay. So I forgot to apply, um, the, the colors and the styling colors to this thing. So when, when you create a skeleton, you you, and you want to have this kind of like wavy length, you, you got to specify, um, the start color and the end color. And then the component will do this sort of like wavy animation thing. I think that if you're using like a light mode theme out of the box, you'll, you'll see it for some reason when you're using the colors we're using, it doesn't appear. So we, I had to do some work to customize the colors to make it appear on our dark mode view. So what I'm going to do is 
add some styling to the skeleton. So we're going to add a start color prop. And the start color is going to be black alpha 400. And the end color is going to be white alpha 300. Why 400 and 300? I was just playing around <laughs> with them and it looked the best. So um, just kind of accept that. The height of our um, skeleton is going to be the value of our height prop that's passed in, which we are passing in over here in our conversations wrapper. So this is what makes this component reusable in different parts of our app are these props. So that's kind of cool. Uh, hopefully this is something you can do in your own projects when you're creating like custom, some sort of reusable component. And we're going to make the border radius four. Okay, there we go. So now we can see these things and they are kind of not how they should look. We want to make this look how a conversation item looks because it is a loader representing a conversation item. So our styling in this box seems to be messed up a bit and I am not too sure why because I'm pretty sure I did exactly what we have in the demo. Flex direction column. Okay, that's better. I'm so confused. It looked so normal in the project. Okay, so this looks fine. If I change this to false, okay, that looks fine. True. Did I change something? Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a property called uh, gap. I'm just like going on the fly here. This is my demo project. <laughs> it doesn't seem to work either. Okay, so I just added a gap property of four. A gap is nice. It basically just creates a stack component. Uh, that's how a stack component works under the hood. Um, okay, so then if I make this false, let's make sure everything looks normal. Okay, so what I did was I, on mobile, I wanted this to be 100% because before it was not acting that way. So yeah, this makes sense. Uh, I'm gonna change this back to conversation loading so that we can actually see some real loading. So if I refresh, we can see that the loaders are there and then the conversations come in. So that looks good. Uh, we're still having a little bit of an issue with the width because if I refresh, you'll see that the, the width is like that. Yeah, so it kind of shifts back and forth. I think that that has something to do with the conversation item. So if I go into conversation list and I go look at the item, there's something to do with this box. Like if I make the, hmm, border. Okay, so um, I made some adjustments to this loader here. It's kind of being weird and I don't want to spend too much time on this styling because it's not like extremely critical, it's just a loader. But what I did is, um, so on the skeleton loader, I added a media query here on the width. And what I did was I, on mobile, made the width full or 100%. And on medium screen sizes, I make it the width of the prop. And the width I also changed over here to 270. Um, but what I might do is just leave this at width full and not use the width prop at all because I think that would be fine anyway. I'm not sure why I have a width prop <laughs> in the first place. I think it's because I'm using it in, a, in the header component. But what I'm going to do is, yeah, I'm gonna proceed with just leaving this as base full. And if we have issues when we use the loader in the conversation wrapper header with the width, um, I'll come back and address this. I'll solve this on my own time and then I'll come back to the tutorial. I don't wanna to spend too much time on this because I wanna keep moving. Um, so for now, the changes that I just made were to just put this media query in. Um, we don't even really need to use the width here. And what I'm going to do is just make this a width optional for now so that we don't get a type error over here. The height is fine uh, and the count is also fine. So let's leave it at that. The skeleton loader can be considered done for now and we will return to this width if we run into an issue in the future. So I'm gonna close this off. I'm just gonna switch this back to conversation loading like this. So if I refresh, cool. You can see that that looks way better than without the loader. And I added that really ugly border to something. Where is it, a conversation list? Let's get rid of this border. I'm famous for adding borders to stuff to debug. <laughs> just makes life a little simpler. Cool, okay, so hopefully that all makes sense. Loader is looking good and we can move on. 
Okay, so I'm gonna close the conversation list and the conversation uh, conversation wrapper. And yeah, here is the other spot where we were using the loader. I'm going to put this in here. We're now back in the messages component. And I'm going to import that. And we're not gonna pass in a width and we're just gonna see what this looks like. So we can get rid of this loading messages span thing here. And okay, we have a stack. And I'm just gonna make this true. What does that look like? Okay, once again, we're not seeing that because we're not actually in a conversation. Cool, okay, so you can see that the loader is here. However, it looks kind of terrible because it's stretching the whole thing and there's not much spacing. So what I'm going to do is add a bigger spacing property to our stack here. I'm gonna make this like six. That's too much. Let's make it four. Yeah, that's better, okay. And I'm going to add some padding to this stack as well. The padding is going to be, let's try two. That's a little too little, let's try four. There we go, okay. And we're just gonna make this padding X instead of just padding all around. There we go, and let's get rid of this. Where's that coming from? Oh, that's actually coming from our back end. <laughs> our message uh, resolvers. We're gonna work on creating messages now. So let's come back here and just remove this array and return the actual messages array. So if I refresh this, there we go. We have all these super nice loaders and it looks so good. And we're gonna add a loader up here too eventually, um, but we're not quite there yet. So let's now, I'm trying to think of the best logical step. I think we're ready to actually go ahead and send messages, but first let's let let's make this back to loading. There we go, so if I refresh now, we'll see all these nice loaders, and we're like, okay, there's no messages in here because the array is empty. Okay, one more thing I'm gonna actually add here is at the very bottom of this component, I'm just gonna say, if there is an error that's coming from our query, let's just return null. Return null, we don't wanna return this component if there is an error. We're gonna display a toast message instead and not return this piece of HTML. Let's go back to our input and build out the rest of this on send message function here. So inside of this on send message function, all we really need to do is call our send message mutation and send it the data that is inside of this new message. Our send message mutation and all the backend is all set up to just successfully store this new message in the database. So all we should have to do is just simply call this send message function and we should be good to go. So in order to do that, in order to actually access the mutation, we need to bring in the use mutation hook. So at the top of the component here, just underneath this message body state here, let's bring in our use mutation hook. So the use mutation hook returns an array. And so we'll bring in use mutation from Apollo client and we are going to bring in message operations, which will not auto import. So let's come to the top here and import message operations from, if we go up a few directories here, four directories, GraphQL, operations, not conversation, message. Okay, awesome. Now on message operations, we want to access mutations and we want to access the send message mutation query string. And to make this type safe, we are going to pass in our two generic types, which are going to represent the variables that we have to pass into our send message function, as well as the return type of the send message function. And this array is going to return actually to us the send message function, which we're going to call in order to perform this mutation. So the first type that this is going to take is going to be the structure of the data that this function is going to return. So the send message mutation is going to return an object with a key of the mutation name inside of it, which is send message, and this is just going to be a Boolean as the value. The second type that this is going to take in is going to be basically the structure of the new message, pretty much. So if I were to go, I, th I can't remember if we defined a, a type for this, util. So looking at the send message mutation on our backend, we defined the arguments to have this structure, ID, conversation ID, sender ID, and a body. So that is the type we're going to use on our front end 
for the arguments when we're calling our mutation from our input. So that is going to go here. We're going to say send message arguments. We're going to import that type. So how do we actually call this function now? Well, remember I said in the try block of this send message, sorry, on send message function, that is where we're going to call that mutation. So as I just said, we need four things for a new message to be created, an ID, conversation ID, sender ID, and a body. The first thing we're going to start with is going to be the sender ID. Where can we get the sender ID from? Well, the sender ID is the ID of the user that is sending this message that is currently signed in, and we can get that from our user session. So let's go ahead and destructure the session. So we're going to say session.user, and the part of the user that we are interested in is going to be the ID, and I'm going to alias the name of this to be sender ID. The next thing that we need is an actual message ID, right? Every message needs an ID. So how are we going to create this ID? We need this ID to work with Mongo, and I did some research, and Mongo recommends you to use a package called BSON, and essentially that is going to give us a, a class instance called object ID, and then we can create a new ID that is going to be safe to store in Mongo, and Mongo is going to be happy to accept that type of ID. You can't just put in like a random string because Mongo needs a certain type of string ID. So if you just search npm BSON, I can't seem to type. BSON and PM. So it's very popular, 3.5 million weekly downloads. That is what we're going to do, use to generate our Mongo IDs. So what we can do is come to our terminal here, into our front end, make sure you're in the front end. Let's go ahead and install npm BSON. Cool. So now what we're going to do is at the very top here, let's import a function from BSON, import from BSON. This function is going to be object ID, and it's going to be the uppercase ID. I don't know if they are different. I'm pretty sure they are. I remember from back in the day, I was working on a project and they actually are different. Don't fully understand it, but the capital one is the one we're going to be using. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, how are we going to use this function to actually generate this ID? So I'm gonna create a variable called new ID, or actually message ID, that's probably better. And this is going to be a new instance of object ID. So we use the keyword new. And we are going to invoke this function. And then we are going to call a method to string. Now let's go ahead and create a variable for our new message. And this is going to be of type send message arguments. So what are the things that we need to put on here? We need a body, conversation ID, ID, and sender ID. Okay, so the ID of this message is going to be that message ID that we just created. The sender ID is going to be the sender ID variable coming from the user on the session. The conversation ID is going to be the conversation ID prop that we're passing in. And the body of this message is going to be our state variable message body, right? So it's current, it's what the user has currently typed in to the input. So now we have an object that actually represents the message that we're going to send to our backend and store in the database. So what I'm going to do is call our send message function. And this is going to be an asynchronous call because it's communicating with our API. So let's use the await keyword and let's call send message. And inside of here, we can indicate what variables we're going to pass in, right? If I do variables, and since we have added that type up here to our use mutation hook, TypeScript knows what variables we are expecting. Well, we just defined an object with all of those variables on it called new message. So let's go ahead and spread our new message object, and that will satisfy TypeScript because TypeScript knows all of those things that are required exist on that new message. So now we are safe. This send message function is going to return to us a few different things, data, errors, and extensions. And the ones we're interested in are data and errors. Data is going to be the actual um, object that is returned to us from the mutation, which is this send message um, boolean here, whether or not the operation was successful. With GraphQL and with these hooks, there are a few different ways you can do your error handling. And, you know, error handling is one of those things that, you know, there's so many ways to do it. And I honestly don't know what the best way to do it is. There are certain patterns you can follow, but I like to play around with different things. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out what the best way to do error handling is. Okay, so just to give you an example of one way you could do it is you could say, you could grab the data here and you could grab errors. And you could write some sort of if statement like 
um, if there is no data, whoops, if there is no data dot send message, meaning that the value is false or errors happened, <laughs> um, let's throw a new error of some kind, like fail to send message or something. That's one way you could do your error handling. Another way would be with the callbacks that are made available on these hooks here. And I was kind of going over that uh, a few moments ago. Inside of here, to the arguments of the use mutation hook, as a second argument, there's an object that we can use. And we could use this on error function that would execute if an error occurs. And um, that would also allow us to do some error handling. Really, which one of these you do depends on the use case and how you want to handle your errors and what specifically you want to do if an error occurs. Again, I don't fully know what the best way to do error handling is, and, and maybe there isn't necessarily a best way. Maybe you're just supposed to choose one and kind of follow that pattern. Um, I don't know. In the demo, I did this. I have, if there is no data, dot send message, meaning that this is like false or something failed, um, or there's some sort of errors, let's throw a new error. You could also use the on error thing and um, uh, do some sort of like toast error in here. Again, totally up to you what you'd like to do. I'm going to proceed as I did in the demo here, and I'm just going to say, if there are errors or send message came back as false, meaning that something was wrong in the back end, we're gonna throw a new error um, that says failed to send message. And then in our catch block, we are going to toast error that message and it's going to be displayed to the user. Error handling, interesting topic. I'm still researching the best way to do it because I see so many different people doing so many different things and I find it fascinating and I'm still trying to figure out like what I like the best and what the recommended way is. So we are now successfully, or we should be able to successfully store messages in our database. So let's go ahead and try this. So what I'm going to do is open up our database. We are going to test this out and see if any errors occur. And actually while that's booting up, we are not even invoking this function on send message. So we want to put that on our form. Our form currently, uh, our form currently has this empty callback here. Let's make this on send message. Well, they, it looks like they updated the UI of this thing. It looks pretty good. That's probably why it took so long to update. So yeah, they definitely updated it. This looks really good. I always gotta, I always gotta appreciate a nice looking UI. Wow, this looks, this is satisfying to look at. <laughs> okay, so we don't even have a collection called messages right now because we haven't created any messages. So hopefully after we test this out, it will be created. So let's try this. Hey dude, how are you? Okay, so we, we got an error. So our error handling works, that's good. But what was the error? We don't have any loading state or anything for when we submit the message. We're going to handle that in a bit here, so don't worry about that. Um, let's see, so we have an error. Update conversation entity. So error binding one expected nested update to one case. All right, so I found the error and basically this error message isn't super clear. Um, basically it's telling us that an incorrect ID was passed. Uh, and by incorrect ID, I mean an ID that actually does not exist in our database. Uh, and that's happening on our back end here. If we go back to our message resolvers in this update statement here, essentially what's happening is Prisma is trying to update related entities and it's using certain IDs that we pass it to do that in order to know those relationships. And I actually made a mistake here with these IDs and I am passing it an incorrect ID on these participant entities. This is not correct um, because we're updating the participant entity, like a conversation participant, like one of these. However, I'm saying where the ID is the sender ID. That's actually not correct because the sender ID is the user ID of that thing, right? That's not the ID of the, of the entity. However, we cannot do a where statement on a non-unique field and the user ID is not unique. We can only do it on the ID. So we need to know the ID of the particular conversation participant, I mistakenly was passing it uh, the sender ID, which was the which was a, which is a user ID, right? The sender is a user, so I was trying to update an entity 
um, that has an ID of a user ID. Sorry, that uh, that's kind of like so confusing. I'm so sorry I made this mistake. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Essentially, it's just an incorrect ID. However, in this function, we currently don't know that ID. We only know like the sender ID, which is user ID, and the conversation ID, because those two things are being passed in as arguments, um, these two here. We need to know the ID of the entity itself, uh, like the primary key of this entity that is stored in Mongo. So we need to do some sort of lookup to find the participant that belongs to this user and conversation, and then we can grab the ID off of that entity. So what we can do is after we create the message entity, we want to add a comment here called, uh, and I'm just gonna say find uh, conversation participant entity. Okay, and then the ID of that entity we find here is going to be the ID that we're going to place here. So again, my apologies for that. Hopefully, you know, sometimes when you do things incorrectly and then you do them correctly, it, it actually helps. So maybe revisiting this um, is helpful, hopefully. <laughs> so how do we find the correct conversation participant ID based on the data that we have? Well, we know the user ID and we know the conversation ID, so we can do a search of all the conversation, all of the, so we can search our conversation participant collection for a document that has a user ID and conversation ID that match the ones that were passed in as arguments. So here is how we can do that. So let's create a new variable called participant, and we are going to fetch this from Prisma. So we're going to say prisma.conversation participant, and we are going to call a function find first. The find first function is going to return the first document that matches the where clause that we're going to put in. And that is going to work perfectly for us. In our case, it's going to find, that's how it's going to find this single conversation participant entity. What are the, or what is the where clause here? Well, as I mentioned, we know the user ID, so we can say where the user ID is equal to the user ID that is passed in, and where the conversation ID is equal to the conversation ID that is passed in. So these two, these two arguments up here, conversation ID, um, and this user ID that's coming from the session. Okay, so now we have this participant entity and this is the ID that we want to use down here, right? We're updating a participant where the ID is this ID, not the sender ID. Here we wanna say where ID is equal to participant.id, okay? And actually we can write an if statement up here. Before we do this, we can just say if there is no participant, which there totally always should be, right? Because we're doing a lookup on a user ID that exists and a conversation ID that exists. Um, so this should always exist, but for the sake of TypeScript, <laughs> uh, we will throw an error if this, for some weird reason, does not exist. So we'll just say, if there is no participant, we're just gonna say participant does not exist. Okay, and above here, I'm just gonna throw a comment that says should always exist, um, but if we if we uh, write this if statement here, I guess our code's a bit more safe and we don't need optional chaining here it's because TypeScript is going to know that participant is going to be a truthy value if it makes it past this if statement here. And yeah, this one should totally be fine because we're saying that, because we're doing a where clause on the user ID and the sender ID is a user ID. We don't really need to use sender ID here. We could probably just use user ID doesn't really matter, they should be equal. <laughs> I guess we'll use user ID because it's coming from the server session. It's a bit more a bit more safe there. Let's see if our server is running. <laughs> server is running successfully, so let's go clear these test messages I sent that stored but didn't successfully um, update all the other entities. So let's try this again. Hey, this is new. Okay, so we still, still got an error. Okay, so I kept getting really weird Prisma errors, um, even after making these fixes. And one other thing I actually noticed we forgot on this conversation update operation here is our include statement for the fields we want to return to us on this updated conversation entity. And we want to return all of the entities defined on our conversation populated 
variable there. So let's add that in. My apologies, I forgot that. I was getting some weird errors even after making these changes here to the IDs because this is definitely correct. Um, I was getting some really weird Prisma errors. So I think there was something wrong with our data in the database. And I'm not sure if you guys are having the same issue. It might just be my data. I don't know if I was if I deleted something before, like manually in the database, like two months ago. I honestly have no idea. But essentially, there was like some missing entities, and uh, the IDs just weren't proper. Honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> Excuse me. So what I'm going to do is essentially just wipe the database and kind of start this process from scratch to make sure that all of our entities are fresh, correct, and all the IDs make sense. I can't remember what modifications I made two months ago before I left for New York. So it seems there was something wrong with the data um, and Prisma was freaking out. Okay, so what I'm going to do is wipe every single document in our database across all of our collections. So to do that, um, we can run this command on all of our collections. So we're gonna say db dot collection name and then call this delete many function and then just pass in an empty object and that's going to delete them all. So we'll start with sessions. Uh, and then we will do accounts. We will then do users uh, messages conversation participants and conversations. Okay, so now we should have absolutely nothing in our database in any collection. Uh, so if I were to go refresh the browser, we should have no users. Therefore, it's asking us to sign in. So what I'm going to do is create those users again using Firefox and Safari. Um, and so we have some fresh data. So with Firefox, continue with Google. Create a username, let's do Firefox. Cool. All right, with Chrome, let's sign in with Google. Let's do Shad Merhi test. Create a username, this is going to be Chrome. And let's do Safari. Do, do, do. Bring Safari over here. Localhost, I guess I only really need two, but whatever, I'll just create three. For the sake of data, Safari. Cool, okay, so now we should have three users in our database. Let's refresh. Do, do, do. Yes, okay, so we have Chrome, Safari, and Firefox. Um, cool, so let's use Chrome, oh, sorry, yeah, Chrome to create a conversation with Safari. Okay, and now let's see if the sending of messages works with these new updates we made. So now our, all of our database data is fresh. Hopefully we see some success here. I'm just gonna shrink these down a bit. Okay, so let's say, hey, Safari, hopefully you get this. Okay, so we did not get an error, so that is a good sign. We're not doing anything on our front end to update the UI after sending a message, so it's behaving exactly as our code is currently written, so don't worry if nothing happens on the front end. We haven't done that yet. On the back end, we're not seeing any errors. I was logging some data to debug. <laughs> uh, but if we go to our database, we could go to messages and we should see that message, hey Safari, hopefully you get this. So that was stored in the database successfully. And if we go to conversations, we should have conversation between um, those two users and we have a conversation participant, two, two conversation participants, one for Safari and one for Chrome in this conversation. So as you can see here, this update worked and I wanna just briefly, briefly, briefly discuss this has seen latest message thing for those of you that were confused. So essentially what happened here, as you can see, that one of these has seen latest message is true and the other is false. So, okay, so has seen latest message represents whether or not a user has read the latest message in a particular conversation. And as I was saying before, if Safari, or sorry, and as I was saying before, if Chrome sends a message to Safari, Chrome has obviously seen that message because he wrote it. So we're going to mark this value as true. Um, so that is why this is true. And this particular conversation participant entity has a user ID of 6DB3, these last four digits here. This should be the user of Chrome. So if we go back to Chrome, 
Yeah, so it's 6DB3. If you look at um, conversation participant, this one, this ID, 6DB6. That's the one with false. If you go back to user, you can see that Safari has an ID ending in 6DB6. So that logic seems to be working and hopefully that it makes more sense now. Awesome, so now we can actually send messages to our backend, store them in the database and update the conversation uh, participants and the conversation as well gets updated with the latest message, message ID to be the ID of that message that was just sent, right? So um, this has an ID of C, B, C, 2, C. <laughs> uh, so the conversation has the latest message ID, B, C, 2, C. That's how we know the latest activity in this conversation. If I send another message, la, 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 whatever, just some random text. Again, the UI is not updating yet. Let's go to messages. That was stored in the database. This has an ID of BC2D. If I go back to the conversation, we should see now that latest message ID was updated to that newly sent message BC2D. So that's pretty cool. We know which message was the one that was most recently sent in a conversation. So all the entities are being updated properly. Um, our message sent subscription is probably firing successfully as well. We're not really doing anything to um, respond to that message being emitted on our front end yet. That's what we're going to do next. So where we are going next is we are going to finish off some UI updates after a message is successfully sent. We'll do things like clear the text input and make sure that message successfully displays in the feed here. Um, and then we're also going to respond to this message sent subscription for the other users in a conversation so that they can actually receive that message in real time. Because currently we're not doing anything um, on our front end to listen to this subscription. So that is where we are going next. Okay, so if I refresh this page here, we can see that messages are successfully being retrieved from our database as well as this latest message text is actually displaying in our conversation item. Um, and if we go back and look at our conversation item, when we built this out, we did include this. However, we are now just seeing that this thing actually exists. So this is pretty cool. Um, this is basically how a chat application works. When a new message is sent in a conversation, that conversation item displays that latest message, that latest activity. So this is really cool. Um, and you can see how that particular conversations query is working. Um, with the latest message ID. So essentially, when we cre uh, query for our conversations in conversation resolvers, when we retrieve all these conversations, um, we're including the conversation populated entity, and this has the latest message details on it that we need to display on our front end, which is what we are seeing here. So that's really cool. Um, and again, shows the, the power of Prisma and how easy it is to do that, these like relational queries with Prisma. So where we are going now is to our front end messages.tsx component. When we pulled in our use query hook here, we just a few moments ago, we pulled in the subscribe to more function or we didn't pull it in. We <laughs> were grabbing that uh, as one of the return values from use query. And very similarly to how we did this in the conversations wrapper, uh, if we go back and just take a look at that to refresh our memory, we're going to do something very, very similar here where we create this uh, function called subscribe to new messages and that's going to fire off the subscribe to more function where we're going to pass in our message sent subscription, grab cool query string uh, and do some stuff with that subscription data as it comes in. So it's going to look very similar to this just in the context of messages. So this is a good reference to have. This is the, the uh, pattern we are going to be following in our messages. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is actually create that function. So let's call this function, subscribe to more messages. And this is going to be a synchronous function. So we don't need to use the async keyword. And this is going to take in a conversation ID as a argument. Okay, now inside of this function, all we want to do is call our subscribe to more function coming from our use query hook. Exactly what we did here in the conversations wrapper. So let's go ahead and call that. We're gonna say um, subscribe to more. This is this one up here. And this thing takes a few arguments. The first one is going to be the actual uh, document. 
and this, this is going to be our subscription query string. So we can say message operations dot subscription dot message sent. And just as a reminder, this looks like this. So this message sent subscription, I'll split screen this, is going to receive a full message body uh, with the message fields on it. That's the data we're going to receive inside of this function here. In conversations wrapper, again, we kind of kind of went over the update query, the update query callback function that, it's, that is provided to us um, by the subscribe to more function allows us to control what we want to do with the data that comes in from the subscription. So we can define the update query callback function. And this is going to receive two arguments, it's going to have the previous result of the query, this subscribe to more function is coming from the messages query. So we're essentially um, dealing with this query in the Apollo cache and the result of that query. So our update query function is going to receive the subscription data, which in this case is going to be the, the new message. And we just have to tell Apollo what we want to do with this data. And we want to tell Apollo in this case to update the result of this query in the Apollo cache so that it actually appears on the UI because that is how Apollo works. It stores the data in this cache and that is the data that is right here, this data, and that is what we are rendering on the UI down here. The second argument is going to be an object. Whoops, this is going to be an object and inside of it, it's going to have a key called subscription data and on that object is going to be where that new message is sent. Again, if we go back to conversations wrapper, we had to define um, sort of this interface here. This is a, an interface that represents the structure of this second argument here. So we, were, we said that there's going to be an object with a subscription data key on it, that's going to have data inside of it. And this is going to have um, an object with the subscription name on it. And um, this is going to then the value of this is going to be the actual like subscription data. So that is going to be the structure of this object. And so what I'm going to do is actually go to our front end types file here, and define that interface. So I'm just going to split screen this. We'll come down here and we will just create an interface called message subscription data. Okay. And as I just mentioned, we could probably do this with conversations as well. Um, I'm probably just going to leave it, but just want to show you how you can define an interface rather than just kind of like define the structure of the data in the component. Okay. So as I said, this is going to have a key called subscription data on it. This is going to map to an object with data inside of it. And this data is going to have an object that is that has the um, name of the subscription and the value of the data here is going to be a message populated, whoops, a message populated entity. So now here we can declare the type of this object as message subscription data, which is not auto importing, I think because there's some syntax errors with our function here, we just haven't written out the, the rest of the, the function here. Okay, so this is a callback. So we're just missing the callback like this. And then we should just auto import this from our types. Cool. So now that we have a type defined here, we can see that this has subscription data on it. So let's destructure that the requirements of the update query function is we need to return a new object that represents the updated data of this query. So we're essentially updating this particular data object in the Apollo cache with whatever we return from this function. So the first thing we want to do is just say, if there is no subscription data, whoops, if there is no subscription data, we just want to return the previous value of this uh, data in the Apollo cache. Okay, now what we're going to do is pull off the new message from our subscription data. So we can say const new message is equal to subscription data dot data dot message sent. And again, if we look at this interface, the type or the value of a new message in this case is going to be type of a message populated and TypeScript is picking that up. Now what we want to do is essentially just return this new object. And the proper way to do that, according to the Apollo documentation, is using this object.assign function. And we're essentially going to be taking the previous value of our data state and sort of like merging it with this new data that's coming in. We are going to say return object.assign. 
So the first argument to this object.assign function is just going to be an empty object. And this is where all of this newly updated data is going to be written into and returned from object.assign. The second one is going to be the previous value of the data. And the third one is going to be an object that represents the updated value of the data that we want according to this new data that is coming in. Now, again, we are updating the messages query. So this is going to have a key of message in the Apollo cache. So what all we need to do here is create a new array that represents our updated messages state. So this is going to be a array and we want to take that new message and add it to the front of this array. But we also want to include all of the previous messages. So we're appending the new message to the messages array. Okay, so now all we need to do is just invoke this function so that this component uh, calls the subscribe to more function and actually establishes this connection to our server so that we're getting these real time updates in our browser. Um, a little bit different from our conversations wrapper, if we go back, we only had to invoke this particular function a single time. Um, because of the way subscriptions work is you just find you just invoke them and then it creates this um, socket connection to the server. And this like real time data flow occurs, which is totally fine for conversations, you only need to do that once. Um, in messages, though, it's a little bit different because we have multiple conversations and we want to subscribe to more messages in all of those conversations, right? Like if I click on this conversation with Safari here, I need to I need to tell the server that I want to receive the message sent subscription updates from the server for this particular conversation. And then if I were to go to a different conversation, if one existed, <laughs> there's only one right now, I also want to subscribe to more messages in that conversation as well. So every time I go into a conversation, I want my feed to update in real time. Therefore, I need to fire the subscribe to more subscription function for every conversation that I visit so that my feed in all of those conversations update in real time whenever I'm in them. So we are going to create a use effect to do this. However, we are not going to have an empty dependency array here like we did in conversations wrapper. We don't want this to just run a single time. We are going to add a dependency of conversation ID because we are subscribing to updates for a particular conversation. So we want to fire the subscription every time the conversation ID changes so that we are getting updates in the conversation we are currently looking at. Okay, so every time conversation ID changes, we want to call our subscribe to more messages function and pass in a conversation ID. So I'm getting an error here, GraphQL subscription error, variable conversation ID of required type string was not provided. Okay, I'm just going to refresh this page here. See if I still get that error. Okay, I still am. Oh yes, okay, this is a very, very critical thing that I miss here. So with our subscribe to more function, we have told Apollo what subscription we are subscribing to, the message sent. We have given it an update query uh, for when the subscription receives new data. However, we are missing one thing, right? If we go back and look at our uh, messages type defs, our subscription needs a conversation ID because, well, we need to know which conversation we want updates to, right? I need to know which conversation this message was sent in. Um, so that is why there is that, that conversation ID input there. So that is this error we're getting at saying that uh, we're not passing in the conversation ID to the subscription. So we currently have no idea what conversation we should be receiving updates for. So that is why we have this variables option that we can pass in and TypeScript knows that we need to pass this a conversation ID. So now if I save that, that should remove this error. So I'm just going to refresh. Cool. So no more error. And so now when this component mounted with this particular conversation ID, 638, blah, 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 whatever, it created a subscription to receive updates in this conversation in real time. Okay, so what we're going to do is inside of our update query, I am going to console log the subscription data to show you the data that is coming in from our subscription. So again, this update query function is going to fire every single time this subscription receives some sort of update from the server. Okay, so let's give a very, very, very high level overview of what's happening and the whole data flow here. So if I go back to my messages resolvers, when a user sends a message in a particular conversation through the send message mutation, we do all this stuff, right? Uh, we create the new message and then we emit this message sent event and we are passing the newly uh, created message to that subscription. So what's going to happen is uh, this subscription down here is going to fire and the payload of that subscription is going to have that new message on it. And then what we're doing is emitting this event 
to all of the connected users who have subscribed to updates in this conversation. And the payload represents the data that's actually going to be transmitted from the server to our client. And that data is what is going to be received here on our browser. So if this all works successfully and we don't have any like syntax errors or anything on our backend or whatever, the subscription data should contain our new message from uh, other users in this conversation. So let's see if this works. <clears throat> so I'm going to open up Safari here and go to localhost 3000. Okay, so let's see if this works. So what I'm going to do is open up this conversation with Chrome from Safari and I'm going to send a new message and I should receive this data in real time. And in fact, if our update query function is defined correctly, we should actually also see this update in the feed here because we're uh, through this update query function updating the data object in our Apollo cache, um, which is being rendered on our UI. So let's see if this works. Does this work? Okay. So we got the data, it's logging in our browser here. So here is subscription data, let's send another one. Okay, so we're, so we're getting subscriptions, this is, subscriptions work. If I go into one of these, zoom in a bit here. We can see that it has data inside of it, message sent, and we actually are getting that new data in real time from Safari. So that is really, really cool. Um, our UI doesn't seem to be updating. Is there a particular reason for that? So uh, the way we can take a look at this in a little bit more detail is um, go to this Apollo section here of our developer tools. And I will put the link to this Chrome extension in the, um, in the description. So feel free to go there and install it so you can kind of see what I'm seeing here. Oh my goodness. Okay, I think I might be a bozo, a certified bozo. <laughs> I love that word, bozo. I've, I've looking into this for the past like five minutes and I'm like, oh, what's the issue? And I think I realized that the issue is I'm just simply missing an S here. Messages, plural. That is what the query is called, messages. So that is how it is stored in our Apollo cache, um, not message. So Apollo really had no idea what we were updating here. Or it didn't know we were updating the messages query because we said message. So that is my fault. I apologize, but I'm glad that happened actually, because it got us to look at this Apollo client Chrome extension here. So, um, let's refresh this page and see if we can get this to work now. Okay. So let's go send a message from Safari. Hey dude, is this going to work? There we go. Okay. So now the feed's updating in real time. So we can go back to our console here and we can see the subscription data is coming in and we've already seen that, but now the actual feed is being updated. So, yo dude, nice feed, buddy, ha 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 <laughs> Okay, yeah, so our feed's updating in real time. So we just sort of achieved like, probably like the most exciting part of this build. The sending of messages is like the, the core of this application. So hopefully you find this as exciting as me. Uh, getting the messages to work in real time is, is really cool. I just think real time data in general is pretty fascinating. Okay, so our feed is updating in real time. However, this looks terrible. We have no idea who sent what. So now that our subscription is successfully working and we're getting these updates in real time, we can now work on the visual aspect of our feed and make it more aesthetic with our beautiful message item component. Now our message item component is probably the most fun component to build in this entire application. At least that's what I thought. Uh, and it's kind of fun to do the styling of like, oh, did I send this and make it blue, etc. I just thought it was kind of, kind of fun. Inside of our messages directory here, let's create a new file called message. Um, item. Okay, let's go ahead and create our new message item functional component here. So const message item, this is going to return a React functional component that is going to take in an interface, which we will define in just a second here. And this is going to be a function that returns a piece of HTML that represents an individual message. Okay, so let's make the default export message item. Okay, let's define the interface for the props that this component is going to receive. So interface message item. Okay, so what props is this component going to take in? Well, it's an individual message. That's what this component represents. So it is going to take in the actual message object. And this is going to be of type message populated. So we can import that type from our backend util types. Um, and it's also going to take in a Boolean called sent by me. 
And as the name suggests, this is going to be a Boolean that represents whether or not this particular message item was sent by me or if it is sent to me by another user. Because if it's because we need to apply some different styling depending on whether or not this is true or false. Okay, so let's put the interface in here. Whoops, this is supposed to be message item props. Message item props. Okay. And then we can destructure our props in here. Message and sent by me. So what is the HTML going to be for an individual message item? So the outermost container is going to be a stack component. So bring that in from Chakra. And this is going to have a direction of row. I'm going to give this a padding of four and a spacing of also four. And we're going to apply some hover styling to the message. So when we hover over a particular message item, we are going to change the background to be slightly different than the base color. And then we are going to specify a justify uh, content property here as well. And this is going to differ depending on this sent by me Boolean. Now, again, it's kind of hard to explain without any sort of visual here. So I'm just going to actually leave this blank for now. And then we'll come back to this when we have a message rendered on the screen and I will show you what I am talking about. And I'm also going to add the last thing here is going to be word break. And this is going to be equal to break word. And just so we can get this component actually rendered on the UI, let's just render the message bot in here for a quick second and back in our messages. Let's remove this uh, div we had previously, bring in the message item and pass in the props here. Uh, import that from our file and message is going to be equal to the message that we're currently iterating through and sent by me. So we can say, does the messages sender ID, so message.sender.id, is that equal to the user ID of the currently signed in user on this particular browser? And that is going to come from the user session. So we can say user ID here, which is being passed in as a prop. So you can see here that there's something showing up here, this hover state. The text isn't showing up though. I'm not too sure why. It might just have to do with some of our styling. I'm sure we will get to that, but uh, you can see with this hover state that they are there. So if we go back to our message item component, let's keep building this out. Okay, so for messages that were not dis that were not sent by me or the currently signed in user, we are going to display the avatar of the other user. So we're going to do some conditional rendering here. We're going to say, if this message was not sent by me, um, we are going to display a component, and this component is going to um, be the sort of like profile picture of the other user. Now, we don't have profile picture uploading functionality in our app. Um, so what I'm going to do is just create like a sort of dummy avatar here. So we're going to say size is equal to small. So if I save that. Um, so yeah, we can see that this little little image is showing up here. Again, we don't have profile picture functionality, so everyone just has this like <laughs> base avatar thing, but um, it's better than than nothing at all, I think. And we're going to give this flex box an align items of flex end. Underneath this component here, we're going to create a, another stack component. We're essentially just constructing the entire uh, message item, and there's a bunch of just like flex box containers in here being represented by these stack components. So there's kind of a, a lot of containers here. So this is going to have a spacing of one, and we're going to give us a width of 100%. And actually, while we're building this out, I'm going to give a border of one pixel solid red to this outermost container so we can see what we're, we're, we're working with here. Inside of this stack, we, we are going to have another stack. Again, this will all become more clear as we start seeing things appear here. Um, this is going to have a row direction. So we're going to say direction is equal to row. This is going to have an align items value of center so that everything is centered vertically. And we are going to specify the justify uh, value of this. That is going to change depending on the value of sent by me. And um, I'm just going to leave this blank for now. And I can show you what that's going to be doing when we have the, the message on the screen. Inside of here, we are going to render another component conditionally, and that is going to be the username of the message sender. Now, if I sent the message myself, I, I don't care what my own username is. Like I know I am Shaddy or Chrome in this case. <laughs> I don't really need to display the sender username if I sent the message. So we're only going to display this if this message was not sent by me. So if this message was not sent by me, let's create a new text component. Uh, have we imported text? Not yet. Text is like the one that doesn't auto import. It's kind of weird. Okay, so import that from Chakra. 
inside of this text, this is where we're going to put the sender dot, sorry, sorry, the message dot sender dot username. And we're going to style this text a little bit here. Um, this is going to have a font weight of 500. It is going to have a text line property of left, if I could type. And that is it. Whoops, what did I do here? We don't need this bracket. There we go. Okay, so we can see the username of the user that sent this message. Okay, and one thing I actually want to point out here is if Chrome sends a message, um, you'll see that in a few seconds, once the server receives that message sent event, our own browser receives that event and then is able to render that component on, on the UI here. Um, You'll notice that it took a second, right? Because this had to go to the server, the server had to do some stuff, and then it emits that event. Um, that's not really great experience, right? We, when, we, when, a, when a user sends a message, we want it to instantly appear in the feed. We don't want it to like have to go to the server and then the server do something, blah, blah, blah. In a chat application, the message instantly appears in the feed. And this is something we're going to do in a little bit here. We're going to do something called optimistic UI rendering. Um, and I'll explain more about what that is in a little bit, but I just wanted to point that out right now in case some of you were wondering, because I'm sure you guys have tested like sending messages uh, to see what it looks like in your in that same browser. Um, and I just wanted to point out that this is not the behavior <laughs> that we're going to um, continue with. But yeah, that is just a tangent and we will get more to that later when we get on the topic of optimistic UI rendering. Let's keep going here. And I'm just going to close this directory underneath this uh, sender username. We are going to display the time that this message was sent. Now, in order to do this, we are going to use our date FNS package, which I believe we have already installed because we have a time here. Uh, yes, so we have date FNS. So um, the formatting here is a little bit interesting and it took a bit of research to figure out how to do this in the context of a chat application. Uh, but there is a way to do that with date FNS. And um, I'm going to show you how we are going to do that. So inside of this new text component here under the username, um, we are going to, well, first let's style this. Let's give this a font. Um, let's give this a font size of 14 and a color of white alpha 700. Okay. Um, now inside of here, we are going to use a function called format relative. And this is the function that's going to take the messages created at date and format it in this like way I was talking about where it's like four hours ago or two days ago kind of thing. Um, so let's bring that in. So we're going to say, whoops. So we're going to say um, format relative. So this is going to import from date FNS. Uh, so make sure that imports. Now this takes in some, some arguments here. The first one is going to be the date that we're actually like formatting. And that one is going to be the message uh, created at date. The second argument is going to be just a new date instance. And the third argument is essentially going to represent like sort of the format or it's going to sort of represent the format and style we want this date to have. Um, this is where it gets a little bit kind of tricky and I had to do some research. We have to specify this thing called lo locale, lo I don't even know how to say this, locale, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Um, and the way to get it formatted exactly how we want it to is a little bit weird. Um, maybe there's a simpler way to do this, but this is kind of like the way I found to do it on Stack Overflow. So we are going to, in this object, spread uh, another object that we're going to need to import. And it's going to be called ENUS. There's a few you can import, which is kind of makes this even more confusing. We want to import the one from date FNS slash locale uh, slash EN dash US. So this route here. So let's save that. We're going to get an error. Don't worry about that right now. Um, we're going to come up here and define an object called format relative locale. And this is essentially just providing, I guess, like different formats we can have uh, for our date, depending on like the time that this message was sent relative to the time right now. So this allows us to change like the human readable message, depending on when this message was sent relative to the time at right now, <laughs> the time right now. Um, so how do we use this? Well, inside of this object here, we're going to specify this format relative callback function. This is going to give us a token. And this token is going to be used to access this object here and format the date depending on the time. So we're going to take this token 
and we're going to say uh, format relative locale, and we want to access that object at this token. So this is mad because it's saying that we're not allowed to use this to like index this, this object here. So the way to get around this is I'm just going to typecast this token as a key of this object. So we can say like key of type of uh, the object format relative locale. Okay, so when we say that, now TypeScript is happy we don't have that compiler error. Okay, so what is this thing here? Invalid time date. Let's see what's, let's see what's happening. Um, okay, so I'm assuming there's something wrong with this message dot created at date, right? Like if I were to say like um, new date or something, this should probably work, I think. Okay, yeah, so, so that works. And it's just giving us like the time, but this is incorrect. Um, it doesn't it doesn't break anything. So I think there's something wrong with our created at date, and I'm not too sure why. So I'm just going to comment this out for a second here. Save this, and I'm just going to check out this message's data to look at the created at date. Created at is a string. This might be a GraphQL issue. I think. This might have to do actually with our date scaler. I can't remember if we declared a date scaler. I think what's happening is like, this is actually like, yeah, it's like a proper date on our backend, but then GraphQL isn't able to like transfer a date value over the server. So then it converts it to a string. And that's why it's saying that this is like incorrect. If we look at the backend, I go to GraphQL resolvers. We had this scalar date type here. And I think I explained this a while ago, essentially this is just going to allow us to like serialize a date so that it can be passed from GraphQL server, from our GraphQL server to our client over the network. Um, but I remember seeing it commented out. So I'm gonna bring this in. So we're importing, whoops, 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 whoops. <laughs> we're, uh, we're importing scalar resolvers, which is this thing we were just looking at here. And we're just going to add it to our resolvers here, scalar resolvers, so I think maybe this should help us. So let's refresh the page here. There we go. Okay, so now our date is proper. So yeah, it did have to do with our scalar. Okay, so essentially what's happening is like I said, this date is like actually stored properly in our database as a date. But GraphQL sees that and is like, Oh, I, I don't know really how to like transmit a variable of type date over the server. Uh, so I'm just going to convert it to a string, which is what we were seeing before. That is why we're creating this scalar resolver. So GraphQL is going to see um, that this thing has a date on our server when it's coming from our database. So we're essentially creating like a custom data type here that represents our date, and it allows the date to be transferred over the network as an actual date and not a string. So if you go back to our message item, this should work now. There we go. All right, so now uh, this formatting thing works and you can see that we have like 6.01 p.m. It's currently 6.12 p.m. And yeah, this lines up with about how long ago I sent these and these were sent way earlier today, like three, whatever. You can see these two over here that were created um, a Monday at 10.08 p.m. Is that correct? It's Saturday, did I? I guess the last time I filmed was Monday before today. Monday at 10.08. So you can see that if this was like over a week ago, so it's saying like last week, it formats it in this way, like the... Um, Monday at time. Okay, let's keep building out this component because it looks kind of ugly right now. Okay, so outside of this stack here, so we're gonna go like text and stack that underneath that, we're going to define a flex box and this is what's actually going to contain the message body. So inside of this flex box, we're also going to have a box component and this is going to have text inside of it and this text is going to be the message body. So you can save that. Now you can see that that is actually appearing on the screen. So now let's adjust the styles to look proper. Okay, so a lot of these stacks that we've seen up here and we've defined are just like layout items. The actual like message that's going to be like styled is going to be um, this box here. So let's, let's do that first. So this is going to have a background. Now again, the background of the message is going to change depending on whether or not this was sent by us. If it is sent by me, it's going to have a color of brand 100, which is going to be the iMessage blue. If not, it's going to have a background of white alpha 300. Okay, so you can see that here. So these were the ones that are sent by me. 
and these are the ones that were not sent by me. We are going to give this box a padding in the x direction of two and a padding in the y direction as one. We're going to give this a border radius of 12 and a max width and a max width of 65%. That's to prevent like a really long message from like spanning the whole screen because in a chat app that, that doesn't happen. It sort of does this like word wrap behavior. So cool, this is looking pretty good and more like iMessage. However, our alignment is not quite correct. We want messages that are sent by us to be on the right. So let's come back to this uppermost container here and we'll add this justify. So this is going to have a ternary operator and it's going to be like, okay, was this message sent by me? If it was, we are going to give this a value of flex end. If not, it's going to be flex start. Again, I'll explain this more once we have a visual here. For this one down here, same thing. And in fact, I don't really know why I have this on both. I might be able to remove one, but we'll see. And also we're going to have that on this flex box here. So we can say uh, justify is equal to that. We're putting that message on the right side of the screen if it is sent by us. For those of you that don't know, uh, with Flexbox, Flex End essentially um, places the content of that container uh, at the end of the container. So we're, we're placing it over there. Flex Start is at the start of the container. So this is how we're getting that behavior of like putting it on the other side if it's sent by us. So if it's sent by me, we want the behavior to be Flex End. We want it to be at the end of the Flex container. And this whole thing that I'm hovering here with this gray hover state is that container. And we want to position all the content at the end of that container. So that is what is meant by flex end. And you can see our feed actually has scroll behavior because before on our messages component, we added this, um, these CSS properties like overflow Y, scroll, um, overflow hidden. So essentially these are CSS properties that allow you to have the scroll behavior. So if the content of the container exceeds the height of the container, we are telling CSS, we are styling our component to hide that content. We don't want the container to grow beyond the specified height to display that content. We want it to just be capped at a certain height. And then we're adding the overflow scroll property to the feed to, 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 to this other child component here to allow us to scroll the container when there, when the content is overflowed. So what does it look like on mobile? Nice. That looks really good. That's really cool. I love that. And so that is it for our message item component. Actually, we can go ahead and remove this border wherever it is. Border one pixel solid red. Let's remove that. And so if I send a really long message here, blah, 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 blah. And I just copy this. Copy, paste, 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 paste. Um, we capped the width at 65% because we don't want this to like, go across the whole screen. You could do that. It's totally up to you. Like if I got rid of this, this will span the whole feed. I personally like it when it has like a, a cap, it can't really exceed 65%. Cool. So if I go back to Safari and I refresh this, Safari sees the opposite of what Chrome sees, right? Chrome sent this ugly, weird gibberish message. <laughs> so it's blue for Chrome. However, it is gray on a Safari screen and you can see Chrome's username. It's really, really cool um, how we have conditional rendering depending on who sent this message. So, <clears throat> so if I said, hey Chrome, what's up? That appears over there and I say, nice dude, lol. <laughs> really, really cool conversation these two are having. This is super sick. We can actually receive messages in real time now and they're styled. Uh, this is a critical piece of functionality. So congrats to making it this far. We can now officially have conversations with other people. Now, where are we going now? I've alluded to these UI updates um, for the past like half an hour about what we need to do when a message is sent. We need to clear the input and we want to actually immediately insert that new message that the user sends into the feed. We don't want to wait for like the server socket event to happen. See, we see that delay. As soon as I press enter, I want it to show up in the feed and that's what we're going to work on now. Uh, we're going to get into this thing called optimistic UI rendering and manually updating the Apollo cache to contain that new message. So that's where we're going now. So we're going to go back to our input component because this is where we are firing off our send message mutation in this on send message function. Um, and there is something we need to add to this function here in order to update this cache and show the message on the UI instantly. So I want to talk about the concept of optimistic rendering. So when it comes to sort of any sort of data fetching or pushing data to a server, there is optimistic rendering and pessimistic rendering. <clears throat> so what is optimistic rendering? Uh, optimistic rendering is essentially updating the UI even before 
what I mean by updating the UI, let, let me let me backtrack a few seconds. <laughs> it is updating the UI with the latest data before we have received a success response from the server. So this is how we can like quickly update our user's interface, uh, even if the server or like the request to the server to store that new data does not succeed. And that is why it's called optimistic, because we are optimistically going to assume that the server is going to succeed. Pessimistic rendering, on the other hand, would be the opposite. We would send data to a server and we would only update the UI once we have uh, received a success response from the server. So which one of these you use depends on the feature you are working on and what your application is doing. Um, and it really also depends on the importance of the data that you are transmitting. So, uh, <clears throat> sorry, nasty frog in the throat, it will not go away. The more I talk, the more it seems to build up. So my apologies. <laughs> um, okay, so when do you use optimistic and or pessimistic rendering? It depends on the chat, app, or sorry, it depends on the app. So in a chat application, um, you know, from a user experience perspective, pessimist, sorry, optimistic rendering is preferred, right? You want to see those, the message appear in your feed instantly. It just makes sense from a user experience point of view. And also to add to that, the importance of a message, like, yeah, it's important, but it's not like so, so important that we need to wait for a response from the server to display it. When it comes to data like banking data or like healthcare data, that that data has like very high importance and is extremely important um, when, say, like a user's in their bank or, or something, um, like a banking app. We for sure want to make sure that that data has correctly been saved or done whatever on the server and that the server has had no issues before we tell the user, like, yeah, this, is, this worked and here's like an updated list of whatever. So the two things are really like user experience and then the importance of data. <clears throat> like in a chat application, if a user sends a message and it gets automatically added to the feed optimistically, and then they like refresh or something and something went wrong on the server and the message isn't there. Like, yeah, it's not the best user experience because they're like, whoa, I sent a message. But hopefully your application would have like robust like retry methods or something um, to like try to send the data again. That's kind of a more advanced topic, but I'm kind of going in circles here, but essentially, you just have to weigh these things um, depending on the application and the feature that you're working on. So for the case of sending a message, we are going to use optimistic rendering. Uh, so what we want to do is basically put this new message that the user creates and types into the input into the Apollo cache um, before this await send message receives a response from the server. So we're going to instantly put it in the cache regardless of whether or not this succeeds. Um, so how do we do that? Well, Apollo allows us to do that. Um, <clears throat> so the send message function given to us by our use mutation hook has some additional configuration that we can apply. So if I go beneath this variables object here, and I just do control spacebar, um, we've seen these options before, but you'll notice here that there is an option called optimistic response. So this is Apollo knowing that sometimes we want to do optimistic UI rendering. To tell it that we want to optimistically um, re uh, update the UI, we need to give it the name of the mutation. So send message TypeScript is telling us that here. And we want to say true. So now what's going to happen is there's also an, okay. And there's, so there's an update function as well that we have seen before that is going to fire when this um, mutation completes. So how does this work with optimistic rendering? So it without, so without optimistic rendering, the update function would fire only when this uh, send message function receives a successful response from the server. When we configure it with optimistic response true, this is going to fire as soon as this request is sent. We're not going to wait for a response from the server. So we're basically telling it to fire this update function immediately, uh, and which is sort of like the core concept of optimistic rendering. So now, inside of here, what we want to do is all these state updates and cache updates to give the user the experience that we desire. Okay, so the update function gives us access to the Apollo cache. And uh, I don't know if I've explained the cache before, I might have earlier in the series. Essentially, the cache is just 
basically the same thing as state. Um, if we go look at the Apollo section here in our Chrome DevTools, you can see that all of the data that has been queried for is stored in this Apollo cache. And this is stateful. So every time you make a query, Apollo puts it in here and it's essentially the same as like React state. Like I'm pretty sure under the hood, yeah, it's a very, very similar to React state and, and what I, kind of like what, what I was saying before when we were um, uh, updating the query, the messages query with the subscription, we were basically like telling Apollo to update the cache um, for that particular query. So you can think of the cache as basically state and caching is actually with Apollo is actually a bit better than state in my opinion, because um, Apollo out of the box prevents you from making redundant requests to your server, right? Like if I, if I I've had multiple conversations here, um, let me actually show you this because this is kind of interesting. So I'm gonna open up Firefox here and go to, um, I'm gonna create a conversation with Chrome. Okay, so, um, and then I'm gonna send a message to Chrome. Hey Chrome, it's Firefox. Okay, so this is uh, this message is working. So I'm just gonna refresh the page here. Okay, so you'll notice that there was a loading state, right? So we went and fetched this message from, from the server. If I go and click on the Safari message, the same thing is gonna happen. It's gonna go fetch those messages. But now if I go back to Firefox, it does not make another request to the server and the message is already there. If I go back to Safari, watch this, we're not gonna see any loaders. Right? It's just instantly there. And so that is what, like, that is the whole concept of caching. So what Apollo does is it, it checks the cache first before making the request to the server. If the data is there, it will just render it on the UI. It instantly has access to it. So this is like the beautiful nature of caching. Uh, and that's why I love Apollo because it just comes out of the box and it saves you trips to your server. Okay, let's minimize. Whoops. Firefox. Okay, so that is like what the cache is and we can make manual updates to this cache. We can like re-query, write, uh, we can read from the cache to get the current state of the cache. We can modify the cache. There's a lot of stuff we can do. And so what we wanna do here is the same way you would update React state, if there's some sort of update, we can update our cache, right? I want you to think of cache as like state. They're very, very similar, pretty much the same thing. So we can manually update our cache in the same way we would do that with React State. It's that, it, that is the concept that we're basically doing here. So what we wanna do here is we want to take this new message that the user creates. So like if I type a message here, I want to, as soon as I press enter, take that and put it into the cache because that is going to automatically be reflected in, um, in, in how do I say this? We're inserting it into the cache so that inside of our messages component, it's going to be immediately on this data object so that our uh, feed updates and there's gonna be a new message item created for that new message because we're going to store it on data.messages in our cache. So that's essentially what we're going to be doing. Now, why are we doing this in the first place? Well, if you think about it, we have a subscription for messages, right? Like every time a user sends a message to a conversation, um, we ourselves are going to also receive that subscription. Like if I, if I send this message, this subscription is going to fire for me as well. But this goes back to pessimistic rendering, right? If I sent this message, I press enter, it takes a second for it to like put be put into the, I don't know why there's five of them there. That was concerning. Why is it doing that? <laughs> okay, I'm not sure why there's like five of them. Let me just try refreshing here. That was kind of weird. Maybe we just discovered a bug. Okay, there's only two. This might be... Okay, I think it was just some sort of like hot reloading error. Okay, sorry, that was a little bit of a sidetrack. But if I type a message and I press enter, so one, two, three, enter, see that delay? This is kind of what I talked about before, right? We, what, what's happening there is we're, we're sending the message to the server and then we're waiting for the subscription to fire and then we're updating our uh, message query and then it's being reflected on the UI. What we want to do instead is instantly put this in the cache so that we, we don't really have to um, wait for the subscription to fire. So that is what we're doing. Okay, so what do we need to do here? Well, we're going to need to grab the existing part of the cache that we're interested in and that is going to be 
our messages query for this particular conversation. So what we can do is create a variable called existing, and this is going to be the like um, like a snapshot of the cache before um, the message is inserted. And this is going to take a interface called messages data, which we have defined already, and the structure of the data that is stored in the cache for this query has this exact structure, messages, which maps to an array of populated messages. Okay, so inside of here, we need to tell it what query we are grabbing from the cache. And this is going to be our message operations dot query dot messages. And we query for messages in a particular conversation. So we need to tell Apollo which messages we are interested in and we are interested in the messages in this particular conversation we are sending a message to. Okay, so now we have this existing uh, state, this like snapshot before we insert data, and we got that from reading from the cache. Now we want to write to the cache. So what we're going to do is say cache.write query, and this is going to take in two generic types. The first one is going to be our messages data, so that is the structure of the data that we are inserting into the cache. The second one is going to be our variables. So this is going to be of structure conversation ID, which is of type string. Okay, we can invoke this. And inside of here, we again need to tell it what query we are updating. So this is gonna be message operations dot query dot messages. We need to also pass in the variables. Whoa, variables conversation ID, and this is like, um, this is how TypeScript knows what variables we're passing in here to our right through this, uh, this interface here. If I change this to like, shaddy ID, <laughs> or ID, uh, if I went to, were to come on here, it would be shaddy ID. So that, that is the purpose of this interface here. Conversation ID, okay. Um, now we need to tell it, well, what is the, what does the data look like? What does the updated data look like that we're putting into the cache? So this is where we're going to merge this new message with our existing message state. So what we're going to do is spread all of the existing messages in the message query. So we can say, whoops, we don't want to spread messages. We want to say spread existing. Did I just import something? No. So spread all of the existing cache data, um, and we want to update the messages array. And what we want to do is essentially just insert that new message um, at the front of this array. So this is going to be represented by an object here. This, this object is our new message. Um, and then at the, uh, we also want to spread the existing messages. So we can say existing dot messages. So we're appending the new um, message to the front of the existing messages array. And this is kind of mad here. It's saying that uh, type of message populated is undefined is not assignable to, or it's basically saying like, if this is undefined, we can't really spread that and apply it to an array. So what I'm going to do here is we're going to add a ternary operator that says existing. And if existing is true, we're going to do this. Otherwise we're going to spread an empty array. And actually, I'm going to make this existing dot messages. Whoops. Okay, this is still not mad. Existing is possibly null. Uh, message data or null. But we're checking that it is true here. So why is that mad? This ternary operator should satisfy the TypeScript compiler. Do I have to say existing and this? No, that's weird, I don't like that. Okay, what I'm gonna do instead is get rid of this ternary operator altogether, and I'm going to typecast this to messages data. And this should now accept existing dot messages, but we wanna spread it. There we go. Okay, and uh, this new object we're creating is of type message populated, so if I go inside of it, these are all the fields that it is expecting. So what we can do is essentially just spread our new message 
new message and it'll tell us what fields we're missing. Um, I think we need to add the dates here. Yeah, is missing the following properties, created at and updated at. So when we create this message um, and we're storing it in our cache right now, we can just make the created at date a new date that is date dot now because it was created like literally right now. Um, and then the same thing for updated at. So we can copy this. Updated at now. Okay, and this is still mad. We might have to massage this. Property sender is missing. Do not have a sender. Oh, okay. Um, what I'm gonna do is create, ah, uh, we might have to construct a new object here because we have like our send message arguments which is not the same as a, as a message populated. Yeah, it's a little bit different. Okay, so what I'm gonna do instead is I'm just gonna create a new object here. Uh, that's going to have an ID. We'll kind of manually create all these inputs. So it's gonna have an ID that is going to be message ID. That's coming from up here. It's going to have a body and the body is going to be the message body state. It's going to have a sender ID, which is going to be the sessions user ID, because we ourselves sent this message. It is going to have a conversation ID. It is going to have a sender. And this is going to have an ID of, again, session.user.id. It's going to have a username, session.user.username. And then those two dates. So we're going to have a created at and an updated at. Whoops, there we go. And then we just need a comma here and we can save that. So yeah, we sort of had to manually create an object that has the same structure as a message populated because Apollo and based on our defined types, we don't wanna write something to the cache for this particular query unless it matches everything else in the cache. So we need to kind of manually create these fields um, in order to insert it in there. Cool, okay, and um, that is it for this update query. Uh, 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 oh, sorry, <laughs> update callback. We tell Apollo to fire this update function as soon as this request is made. We are not waiting to come back from the server. We take the new message, or we grab the existing uh, cache message. We, <laughs> sorry, we grab the existing messages from the cache, and then we update it to contain the new message and then we write that data to the cache. So now, if I just refresh this page and I send a message, we are going to instantly see the message in the feed. Hey, are we seeing this immediately? There you go. So it appears in the feed immediately, lol. But we have some weird, weird stuff going on with our messages. <laughs> so you can see our feeds updating uh, immediately, but we sort of have this like weird behavior happening. Hey dude, hey dude. So it's like being inserted in there just in like a really weird order. Um, so if I search for hey dude, hey dude, there's three, I just wanna see if like multiple of them are being inserted. Cause it's like the subscription's going to, like if I send a new message, hey dude. Yeah, so so what's happening is like, we, we, we do this optimistic UI rendering, but then we're also still receiving um, the message from the subscription. So we have to add some logic here to prevent the subscription from also inserting the um, data into the cache. So let's figure out how we're going to do that because I, kind of forget. I think we just have to, um, yes. Okay, so there was a piece of logic I left out um, that I didn't want to add in when we were initially building out the um, subscription here because I didn't want to add any confusion, but now we can build that in. So as I mentioned, we send a message, Apollo instantly inserts this into the cache, but then we also receive the subscription data and then it inserts it into the cache again. Uh, definitely not good. We don't want to put duplicate messages into our cache because this is exactly what we're seeing. We see two hey dudes show up here. So what we want to do here before we uh, append this new message that comes from the subscription to this array, 
We want to check if we are the sender of this message that is incoming from the subscription. If we are, we don't want to add it to this um, to the to the cache here. We don't want to update the query. We just want the previous value of state because we are doing the, the update optimistically in our input component. So what we're going to do here, so, based, so, so what I mean is this, the value of this array is going to be different depending on if we are the sender of this message or not. So we can add a ternary operator here that says new message dot sender dot ID. If this is equal to like the user ID of the currently signed in user, we don't want to append the new message to the array. We instead just want uh, to use prev messages, right? We're not, we're not gonna do anything. We're just basically returning the previous state. If we are not the sender, meaning that like, some other user sent this message, we do want to insert it into our cache. So hopefully that makes sense. So now if I just refresh this, we can send a message, I'm gonna send something unique, unique. And we should not see it be inserted into the feed two times. So that happened once only, please. <laughs> cool. So we're doing optimistic UI rendering. It's instantly being inset, inputted into the feed, which is much better behavior. Um, and then when we receive the subscription data, we are not going to input it into the cache because we are the sender of this message. We do not need to insert it in there for a second time because that's happening here. Uh, one other thing we need to do is in our update function, um, well, it doesn't really have to be in our update function. We can put it really here is we just want to clear it, clear the input. So we can say set uh, message body to be a blank clear input be a blank string. So if I send this clear input, nice. This is good behavior. Nice. Okay, so cool. This is like much better than what we were seeing before. And yeah, that concludes optimistic rendering. I hope that all makes sense. Let's go. Let's, uh, let's open up Safari. Let's have a little conversation here. Let's refresh to get those updates here. I'm going to say, yo, dude, what's up? Oh, what happened there? Okay, something weird is still kind of happening. <laughs> What's going on in our terminal? Not seeing an error. This is our back end. This is our front end. This is our back end here. Okay, what is the error? Is there an error? Huh, error sending message. Oh, we did get one. Oh man, what is this? This is, what is it with these weird Prisma errors? This is so annoying. <laughs> okay, so I, for the last half an hour or so, have been uh, diving into this issue. Um, I was seeing that weird Prisma error again. It's kind of deep up there now. I've been testing a lot of stuff. I was seeing this weird Prisma error that we were seeing a while ago with this parent IDs ordering issue. And so I, check the code because I'm like certain that everything's the same as the demo project that I built because I'm not seeing that error. I've never seen this error in the demo project. So I triple checked that the code is the same. Uh, so I don't think it was an error in our code. Um, so I honestly, uh, I can't figure out what it was. So I did some research and I found that there is an open issue right now in the Prisma GitHub. Someone had the same issue uh, using Prisma 4.3.1, which is the version we are using, actually. And this issue was opened on October 11th, so pretty recently, two months ago. Exactly two months ago, actually. It's December 11th. Wow. Um, and yeah, he was having the similar issue, and the Prisma team replied and essentially marked it as a bug. So if you look at the labels here, it is a bug. Um, and it's still open. So I'm not sure, depending on when you're watching this and doing this tutorial, you will probably have like a different version of Prisma. We are using this exact version in this issue, 4.3.1. And so I wanted to try something because I, so I changed our Prisma version to 4.0.0 because that is the one I'm using in the demo here. This is, this is the demo project. I have Prisma Client 4.0.0 and Prisma 4.0.0. So I changed the version from 4.3.1 to 4.0.0 and the issue seems to not exist. So I think this is a bug. Uh, I, again, I checked our code and 
I can't seem to find anything that is wrong. So, and, and just like downgrading to 4.0.0 fix the issue. So not sure, kind of annoying. Um, yeah, my apologies. This is kind of like an, one of those annoying like version errors, but oh well, we just can proceed uh, with 4.0.0. So to install 4.0.0, you can just run this command here, npm install at Prisma client and then at 4.0.0. And then make sure you also install Prisma 4.0.0, and that would be done with the command um, npm i Prisma at 4.0.0. So make sure you do both Prisma and Prisma client because it warns you if they're not the same. After you install those two things, we need to regenerate our Prisma client so we can run npx Prisma generate and. Um, tell it where our schema is by saying our schema is located at source prisma schema dot prisma. So just regenerate the prisma command. Um, and yeah, it will recreate a new one at this version. Now it's telling us update is available. Again, I don't know if this still exists depending on what version you're using. The, this issue is still open. So I'm going to assume that it is still a bug because it hasn't been closed. I'm not sure. I'm just going to proceed with 4.0.0. So I recommend you to do the same. Okay. Okay. After updating, um, things seem to be working fine. I have a bunch of, okay, well, just as I said that <laughs> I get this, uh, this error here. What is this? Oh my God. I hate this error because it never tells me where it's occurring. So usually, yeah, this is okay. I guess this is a good error to go through. Render fewer hooks than expected. So um, essentially there's a rule of hooks in React and you're not allowed to like conditionally render hooks. Like when you define hooks, like a use effect or a use state in a component, you're not allowed to only sometimes render them. They have to have, they have, to have the same number of renders um, no matter sort of like what happens. So you can't have like an early return. You know how sometimes in a component you'll return early, like if some condition you'll return uh, null. If you have one of these, your hooks cannot be below a statement like this. They would have to be above. So if I had something like a use effect under this, this would be bad. And this is probably what's happening here to cause this error, I'm going to guess. So I'm assuming somewhere in our app, there's a use effect that is below a, an early return. So I'm just gonna search for return null and see if we can find anything. So we have it return null here. Yeah, okay, exactly. So we have if error return null, and we have a use effect down here. So what I need to do is basically just move this if statement down below this use effect. <clears throat> so hopefully that solves that issue, which it seems to have. So let's refresh. Okay, network error <laughs> when attempting to fetch resource. Now this is a new error. Oh, wow, okay, we turned the server off, wow. Okay, well, at least our error handling is good. Um, that's, a, that's a positive. Okay. There we go. Okay. <laughs> but I'm glad we saw that um, React error. That was actually completely different than the network error that had nothing to do with our server. Um, but actually, our server being off triggered that React error to happen. So I guess it, they're related. Anyway, rule of hooks. You cannot have hooks below an early return statement that is against React's rules of hooks. So if you ever see that error that we just saw, uh, rendered fewer hooks than expected, that is probably why. Cool. So as I was trying to say before, we saw that error. I'm, <laughs> these errors are like taking so much extra time. Um, things seem to be working now. I have like three users, Chrome, Firefox, Safari. Um, and basically, hmm. and basically we can have conversations here. So uh, this is Safari and Chrome. So we need to do some work on this like latest message thing. Oh, I think if I refresh this. Yeah, so we don't, we, we haven't yet built the functionality to update our latest <clears throat> message. That's coming soon with our conversation updated subscription. Um, but the actual messaging seems to work. This seems to work. Just as I said that, it's probably not going to work. <laughs> okay, so if you're having any issues with like sending messages 
or any sort of like weird errors with Prisma or anything, um, please do join my Discord and message me on there. I'll try to get, help you get it sorted out. All these package updates that happened over the last few months seem to have disrupted this project quite heavily, uh, which is unfortunate, but that's just the way it goes with software. So yeah, Safari, you're not that good of a browser. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Cool. So they can talk in real time. That's pretty cool. And actually, what I'm going to do is create a conversation with Chrome and Safari. Safari, what? Not Safari. Uh, Chrome and Firefox. Create this conversation. Hopefully, this works. Okay. So if I go into here, again, we're not seeing the updates here. That's exactly our behavior currently that we have coded. So um, we see these two can talk. Um, Firefox is also seeing this message. Hey dudes. So that's coming through on both Chrome as well as Safari. So the uh, group messaging works as well. So if I message these two, hey guys, you'll see it appear both in those two browsers. Okay, so messaging works. Uh, that's super cool. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is, I'm just gonna minimize Firefox here. We are going to go back to our conversation item component and we have some work to do here. The first thing we're going to do is this logic of marking a conversation as read. Because right now, um, we don't have a way of doing that. So when a message is sent from like Chrome to Safari, Safari is updated to not have read that message. And we currently don't have a way for Safari to mark that conversation as read um, to let the database know that it is read from Safari. And that's going to be, if you recall, on the conversation participant. Remember, we have has seen latest message, this Boolean field. So we had this primitive dot icon that we had commented out a while ago because we haven't didn't have this data yet. This is from two months ago, so you probably don't remember. Uh, what we're going to do now is this. So I'm going to bring this in. And what this thing is, if I just say, if true equals false, no. <laughs> I'm going to say if... Um, so we can see this. I'm going to bring this out of the ternary or the, the, the boolean there. And we're just going to see what this looks like. This is that purple dot thing. You might remember from the demo that indicates whether or not we have read this message yet, because that's how chat apps work. If you get a new message in a conversation, this is the way, this is the UI's way of telling you that there's some updates you have not seen yet in this conversation. So that is what we're going to do now. We're going to work on this, like updating the has seen latest message field flow. Okay, so currently we don't have this field. It's coming from the conversation participant, right? We just saw in the database, that's where that field is. So we need a way to get that field off of the conversation participant. So let's just take a look at the component structure here to refresh our memory. So we have conversation item. This represents an individual, one of those things in the left-hand side. Um, this is being rendered. I'm just gonna close some of these things here. The parent of conversation item is conversation list. Conversation list renders conversation item. The parent of conversation list is conversations wrapper. And this is where a lot of our GraphQL logic goes, like our data fetching methods and some more subscriptions are going to go in here. Um, and we have this function defined called onViewConversation. And this is the function that is going to be called when a user clicks on a conversation that is on red to mark it as red so that that purple dot disappears. So for this on view conversation function, we are going to add another argument here. Um, and this is going to be the has seen latest message Boolean field coming from the conversation participant entity. And depending on what the value of that is, we're going to either mark the conversation as red or not. So what we're going to do is say if if uh, has seen latest message, we're just going to return out of this function because we don't want to call our mark conversation as red mutation. We don't need to do that if it's already red, right? Like every time, this saves us like unnecessary trips to the server. Like if I've already clicked on it, if I've already read a conversation and then I click on it again, I don't want to like go remark it as red because it's just like a redundant operation. So if this is true, we don't need to do anything. We don't need to mark it as red, it's already red. <clears throat> okay, 
So uh, coming down here, this is mad because our conversation list props expects a certain function structure for this uh, on view conversation. So if we go into that, we just need to adjust, adjust the the type de definition here for this function. So we just need to add that uh, has seen latest message Boolean field. So that fixes that. And then down here, we're getting another error because in our on click, we also need to pass in a value for has seen latest message, which is going to be either true or false. But what is this value and where are we gonna get it from? Well, this value, as we just saw, is coming from the conversation participant. And when we query for our conversations, um, like this, uh, this array here, this is a populated conversation, which includes the conversation participant entities, right? If I go conversations dot, um, or just like grab a random one, like the first one, and I say dot participants, it's one of these things. Like if I grab this zero, it's like, this is where the has seen latest message uh, value exists. And this is what we want to send to that function. But we need to figure out which participant entity belongs to the user of interest here, which is like the currently signed in user. So we have to write some logic to actually find that conversation participant entity on the conversation. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, okay, and in here, we have this map function that's iterating through all the conversations and creating a conversation item for each one. And then in the on click, we want to, and then, sorry, in the on click, we're, we're, we're this is for a specific conversation. So we want to pass in the value for has seen latest message for this particular user and this particular conversation that we're currently iterating through. So what we can do is change this uh, syntax here to turn it into a regular function uh, rather than just like an arrow. Not, not a regular function, but like a function where we can write some additional logic with, with like a return statement. <clears throat> so if I just cut this out for a sec and change this syntax to use curly brackets, if I write it like this, this is the exact same as what we had before. Um, without the curly brackets, we did not need to specify what we're returning. It's just going to return uh, the the thing on the right hand side of the arrow, the fat arrow. But now, what this allows us to do is write some additional logic inside of this function, and that logic is going to be finding this particular conversation participant for this user. So we're going to say const um, participant is equal to conversation dot participants, and we want to iterate through all of them. And basically, whoops, participants dot find, we want to find the one that belongs to this user. <clears throat> so inside of this find function, we want to iterate through all of these participants and find the one where the user dot ID is equal to the user ID that is coming from the user session. This is going to be the one that belongs to this user. Okay, and then what we can do with this participant is pass in the has seen latest message field off of that participant. So we can say participant dot has seen latest message. Save that. And that is the value we're going to pass to on view conversation. So I'm gonna close this actually. I don't I didn't really need to open it up. That was just kind of <laughs> not the best idea. All right, so now what we wanna do is actually go ahead and create that um, uh, mark conversation as red mutation. But first let's figure this out. So we have a type script error from has seen latest message. Um, so we're going to pass that in as a prop to our conversation item. So for each item, we know if they've seen this conversation or not. Okay, so we can say has seen latest message is going to be equal to this uh, participant dot has seen latest message field. And we can go to our conversation item and add that to the conversation item props. So we can say has seen latest message. And this is going to be a Boolean like this. Uh, TypeScript is gonna be mad here because the participant might not exist. Um, it always should, but I guess like the find function technically returns undefined if it doesn't find it and TypeScript knows that. So like as the developer, we know that this should always exist, but in the event that it does not, it will be undefined. That is why by default it did optional chaining here. 
Um, so what we're going to do is make this boolean or undefined. Perfect. Okay. So that solves this. And why is this mad? Oh, same same thing with the on view conversation. If we go uh, back to our conversation item, uh, actually, sorry, the wrapper, and we go to our on view conversation function. This is expecting a boolean. We can just make this undefined like that. Okay. It's a conversation list. Oh, we're just getting TypeScript errors everywhere. Okay, and then we just have to change that up here as well. Undefined. This might, I don't think this will lead to any issues. Um, we should be fine. So conversation list, we're passing, passing latest message. We can grab that from the props. Yeah, we have that commented out here. So let's uncomment that. And now it's, it actually exists in this component. Okay, let's start working on the mark conversation as red mutation. Okay, so the whole flow of marking a conversation as red is actually pretty straightforward. We're just going to make a request to the server and update this single entity here. Um, and then we're going to be doing some optimistic UI updates, very similar to what we were doing in our input. We're going to be updating the value of has seen latest message in the cache as soon as the request is fired off. So where should we start? Let's go to our backend because it's actually a pretty straightforward resolver. Um, yeah, let's go to our conversation resolvers and let's define this mutation. So inside of our mutations object here, let's define a new function called mark conversation as red. Okay. The value of this is going to be an asynchronous function. So we can say async function, and this is going to take in some arguments. The arguments are going to look like this. Okay, so when we mark a conversation as red, as I mentioned about <laughs> nine times now, I feel like I'm repeating myself. We're just, we're literally just updating this. That's all we need to do. Um, and to do that, we only need a user ID and the conversation ID to know which one of these things we should update. So that is why the arguments of this mutation require those two things so that we can actually perform a lookup in our database and update accordingly. Okay. So this function is just simply going to return a Boolean of whether or not this request succeeded. So we'll say promise Boolean. And inside of here, I'm just going to return true for now to get rid of that TypeScript error. We're going to do our usual destructuring of our context. We are going to need our user session as well as Prisma. And we will destructure our args as well. We will grab the user ID as well as the conversation ID. Okay. So the first thing we want to check is our usual, you know, authentication thing. We're going to say if no user, if no session dot user, then we want to uh, throw a new GraphQL error that says not <laughs> authorized. This should be routine by now. Okay. Then we just want to create a try catch block. In the catch block, we will simply log the error. Mark conversation as read error. Do that. I'm going to type this as, whoops, type this as <clears throat> any, and then we can just throw a new GraphQL error with the error dot message. Put optional chaining here. Okay. Now, inside of this try block, we just want to update that entity, and we don't really need to return anything. We don't, so we don't need to like store this in a variable. We can just simply say await uh, Prisma dot conversation participant, and we want to update. We're going to call update many because uh, on the update function, um, you know what I actually might do actually? Hmm. In the demo, I have update many here because with update, you can't do an update on like a non-unique key. Yeah, you can only do an update on a unique key, which is the ID. 
In a conversation participant, um, I'm trying, now this has, has me thinking. Backend user ID, conversation ID. Yeah, these aren't unique fields, the user ID and conversation ID, because multiple, like, like uh, I can be part of many conversations, right? It's a many to many relationship. Uh, so there can be many entities with the same conversation ID. So that's why the, 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 it's not unique. Same with the user ID. So the only unique field on this entity is the ID itself. Um, so in the demo, I had update many, which allows us to use non-unique fields because many of them could exist. So we could do this um, and say like data we want to update has seen latest message to be true. We're marking it as red. Uh, I don't really like this though now that I think about it because like technically this is only going to update one, but that's like as developers we know that and I, I'm thinking it's not the best to like make our code behave as us developers think. I don't know. I think we should just use update here because like it just makes sense. There should only be one of them. So I think our code should reflect that. So what I'm going to do is change the code from the demo project and just kind of on the fly come up with something here. Um, what we're going to do is instead of this update many, I'm going to attempt to fetch this participant from the database. Conversation participant dot find. Uh, we're going to say same thing here. We're facing this unique thing. We're going to say find many or we'll say find first. It's going to find the first one. And we're going to give this a where clause. With find first, we can use these non-unique fields. We're going to say where the user ID matches the user ID of the input, and same with the conversation ID. Okay, and then we'll add just a quick safety thing here. Even though it should always exist, we're going to say if there's no participant, throw a new GraphQL error that says participant entity not found. And we're just going to add a comment here that says should always exist, but being <laughs> safe. Okay. Now, why is this good? Because now we can use the ID from this participant entity. So if we make it past this if statement, this thing exists. So what we can do is change this. Uh, we can just get rid of that and we can say update now. And we can say where the ID is equal to participant.id. There we go. I think that's a much cleaner solution than what I have in the demo with the update menu. So hopefully this works. I don't see any issues with this, but I have said that a hundred million times before and there has been issues. So we'll see when we put this to the test. And that is it for this, um, this mutation here. I'm going to move this uh, return true up here. So if all of these things succeed, we will return true. Otherwise we will return false. Okay, so that is it. Our backend is probably throwing an error right now because our schema, yeah, so mutation mark conversation as red is defined in resolvers, but not in the schema. So we have to go to our conversation type definitions and define this in here so that it's available in our GraphQL schema. So let's go to conversation type defs. And where do we want to do this? Let's do it. It doesn't really matter, honestly. Let's just do it under this one. We'll say type mutation, um, mutation. We're going to say mark conversation as red. As we saw before, this is going to take in two inputs. There's going to be a user ID, which is going to be of type string, and it's required, so add the bang operator. Second one is going to be conversation ID, also a string, and this is going to return a Boolean. Okay, so after adding this, our server should be running successfully, which it is. So our schema is good to go, and this should now be accessible from our front end. So now what we're going to do is go to our conversation operations on our front end and define the GraphQL query string for this mutation so that we can actually execute this mutation from our React app. <clears throat> so let's jump back to conversation operations. We are now back on the front end here. And inside of Mutations just underneath create conversation. Let's create a new value here called mark conversation as red. This is going to be a GraphQL query string. We're defining a mutation here, so we can use the keyword mutation. We can name this mark conversation as red. <clears throat> we need to declare the inputs here, 
which is going to be a user ID, which is of type string, as well as a conversation ID. Okay. Inside of here, we can indicate the name of the mutation resolver function on our back end. So we can say mark conversation as read, and we want to pass in those two inputs. So the user ID is going to be dollar sign user ID. Conversation ID is going to be dollar sign conversation ID. And we don't need to specify a return type here because it's just going to return a Boolean. Cool. So now we have a way to fire off this query. So let's go back to our, did I close the file? Conversations wrapper, I believe. Yes, there's a lot of files here. I get a little bit lost sometimes. <laughs> okay, so now we can actually bring in our use mutation hook and fire this off. So at the top of our component here, where do we want to put this? Um, what I'm going to do actually is move this. I'm going to organize this a bit. I'm going to move this up here, this router stuff. So we're going to have our router stuff and then we're going to have like our Apollo stuff here. So underneath this use query thing, I'm going to bring in the use mutation hook, which is going to take in some generic types, which we will define in a sec here. Um, actually, let's just do that now. So the data that this thing is going to get back is just going to be an object with the name of the resolver in it with a Boolean. Sorry, this is not supposed to be true. This is supposed to be a Boolean. <laughs> um, and then the second generic type is going to be the type of the variables that we need to pass in. So it's going to be a username string and a conversation ID of type string. Perfect. Now inside of the use mutation hook, we need to indicate um, the query string that this belongs to. So this is going to be conversation operations dot queries dot conversations. Sorry, not conversations. And it's not query. <laughs> it is mutations dot mark conversation is read. Okay, now this use mutation hook, as we've seen before, returns to us uh, an array. And the first argument in that array is going to be the actual like JavaScript function that we can use to execute this mutation. Wow, I'm just like typing all the wrong stuff here. So this is going to be our um, mark conversation as a read function, which is what we're going to use inside of this on view conversation function to mark the conversation as read. Okay. So now all we have to do is actually call this function. So let's go back to where is that here? Okay. So underneath here, what we're going to do is create a try catch block because we're going to have some asynchronous logic here. Let's just, as usual, do our, our catch block console log. Uh, we're going to say on view conversation error. We will log the error. Inside of the try block, we just want to fire off this mutation here. And we don't really like care what the response is of this thing because we're doing optimistic rendering, which we're going to see in a second here. So we don't need to store the response in a variable. Um, whether or not this thing succeeds and returns to or false, we're going to update the cache optimistically. So we're going to say update, sorry, not update, await, <laughs> mark conversation as read. And we need to pass this a few things. The first one is going to be our variables. Okay, so we can pass this an object with all of our inputs and configuration in here. So the first one is going to be our variables. Due to TypeScript, it knows we want to pass in the user ID as well as the conversation ID. Is user ID not defined here? Um, we might have to, where's user ID? What? I thought we we're grabbing it from the session. Do we not have, oh, okay, we have the session in here. I guess we just haven't really destructured the session. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is just destructure the session up here. We are going to grab the user, and then on the user, we're going to grab the ID, and I'm gonna alias this as user ID. There we go. So now down here, we have a variable called user ID. Now, this is what uh, I was talking about before, where we're going to do some 
optimistic UI rendering here. And this is going to look very similar to the input. So remember in the input, we had this update callback function that is going to fire either when this is first executed or when the response is sent back to us from the server, depending on if we're doing optimistic rendering or not. We're going to do optimistic rendering the same way we were doing it here. So this update function is going to fire as soon as we uh, send this request to our server. Okay, I'm gonna close these files here for now, clear up some space. Okay, so we want to tell Apollo that we're doing optimistic rendering here. So we're gonna say optimistic response. And for this particular mutation, we're gonna say true. Then we're going to use our update function, which is going to give us access to our Apollo cache. And inside of here, we can make some updates to our cache. Now, there's something very slightly different between what we're going to do in here and what we're going to, or what we did in the input. In the input, we were reading a query and writing a query. In this, we are going to be reading a fragment and writing a fragment. Now, I guess the difference between a fragment and a query is that a fragment represents sort of like a piece of the cache, which is like a piece of a query. Um, the reason we're using um, write fragment here is because we're updating a piece of the conversation's query. So technically we could update the whole query. <clears throat> we could like grab the existing conversations query, find the particular conversation, update the conversation participant entity to have a has seen thing of true and then write that query. But that's kind of unnecessary and I think is more error prone. I think the better approach is to read and write a fragment and this fragment is going to be just a piece of the conversation's query and that piece is going to be the participants of that conversation. So hopefully that makes sense. Let's look at how we are going to do that. <clears throat> so I'm just going to create a comment here. That's just going to help us kind of understand what's going on. So I'm going to say get conversation participants from the cache. Now again, we're only getting the participants for this particular conversation. So we're not getting all of the uh, participants in the whole cache. So this is again, the benefits of a fragment. Um, and we can create a variable called participants fragment. And this is going to be equal to cache. And we're going to call this function called read fragment. And this is going to take in a generic type here, which we'll define in a second. <clears throat> okay, then we can pass in a generic type that is going to um, tell TypeScript what the structure of this data is. So when we read this fragment, it's going to have a structure that looks like this. It's going to have a key called participants, and this is going to map to an array of participant populated entities. Perfect. Okay, then we can call this function, and inside of here, this is where things differ a little bit between the um, updating a query or reading from a query and reading from a fragment. Uh, we need to specify the ID of this fragment, and let's go to our browser here and look at the Apollo cache, so I can show you what I mean. So the way Apollo stores all of this stuff is through these IDs, right? So if I click on like this particular one, Apollo stores each entity with like the name of the entity and then the ID of that entity. And these IDs match the, the ID of the entity in our database. So this particular conversation 62A2 is stored in the cache like this. This is how Apollo does its memory lookup. Or sorry, not a memory lookup. This is just how Apollo stores stuff and then like looks it up. It, it, it looks it up by these IDs. So this is all the stuff that's in the cache. So the ID of this particular piece of cache is this conversation colon conversation ID. So that is the ID we need to specify when we're grabbing this particular fragment from the cache. We need to tell Apollo, well, which which um, fragment are we, are we talking about here? Because if you look at this is essentially the fragment we're going to grab is participants. And I don't know if it's this exact conversation, but you can see what I mean that on one of these conversation query storages, <laughs> uh, on one of these conversation um, cache storages, we're going to only grab the participants here. And that's why we're using like the fragment. We're just grabbing a small piece 
of the entire conversations query. Okay, so the ID of this, we're going to use backtick because we're going to need to use some template literals to insert the conversation ID. We're going to say conversation colon conversation ID because that is exactly what we're seeing here. Conversation colon conversation ID. So that's the ID of this fragment that we're interested in. Okay, now we need to define another variable called fragment and this is going to be a GraphQL query string um, that represents this fragment. And we're sort of like performing a query on this uh, this particular piece of cache. I don't know if that makes sense. Hopefully it makes it more sense when we write this out. We're basically just querying our own cache using a, another GraphQL query string. So if I use GQL, <clears throat> okay. So here we're going to use GQL to make sure that imports from um, Apollo client. Sorry, I'm just, so Apollo client. Yeah, perfect, okay. And we just need to create a query string that is going to represent this query for the fragment so that Apollo knows what we're grabbing. So we can use the keyword fragment here and we're gonna call this participants and we can use this other keyword called on conversation. So we're telling Apollo we're grabbing a fragment of the conversation entity and that fragment is called participants. That's what we're calling it here. Inside of here, we can specify what fields we want to query from this uh, particular thing in the cache. And so we can, we're querying the participants, right? So we can specify participants inside of here. We, this is exactly, this is just another GraphQL query string. So it's the same syntax. We want to grab the user, which has an ID as well as a user, username. And then we want to grab the uh, has seen latest message field. Perfect. And that is it. So hopefully this all kind of makes sense. Um, it's kind of a little bit confusing. I had to, I was confused by this at first too, like the difference between a query or like a fragment and a query. And just reading the Apollo documentation on this to understand it was very helpful. Um, and they go through a bunch of examples of like what we're doing here. So yeah, just if you're kind of confused about that, chat with me on Discord or feel free to read the documentation as well. It's very helpful. Okay, so we're going to just throw a quick check here to say if there is no participants fragment, that does not match this stuff we just wrote. Let's return. We don't want to update anything because it doesn't even exist. Okay. So what do we want to do with this participants fragment now? Like if we look at this, we just expand this out and kind of look at these here. What do we want to update in our in our fragment here? Well, for this particular user that clicks on a conversation, we want to update this field to be either true or false, but we're, it's gonna be true here because we're marking it as red. So we're gonna update has seen latest message to be true on this fragment. Okay, so what we're going to do is create a participants array. And I'm going to create a copy of the participant fragments dot participants to allow mutation. Um, I think What I'm going to do, okay, so to allow us to mutate, okay, so without, okay, so I'm gonna, okay, so what I'm going to do is create an array, okay, so what I'm going to do is create a variable called participants, and this is going to be just a copy of the participant fragments participants, and this is going to allow us to create like a mutated version of it without directly mutating the fragment because that's how JavaScript works. If I said participants is equal to participants. Um, fragment dot participants, and then if I mutated participants, it's also going to mutate <clears throat> this as well. We do not want that. Um, so what we can do to stop that is just create a copy of it, so that we can um, we can do that by spreading the value of this over a new array. So now when we mutate this, it's not going to do anything to this because this is just a copy of this. <laughs> Hopefully that makes sense. Common, it's a very common thing to do in React or in JavaScript in general. Just If you don't want to mutate the original variable, uh, you need to create a copy of it by like spreading it, whether it's an object or an array or creating some clone of it. Because you can get some really weird side effects if you do not do that and it's hard to debug. Okay, so what we wanna do is like I said before, we wanna find the 
participant entity that belongs to this particular user that is marking this as red. So what we can do is do a lookup and try to find that participant entity that belongs to this user in this array. So we can say user participant. And what I'm gonna do is actually grab the index of that participant inside of this array. So I'm gonna call this user participant index and we can call our participants function or we can call a function called find index on the participant. And this is going to return to us the index of the position of this um, user's participant, depending on like the callback we give find index. So the participant we are trying to find here is going to be the one that has a user ID that is equal to the session user ID. Okay, so I think this returns a negative one if it doesn't find anything, and it returns the index if it does. So what we can do is say, if user participant index, did I spell this right? Participant index, I think so, <laughs> is equal to negative one, meaning that we did not find one that belongs to this user we can just uh, return. Okay. Um, so now we want, okay, and now we want to do, okay. And so now we can create an updated version of this user participant with the has seen latest message field being true. So we can say here, let's create a new partic user participant variable. And this is going to be our participants at that index we just found. And then we can just write a comment here that says update participant to show latest message as read. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to say participants at the user participant index is going to be a new object. Again, we're doing this like cloning copy thing behavior so we don't get this weird mutability stuff. We're gonna update the participants array at this index to have a has seen latest message value of true. So we're gonna spread the rest of the user participant and we only want to update the has seen latest message value to be true. So this represents, this object here represents the updated version of this participant. Uh, and now what we wanna do is write this to our cache, right? We grab stuff from the cache, we modified it, and now we want to insert the updated version into the cache. So let's write a comment here that says, update cache. So what we want to do is we can call a function called write fragment. And inside of here, we can pass in the same ID. So we can say conversation uh, colon conversation ID. So we're basically just putting stuff back into that fragment. The fragment is going to be another GraphQL query string. Uh, we can use the keyword fragment here. The name of this, we can call updated participants. And we can again use the on conversation syntax. And we essentially want to insert this new value of participants here, which is going to be this, uh, this here. Okay, and so, yeah, we're, so we're, and we're updating the value of participants and the value that we want to put into this participants uh, section of the cache here. So like the, the, the updated array, we can specify using the data property. And the data we want to put in there is this new participants array that contains the updated user participant. There we go. So now our cache is updated to reflect this, um, this latest data and we're doing optimistic rendering. So the, the request is gonna be fired off, our database is gonna be updated, hopefully, optimistically, we're assuming that. In the meantime, we're updating the cache to reflect that anyway. Okay, so let's see if this works and if we have any errors. So what I'm going to do is shrink this down. And I'm gonna click on this. Okay. That should have fired a request and we didn't see an error. Did it, would it have? Are we invoking this function? <laughs> if, okay, I'm gonna, okay. Let's just see if it happens. So currently on this, we have a um, purple dot. So if I click on this, theoretically, this should disappear. 
But I, before I do that, I kind of want to like go check the database for this particular conversation participant. Um, Ooh, how would I find this? So we have a user ID. I'm going to grab this user ID. And I'm going to do a query here. I'm going to say, so we're going to say user ID is this. And we're going to say conversation ID. Uh, we're going to grab from the URL here. Wait, sorry, that's the wrong one. It's this one. Oh, I have to click on it to know. <laughs> okay, you know what? Um, let's just click on it. Oh, I, I really want to know like if it's updating now. Uh, user ID, conversation ID. Okay, sorry, we can get the conversation ID from here. What am I, what am I doing? This is it here. Sorry guys, I'm, it's been a long day. Okay, so if I search this up, this is, has seen latest messages true, which is weird because there's a purple dot. If I refresh this, is that purple dot still there? User ID. Wait, that might not have been the right user ID. Was it? Was it? It was. Why is this true? And why is this? Like what? Okay, so the, the, I just clicked on it and the, the cache updates, but I'm, I'm so confused as to why. Like, I, I don't know, I just, <laughs> what is going on here? Okay, you know what I'm gonna do actually, just to make sure this all works and just simplify our lives here. I'm gonna delete the database, or not not all, not everything, but I'm gonna delete all the conversations and stuff. So I'm gonna delete conversation, delete that, delete the conversation participants. This simplifies your life a lot if you ever are testing stuff and the messages. We can keep everything else like the session, blah, 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 user stuff. Um, so let's refresh this for both of these users. And let's make Safari create a conversation with Chrome. Select create conversation. Okay, so this should show up on Chrome screen with a purple dot, right? Because it should be unread. Okay, so that's, that's correct. And it's not, there is no purple dot here, which is good, that's expected. Um, when I click on, okay, let's go to the database. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like all over the place right now. Refresh. Okay, so this one, is false. So this belongs to Chrome. I rem remember that ID for 10. Um, there's only two, so it's got to be this one. So when I click this, okay, good. So the UI updates optimistically, so our writing fragment thing works. If I refresh this database, yeah, we can see that it was updated to true. So both our writing to the, the cache optimistically and the mutation that we just defined, the resolver, are, are working. So that is good, and we can now mark conversations as red. So that's pretty cool. Um, that's a critical piece of functionality. It, it dramatically improves user experience because you know which ones you have read and which ones you have not. So that concludes the mark conversation as red flow. Unless we encounter any errors in the future, we are done with that, and we can now move on to the updating of conversations flow and the conversation updated subscription. Time to talk about updating conversations. We have alluded to this a few times, maybe only once. If we go back to our message resolvers, and you know what, actually, I'm gonna close all these um, files to clean up here a bit. Uh, let's go back to our message resolvers. If you remember when we sent a new message inside of our send message mutation, we talked about this conversation updated subscription event here, and it's currently commented out, but I said we're gonna come back here and essentially finish this. Um, so we need to create our conversation updated subscription. And what is this responsible for? Well, when we send a message, when a user sends a message to a conversation, we're updating uh, the latest message in that conversation. We're updating the latest message ID. Um, now, in order to have that behavior where the latest message text appears in the conversation item, we need to have some sort of way of retrieving that update from our server. And that is what this uh, subscription is going to be responsible for. 
So what we're going to do is define the subscription um, inside of our subscription section here. And then we will go back to our front end and actually write the logic of what needs to happen when that subscription is received from our front end. Our front end. I was trying to say front end and client at the same time. Our front end. <laughs> um, okay, so what we want to do here is basically define the subscription. So what we can do is, hmm, let's go to our type defs first. I feel like it makes sense to start with the type defs because that's sort of like the the root. So let's go to messages, sorry, not messages. We're going to conversation type defs here. Okay, um, I'm just gonna pull it up in a second here. Okay, so let's define this new subscription. Uh, let's do it down here beneath our conversation created a subscription. So we'll say type sub subscription and this is going to be called conversation updated and for okay and so for the return type of this we are going to create a new type um, in our GraphQL or our, in our type S here that is going to be the structure of this return type here and I'll explain why in a second I actually think I explained this before but basically if we want to return like an object with like multiple things inside of it um, we cannot do that like this we can't say like name string, uh, username, whatever. Like it, it, you can't declare this object return type. It will throw a syntax error. If you want to return some sort of data structure that is an object, you have to create a custom type for it. That's kind of what we've been doing with these types here, like this response, yeah. Um, so we're going to create a new type for the return type of our conversation updated subscription, or I guess the payload of the subscription. So we're gonna come We'll do it underneath the create conversation response. We're gonna create a new type here called conversation updated subscription payload. Now inside of here, we're going to have a conversation and this is going to be of type conversation. And there's some other functionality um, of this application, like editing a conversation and stuff. There would be some additional information in here as well, but for now we're just going to have a conversation. So the return type of the subscription is going to be a conversation updated subscription payload, kind of a, a mouthful there, but sometimes you just gotta declare a long variable name because it's necessary. Cool, so our type defs are done. So let's come over to our, back to our resolvers. I'm sorry, we're gonna be in our conversation resolvers. I was gonna confuse because we're emitting that event in our, uh, in our message resolvers, but we can, define the subscription in our conversation resolvers because it is a subscription <laughs> it's a conversation related subscription okay so let's create this uh, subscription here this resolver so conversation updated and this is going to be very similar to the one up here in the sense of using this with filter function we only want to emit this event to clients who are actually part of this conversation who are like a participant in this conversation. Um, so I thought, okay, I think we created a function called user is participant. User is part, or in, maybe in functions, I'm pretty sure we did. Yeah, user is conversation participant. Um, so what I'm gonna do here, because we created that utility function actually after creating conversation, or after creating the conversation created subscription, um, and I'm going to replace this here with that function. So I'm gonna say const um, user is participant. Participant is actually gonna be equal to our function. We're gonna bring in the utility function here. And we're gonna pass in our participants. And I think it is a user ID that it takes in. Um, we can go this from the session. Session.user.id. So we can save that. Okay, at this point here, um, conversation created. Okay, we actually, okay, to prevent this type script error, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be able to hit this subscription if we're not authenticated. So I'm gonna put in our classic, like, if no user uh, protection if statement here. And then we don't have to use optional chaining here and it'll match the types of this user as conversation participant. So we can say, that, that got rid of our TypeScript error down here and we actually don't need optional chaining. So we can just say session.user, whoops, session 
dot user dot id. There we go. TypeScript is happy now. And then, um, whoops, there's a typo here. User is participant. And we can just remove this old one. Cool. There we go. All right, let's go back to this conversation updated function. So we're going to have our with filter function. Again, as a reminder, the with filter function returns a Boolean and that Boolean is going to be true or false. And that represents whether or not we should emit this subscription event to the connected client. And we only want to emit this event to a connected client if they are a participant in this conversation that was updated. Okay, so we're gonna define a subscribe function here and this is going to be equal to the um, with filter function. And this is going to take two callback functions. The first one, I'm just going to paste in here. It looks like this. And the second one, I'm just gonna declare as empty for now so we can get these syntax fixed here. Cool, so this first function essentially uh, the callback allows us to call this async iterator function on PubSub so that we are listening to that event here so that when it's emitted from anywhere else in our backend application, um, we're going to pick it up inside of this particular subscription. Okay, now this second callback function is where we're actually going to receive the payload of our uh, subscription. So it's going to be that updated conversation because we define the payload Where's the commented out thing? What the heck, I was just looking at it. <laughs> uh, what? Oh, sorry, in messages, geez. Um, the payload is going to be this. It's going to be an object with the name of the subscription and then the actual updated conversation entity on it. Um, so we can define an interface for that. And in the demo project, I'm just looking at where, okay, so if we go to our types in our backend here, we want to go to our conversation section. We can create an interface called conversation updated subscription data. And this is going to be an object with the mutation, or sorry, not mutation, the resolver name on it, conversation updated. And inside of here, we are going to have a conversation and it's going to be of type conversation populated. Cool back in here. This second callback function to our with filter function is going to receive the payload as the first argument. So payload, this is going to be of type that thing we just created. Whoops, sorry, not conversation created. It's going to be conversation updated subscription data. And should it be data or payload? I don't know why. I have it named data in the demo, but payload for, um, why do I have that? I'm gonna change this actually to payload to match the work we've done already, because it makes more sense too, because it actually is a payload that we're talking about, not data, payload. Okay, second one we are not going to need, so I'm just going to declare it as an underscore, type any. And the third one is going to be our GraphQL context. GraphQL context. The with filter function requires us to return a Boolean that represents, again, whether or not we should emit this. So I'm just gonna return true to get rid of all those TypeScript errors. But we need to write some logic in here to figure out if we actually should emit this event. So inside of here, um, what we can do is grab the session off of the context, and I'm gonna actually do this as well. So I'm just gonna copy this because we wanna do this session check. If there is no user, throw a not authorized error. This should never happen because in order for this subscription to even be called, we have to be authenticated by some other resolver. So um, doesn't shouldn't ever happen, but again, for TypeScript purposes, so we don't have to use optional chaining below here, we are safe to add this. All right, <clears throat> what we wanna do is basically here, we just wanna check, is this user that is currently signed in from the session, um, are they a participant of this conversation? That's all we need to do. And we can use our user is conversation participant utility function to do that. So this is the beauty of utility functions. You don't have to rewrite a bunch of logic because we're using this logic a lot. So we are going to need the participants from this particular conversation, as well as the user ID from the session. 
So let's grab that off of the user. So we can grab ID and alias it to user ID. Okay, and we want to grab the participants off of this payload. Whoops. So those are, these are the two things that our function is going to need to take in. So inside of here, we're going to have a conversation updated key that maps to uh, some data. And inside of that data, there is a conversation. So we can destructure that. <clears throat> okay. Um, now what we can simply do is just call that function. Const user is participant. User is conversation participant. Pass in. <clears throat> Jeez. Sorry. We actually need to do a little bit more destructuring here. We need the participants off of this participants. This is, I, I actually prefer destructuring. You don't have to destructure. You could do something like um, payload dot conversation updated dot conversation dot participants. That's a little bit like less readable in my opinion. So I like destructuring. Um, that's just my opinion though. Do whatever you desire. Participants. And the second one is make the user ID. Cool. So now we have a way to know if this user is part of this conversation. If they are, we want to return true. If they are not, we want to return false. So what we can do is just simply say return user is participant because this returns a Boolean of that exact logic. Perfect. Okay. <clears throat> so we have some sort of types here in this file. Oh yeah, that's a name change. We can get rid of this data. Okay. So now we have a defined subscription. Um, what I want to do is throw a console log in here just to make sure this is firing. Here is payload and we're going to log the payload. We're going to make sure this subscription actually fires before we go to our front end. Um, <clears throat> okay. And then in messages, in our send message mutation, we can uncomment this. This is going to emit that event with this payload here. Let's split screen this. This payload is going to be received, or I guess this is the payload here, the full payload, is going to be received or should be received here. So let's see if that works. So what all we need to do is basically send a message in a conversation and see if we're seeing this fire. Um, is our server running? It is running, so our schema should be fine. So let's go ahead and give this a go. I'm going to refresh this page here. I'm going to send a message to Safari. Hey, Safari buddy. Okay. So no errors. And we go to our server, but I'm not seeing that log here. Okay. So I'm wondering actually if we first have to um, define the subscription on our client for it to like register. I... I think I did that actually in the demo. I was querying, right? I like fired the subscription using the use subscription hook from the client and then it was able to be used. So perhaps that's what we had to do. Um, and that's what I'm missing here. So let's go try to do that. So what we're going to need to do is go to our conversation operations on our front end and define that under conversation created subscription. Let's create our conversation updated GraphQL query string. So this is a subscription and we can call it conversation updated inside of here. We can indicate the exact name of the resolver, which is conversation updated. And what are we querying for when we fire the subscription? Well, we're querying for a conversation and the data that we, we want on the conversation is going to be conversation fields. Whoops. This is a populated conversation. Now we have a query string, so we can actually go to our conversations wrapper and bring in the use subscription hook and execute the subscription and see if we're getting any data. Let's go to our wrapper um, at the top here. Let's define this subscription. So we don't need anything returned to us from the use subscription hook. So we can just simply say use subscription and pass in a GraphQL query string document. And then there's a callback function that's going to be made available to us on this hook or inside of this hook called on data. And um, that's very similar to what we saw um, in our messages component. 
with the like update query. This essentially fired when the subscription fired. Um, but this was subscribing to updates for a particular query. Here we're not really subscribing to updates in a query. We're just we have this like own standalone subscription that's listening to any particular conversation being updated. So that's why we're not using the subscribe to more function. Um, and inside of here we're going to have a function that's similar um, to the update query function. It's a, going to be a callback called on data that is going to fire every time the subscription receives data. Okay, so we're going to define an interface in our front end. So let's go to our front end types. And it is going to be for our conversation updated subscription. So down here, we can create an interface called export. Sorry, we can export an interface. Whoops. Export interface. And we can say conversation updated data. This is going to be very similar to what we've seen. It's not going to match all the other structures. So it's going to have an object with conversation updated key on it. The value of this is going to be an object with the data on it. Um, and the value of conversation is going to be a populated conversation. Now I have something weird in declaring this type in my demo. And I was probably, I'm going to guess it's because I was seeing some weird issue with the subscription. I've defined this as, um, as the following. I actually use the omit, uh, what, what is this called? TypeScript. There's like a name for these categories of things. <laughs> uh, TypeScript. I think they're just called like TypeScript util functions. TypeScript utility types. Yeah, it's a utility type. Yeah, so TypeScript has a bunch of uh, utility types like partial. These are all of them here. Partial, required, um, and omit is one of them. What the omit utility uh, type does is you, it essentially allows you to pass in a type like conversation populated, and you can specify like what field you want to omit from this type, and that would be like so. And then it would return a new type. So, for example. Um, here in the demo, I'm saying I want to admit the latest message from conversation populated, but then I also like redeclare it by saying latest message is a message populated, which is sort of like the negative of omitting it. So I must have came across some weird error that caused me to do this. I can't remember why. So what I'm going to do for now is I'm just going to comment this out and I'm just going to declare it sort of like regularly as I would expect it to be. And if you run into issues, then we'll bring that thing back in. It might be something to do with like the type name field in GraphQL. And like if the types don't perfectly match. So, yeah, I don't know. The type name field in GraphQL, I don't fully understand. It's basically like how Apollo and GraphQL like identify the entities and uh, that are moving across the server. And sometimes if it's not there, um, it's not, the data is not transmitted properly. And this is, may have been why I did this, um, but we will see. Time will tell. So back in our conversations wrapper, we want to use this type as a generic to indicate the data we're expecting back. So we can say conversation updated data. Um, the, this doesn't take any variable inputs, so we can just declare null for the input type. The first argument to the use subscription hook is going to be that um, conversation updated GraphQL query stream. So we can say conversation operations dot subscriptions dot conversation updated. Okay. And inside of this second object here is where we can configure this subscription and like what we want to do when certain things happen. We get a bunch of callback functions. And the one I'm talking about is on data. And that's the one that's going to fire every time the subscription receives data from the server. So this is going to be a callback. And inside of here, we are going to receive some stuff. <laughs> We're going to receive the um, Apollo client instance. And this is going to basically allow us to, again, access the cache. It's very similar to the cache instance. We can say client and then also the data. And this is going to be the subscription data. And due to TypeScript, this generic we typed in or passed in, we know like what is on this type here. 
So I'm going to destructure this data. I'm going to say const is equal to data. On Inside of the data, there's going to be another data object. Um, and actually, what we're going to do, I'm going to say if, hmm, one sec. Okay. So what I'm going to do is destructure the data off of the data. There's kind of like a nested data thing. Uh, so we're going to say data. I'm going to alias this as subscription data. And we're going to say if no subscription data, we're just going to return. And this is going to allow us to be type safe uh, below this if statement and sub safely access this data. Subscription data dot conversation dot. Yeah, so we can access the data and all the all the entities and on it. Okay, so let's throw a console log here on data firing, and we will put in the subscription data to see if we can get this to fire. Okay, so now if I refresh this. We're inside conversations wrapper, so the, the subscription should register. Okay, yeah, so there's that log here, registering update sub. <laughs> so the subscription's actually like being registered, which is good. That means our types line up, because sometimes if they don't, you will not see this. It won't actually fire the subscription. So we've established a connection, or I guess like a yeah, socket connection from our client to our server for this particular subscription. Um, so let's see if we can actually get it to fire now. I'm gonna send a message, I'm gonna put the console here, and I'm gonna send, yo dude. Cool, okay, so it actually did work. So yeah, I was correct before when I said we had to actually like fire the subscription from our, our client first in order for it to be like registered, and um, and now it's firing. So that here is payload log that I had inside of the uh, conversation updated subscription, this here. It's actually firing now, which is cool. And actually, we got the update in the browser as well on data firing, right? We just this is in our browser here inside of the on data function. Whoops, this is the wrong file here on data firing, and we're seeing this conversation updated entity come in. And the whole point of doing this is that we now have this latest message field in real time. It's being sent to us. Ready, yo, dude. So I send another one that says this is the latest. on data firing, we're getting that subscription. And the latest message is, here is the latest, or this is the latest. If Safari sends a message to Chrome, we should also see that. And this is how Chrome is going to receive the latest message updates. Nobody, this <laughs> is the latest, Kdist. Cool. So you can see that we got that on data firing. Okay, so we can send another message. Lol, 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 lol. Cool. Our widths are being a little weird there. Might have to take a look at that. But you can see that um, the subscription's working. We're receiving the updated conversation in real time. And it actually updates our latest message. Uh, text here in the conversation item, and it marked the conversation as unread. That's that's not the best experience. Like if you're already looking at the conversation, <laughs> and a message comes in, it should not mark it as, or it should not show you that it is unread. It should just like automatically mark it as read. Uh, you shouldn't have to like click on it. So let's take Firefox and let's. Mm. Okay, so let's take Firefox. And let's do, uh, let's create, have them create a conversation with Chrome. Okay. So if I say, hey, Chrome. So let's see. So this, yeah, it's marked as unread, which is good. Um, let's see if that text appears. Hey, Chrome. Yeah, it does. So now in real time, I get that update. That is super cool because now I, I'm like looking, I'm chatting with Safari here. I'm like, oh, blah, blah, me and Safari are talking about really cool, interesting things like la, 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 and Chrome messaged me and I can see what he said and it's unread. If I click on it, it's marked as red. So as I just mentioned like a few seconds ago, um, we 
want to have the behavior of like, hmm, how do I explain this? I don't want, if I'm chatting with Firefox, like I have the Firefox conversation open and Firefox sends me a message, dude, it's coming through as unread, which is good. That makes sense. Our logic is working, <clears throat> but we want to add some logic to re or not remarket. We want to add some logic to immediately mark it as read if I am looking at this conversation already. Um, so how do we do that? Well, inside of this on data function, we can write any logic we want of anything we want to do when the subscription receives data. Okay, well, let's think about this. I'm Chrome talking with Firefox and my conversation is updated, right? I receive this event conversation updated and it has this latest message um, on it and it has a participant as well on it, the updated participant. And for me, it's false, right? Because that's true. That's what the logic does on the back end, And that's why the purple dot is appearing. Um, so what I want to do is if I'm looking at this, I just want to immediately fire the mark conversation as red mutation um, to mark it as red. So let's come down here, or we, not down here, sorry, <laughs> inside of the on data function, we just want to say like, write some logic to say, am I already looking at this conversation? Like, am I, am I currently looking at it? If I am, let's immediately call that on view conversation. Okay, so let's do that. So we can we can say here if the well, hmm, let's let's grab some data off of off of this first to make it a bit more clear. Subscription data. Let's destructure conversation updated and let's grab the conversation as well as the participants. I'm actually not sure if we need the participants. Okay. Okay. So save that. Um, this is erroring out because we have a syntax error here. But let's create a variable called already viewing, or not already viewing, I guess like currently viewing conversation. And this is going to be a boolean. Okay, I'm going to close this. Sorry. <laughs> this is going to be a boolean that is the result of, uh, does this ID of the conversation entity that's coming into the subscription match the query parameter in the URL? That means that we're already viewing the updated conversation. So what I'm actually going to do is destructure Okay. Okay. So we can say, okay, and I'm going to alias this actually as updated conversation to make this a bit more clear. So we can say, does the updated conversations ID equal the conversation ID that's being passed in as a prop? And that is coming from the URL, right? So it's like, oh, are we already viewing this conversation? If we are, so if I say, if so, yeah, so if we are we want to immediately fire this on view conversation. We're going to mark it as red immediately. So we're going to say if currently viewing conversation, let's do on view conversation. And this function, we need to pass in the conversation ID. And we're going to pass in a value of false. Okay, so what's happening here is we're going to call this. It's immediately it's here. So this is convenient. So we're passing in false. Um, so we're going to make it past this if statement and then we're immediately going to fire the mark conversation as a red mutation. It's going to optimistically update. So our UI is immediately going to be updated. Um, and then it's going to send that request to our server and then the entity in the database is going to be updated. So let's see if this works. So if I click on this, it's marked as red. Um, let's actually refresh. I just like to refresh actually some hot reloading weirdness going on lately. So yeah, okay, let's see if this works. So this is a conversation with Firefox. And this is Firefox over here. If I send Chrome a message, there should be no purple dot that appears because there's like, it's just going to immediately mark it as red. So hey, dude. Cool. So it's so it works, right? So there's no more purple dot there. But if I'm in Safari, and Chrome, sorry, Firefox sends Chrome a message. Dude, what's up? These messages are so, so stupid. <laughs> um, 
it's going to appear and the purple dot's going to appear. And that's exactly the behavior we want. That is really cool. I think that's like amazing. Um, so now I want to explain something about how like the cache is being updated here because it's actually really interesting. So in the conversations wrapper, particularly in the conversation updated, when this subscription receives data, Apollo knows the IDs of like every entity in this subscription data, right? So like this conversation has an ID uh, that Apollo is aware about. It, this latest message has an ID. The participants have IDs and Apollo sees that data come in from the subscription and it's like, oh, I am aware of these IDs. I have them in my cache. This looks familiar, right? Like this, this conversation ID looks familiar. Go to the cache. It has like an ID that Apollo is aware about. And then it's like, it looks at the, it basically compares the structure of the data that's coming in to the cache. And if there's a difference, it's going to update the cache. And it can update basically all these participants due to these IDs. So this, the Apollo cache is like incredibly powerful. It's insane. Like there's a lot of stuff that it does under the hood that we just like take for granted. And it's just really cool and allows us to do like really powerful things um, with low effort. And it does that all through IDs and it's like really cool built in caching system. All right, so this is going to conclude our conversation updated subscription. Um, I've actually decided not to go over the editing of conversations in this tutorial. And I'm still going to build the deleting of conversations because I want you to be able to actually like delete the conversations. But editing conversations, uh, we're not going to cover in this tutorial. The reason is, it's just for the sake of time. Editing conversations is like a very like, there's a lot of code in doing that. And it's like a complex feature. Um, and it just takes a lot of time and I'm pretty strapped for time right now, to be honest. Um, work is really busy. I have a bunch of YouTube projects on the go and I've also picked up a side, um, like a, some freelancing work. So I'm quite busy. So I'm not going to be able to cover the editing of conversations functionality. However, the code is going to be available in my demo project, which I will link below. Um, there's going to be two repositories for iMessage. There's going to be the one we're building together. And then there's the one of like the one I built on my own that I am um, using for this tutorial. So I will link the one of the completed demo so that you can, if you're interested, build the editing conversation functionality. Um, the reason I'm mentioning that now is because this conversation updated subscription would also be part of that flow because we were, when you're leaving a conversation or when you remove someone from a conversation, you're essentially updating the conversation's participants. So it, so this can be reused for that purpose. Um, so a lot more logic would go in this callback function here for building that functionality. And it's just like a lot um, and it would take a long time. Okay, so that is that. We can get rid of this console log. Um, let's get rid of the logs on the back end. Here is payload. And let's get rid of this registering update sub. Okay. So now we're going to move into deleting conversations. Okay. Now, one thing I just noticed that we forgot to add here is sorting these conversations by the updated at date, right? We want to display the most recently updated conversations at the top of this list. It's actually very, very simple to do that. We just simply need to go to where we are rendering conversations. I'm just gonna close these uh, files here. So we query for conversations here, conversations data, and that's what we're passing to our conversations list. So all we need to do is essentially just sort that data. Um, and we're going to do that inside of the conversations list component. So let's come into here. And let's create a new variable called sorted conversations. And all we're going to do here is create a copy of the conversations data that is passed in and then sort that copy by the created at date. We're going to say conversations dot sort and the JavaScript sort function that we want to uh, pass in here. is going to be a callback and we essentially want to sort by the updated at value in, in all of these conversations. 
So we can say if b dot updated at dot value of, and we want to basically subtract the a value. So we're going to say like we're, we're sorting by we're, we're putting these in an updated at date that has the most recently updated the uh, the latest updated at date at the top of the array. Uh, so we're basically comparing these two values here. Then instead of conversations in this map here, we're going to use conversations uh, sorted, or sorry, sorted conversations. So if I save this, um, what we can do is, how would I test this out? Okay, so if it, this is Chrome over here, and this is Firefox, um, I'm just gonna refresh to make sure all this works. If Chrome messages Firefox, this should bump up to the top of Firefox's list. Yo, dude. Okay, and it, hang on, sorry. Wait, what is happening here? Oh, this is the wrong conversation. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I was so confused. Um, I want to message Firefox privately. This is the group chat. <laughs> okay, let's go to dude what's up, this one here. Um, same thing, this should bump to the top and be marked as unread. Will this go to the top? And yeah, it does. Because we are sorting them by updated at date. So that improves the user experience and it just makes sense from a application logic point of view. All right, now we can move on to the deleting of conversations. Uh, way back, I we added this double click thing or, yeah, sorry, not double click, like a, a right click. That's what I meant. I, I said double because on the Mac trackpad you use two fingers. I don't know what happened with the styling here. This must have to do with like a chakra update. I don't think I would have left it like this before I left, but who knows? So first let's fix the styling and then we're going to um, do this delete functionality with these conversations here. So uh, let's, where is this? This is going to be in a conversation item going to, okay, yeah, we, this is where we did that double click thing and how we're accessing the context menu. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're not going to be doing the uh, leaving functionality, which is going to be editing conversations. We're only going to do the delete functionality. Um, so what is the logic we're doing here? We're saying if participants, okay, so I'm gonna slightly rearrange this. Actually, what, okay, I'm gonna copy this. And then I'm going to comment this out just in case for those of you want to um, build this functionality, I will leave it here so you can see it. So we're always going to display the conversation or I guess delete functionality. Uh, again, don't know what's happening with the styling here. There's like this weird blue background. Um, I don't know why. What is this color? Menu list background. Menu item. Maybe they change like the default background or something. Um, let's try doing this. BG is equal to black. Okay, yeah, that's the one we want to tap into here. Um, okay, so what should we make this? So we have the, the, the hover state looks, hang on, is the hover state correct? The hover state is correct. It's just the normal color. So the background of our menu is this 2D, 2D, 2D thing. Uh, let's try making it the same as that. There we go. Why is edit blue? Why do I have a separate? Oh, oh yeah, okay, sorry. There was this ternary operator here to show for deleting or leaving. Um, editing would open up the modal and essentially allow you to add or remove users from a conversation. That's why there's, there's two separate things. Um, so I'm gonna add this as well to this one. Menu item. What? I thought I copied that. It's been a long day. <laughs> this is a giant build, honestly. Um, I totally underestimated how big this build is. Okay, so the the styling is correct now. Wait, no, it's not. We have to have oh, we have to have hover styling. Um, I'm so confused. What? Like, what? How? How did this happen? Conversation item. Conversation item. What is the hover state? I don't have any hover styling on the demo. This is, must be a chakra thing. 
Um, okay, I guess we have to have, add hover state to both of these, which is kind of annoying, but whatever. Hover, we're going to make the background, I'm going to guess here, and just say white alpha 300, and we'll have to adjust accordingly. That's not bad, actually. Let's try 300, make it a little... Actually, 500, we want to go darker. Is that darker or lighter? Maybe it's the opposite for white. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, white alpha 300. That looks, that looks pretty good. All right, let's add this to this one down here. And I'm just going to actually move this up above this giant comment so that... There we go. Okay. So this is the functionality uh, we're not going to be building or going over in the in the build on edit conversation, on leave conversation, and on... on actually, we're going to be building on delete. That's the function we're going to bring in right here. Okay, so um, let's build out this on delete conversation function. Okay, so to delete a conversation, we're going to need two things uh, to add to our GraphQL schema. <clears throat> we're going to need to add a mutation called delete conversation. That's like an action function. And then we're going to create a subscription called conversation deleted. And this is essentially just going to allow other users in the conversation to receive some sort of event in real time if the conversation is deleted so that we can remove it from their browser as well um, if they are a participant in that conversation. Okay, so let's start off with the on, <clears throat> excuse me, the on delete conversation functionality or the function. Uh, and let's start off on our back end as usual. So let's go to our type devs and let's define the type definition for this. So we're going to define that where do we want to do that? We have a mutation. Let's do it in the mutation section, I guess, here. So we'll say type uh, mutation. It's going to be delete conversation. This is going to take in a conversation ID of type string. This will be required, and it will return a Boolean of whether or not this was successful. Okay, now let's go to our resolvers. Um, and inside of cool, sorry, mutations, we want to define a new resolver function called delete conversation. <clears throat> it's going to be an asynchronous function. Async function. Uh, we're not going to have a name. It's going to be unnamed, but it is going to take in some params here, and it's going to be our three usual parameters. Okay, so we're gonna have our parent, our arguments, and our context, just like this. So yeah, we're only taking in one argument here, the conversation ID, so we know which one we're actually deleting. Um, and yeah, this mutation is pretty straightforward. What I'm gonna to get to show you here that's pretty cool though, is called a database transaction. And I'm going to explain that what a transaction is, um, and why we're using one here. <clears throat> but first, let's do our usual uh, boilerplate stuff that we typically do in our resolvers. So this is going to return a promise with a Boolean inside of it. Uh, let's return true for now, just to make that thing go away, the error. And let's destructure all of our <clears throat> context properties. Sorry, this <clears throat> frog in my throat is really annoying today. Or now, the more I talk, the worse it gets. It gets. <laughs> um, <clears throat> geez. Okay. So on our context, we want to grab the session, Prisma, and our PubSub instance because we're going to need to emit a subscription or sorry, a conversation deleted event once we define that in a little bit here, and then we can grab our conversation ID off of our arguments. So we can add our usual check if no session dot user. Let's throw a new GraphQL error, not authorized. You should only be able to delete conversations if you are logged in. Then we can create a try catch block and this is where the core of our logic is going to go. So let's do our classic catch block stuff. <laughs> Um, delete conversation error, log the error. Um, and then we want to throw a new GraphQL error that is going to say, uh, failed to delete 
conversation. Cool. Okay, now what is going to happen inside of this try block? Now, when we delete a conversation, we don't want to just delete the conversation entity in the database. We also want to delete the conversation participants for that conversation. So we have two types of entities we're deleting here. Um, and I'm going to show you how, or and also actually there's a third one, sorry. We're, at, we're also going to be, be deleting all of the messages in that conversation. Now, technically we could leave them there, but that's just like not good. Uh, that's not scalable to leave like stay all dead uh, orphaned messages in the database. So we definitely want to delete all the entities related to this uh, conversation that's being deleted. Okay, now let's talk about a database transaction. So, well, first let's talk about how we could do this. We could write three separate queries. We could write, okay, I'm gonna delete the conversation, and then when that's done, I'm going to delete the conversation participants, and then when that's done, I'm going to delete the messages. Um, and that's fine. The problem with that is, what if one of those things fails? Like, what if you delete the conversation, but then it fails to delete the conversation participants or the messages? Well, then you just have this, again, orphaned data that was not successfully ugh, successfully deleted, um, even though the conversation was. And any one of those three things could fail. Like the conversation could be deleted, the participants could be deleted, but then the messages might fail to be deleted for some reason. And then you have the same problem. This is what a transaction solves. A database transaction represents multiple operations you're doing on your database. And what's going to happen is it, re or it sort of represents an all or nothing transaction. So I can pass it multiple, so I can pass it multiple, so I can pass it as many database um, operations as I want. And it's only going to succeed if all of them succeed. So we can create an array of database transactions that we want to do, sorry, database operations that we want to do, like deleting the conversation, deleting the messages and deleting the participants. We can create a transaction and Prisma will only, and Prisma, and if we create a Prisma transaction, only all of these things will succeed or none of them will. So if one of them fails to uh, succeed, <laughs> if one of them fails, then all of them will fail. And that is the beauty of transaction. It keeps your data in a very proper state and you don't have this like orphan problem. And there, yeah, so when you're deleting related entities, transactions, are very useful and actually they're just useful when you want to do multiple things um, and you only want this all or not and you want this all or nothing behavior. So that is what we can do with transactions. So how do we do that? I'm gonna create a comment here that says, um, whoops, delete conversation and all related entities. <clears throat> so the the way we're going to do that is we're going to call our Prisma client still, but we are going to call this transaction function. The transaction function is going to take in an array of these commands here, and you can see the documentation kind of popped up on VS Code with this example of doing three create writes here. And um, there are other, there are, <laughs> they are either going to all succeed or fail as a whole, exactly what this documentation says. And so that's very useful here. So we can essentially just pass in three different Prisma commands and it will give us this behavior. So the first thing we want to do is delete the conversation. So we can say prisma.conversation.delete and this is going to be where the ID matches the conversation ID of the argument. So we are deleting that particular conversation. And we're also going to add the include statement here for conversation populated. And the reason for that is because this Prisma transaction is going to give us back the deleted conversation and we still want to include those entities so that we can pass them to our client um, on the conversation deleted subscription event. Okay, the second Prisma operation we wanna do is we want to delete all the conversation participants. So we can say participant dot delete many and we want to delete all of the conversation participants that have a conversation ID that matches that of the 
inputted conversation ID. The third one is going to be the messages. So we can say prisma.message.delete many, same thing. We want to delete all the messages where the conversation ID matches the conversation ID that is passed in. So we're deleting all these conversations messages. Cool. And that is it. So now, again, we're getting this cool. Awesome. So these will either all succeed or none of them will succeed. And it's going to return to us the deleted conversation entity. And this is what we're going to publish to our conversation deleted subscription, which we have not yet defined. Um, so let's just do that and we'll comment it out like kind of we did before. So we're going to publish an event and that event is going to have a name conversation deleted and the payload is going to look like this. It's going to be an object with the conversation deleted key on it and this is going to map to the deleted conversation. Cool. And I guess while we're here, let's just define that subscription um, while we're on the back end here. Okay. <clears throat> so let's go back to our type defs and let's define that subscription. So we're going to say type subscription and this is going to be called conversation deleted. Okay. And so this subscription is going to pass the ID of the deleted conversation to our client. So we're going to need to create a return type for that. <clears throat> so let's create, and we'll come up here to our, our types and we'll create a new one called conversation deleted payload. Actually, we're gonna add conversation deleted subscription payload. And this is just going to be an ID of type string. Perfect. Okay, and this is going to be used here. So we're gonna say conversation deleted subscription payload. Again, another kind of long name. <laughs> um, okay, let's come back to our resolvers here. And now we can define the actual resolver function. So underneath conversation updated, let's define conversation deleted. This is again going to use the with filter function because we only want to emit this event to participants of this conversation. So what is that going to look like? We can define a subscribe function, basically exactly what we're doing up here. And this is going to be with filter, which is going to take in two uh, callback functions. We're only going to need our context in the first one. So what I will do is I'm just going to paste in the first callback as the first argument. And then I'm just going to define an empty one here. Okay. So we just need the context. So we grab our pub sub off context so that we can tell um, our pub sub instance that this is the subscription we want to call or this is the resolver we want to call when this conversation deleted event is emitted. Okay, now the second one is going to be the actual resolver function. And this is going to have a payload, which is going to have another interface, which we're going to need to define called conversation deleted payload. And actually, I think I have an issue with the types here. Um, because in my demo, I'm saying that we're returning a conversation populated, but we're actually not. Because in the resolver, we are, or in our type test, I guess we declared we're only returning the ID of the conversation. I'm just going to quickly look at the operations. Uh, yeah, I'm only querying for the ID from the front end. So I had an issue, I guess I had an error. So the payload of this. Actually, hmm. okay. <clears throat> okay, so the payload of this is going to kind of look very similar to our uh, conversation updated subscription payload. It's just going to have a different name here. So what I'm going to do is just paste this down here and change this to conversation uh, deleted. And then this is going to be conversation 
deleted. Uh, the reason, <clears throat> I'll, I'll explain the reason why this, <clears throat> I will explain the reason why we need the whole conversation inside of our subscription resolver in just a second here. Um, I just want to confirm. Okay, so let's define a new interface called conversation deleted subscription payload. This is going to have the resolver name on it, conversation deleted. And the value is going to be a populated conversation because if we go back to our resolvers here, um, when we did the deleted conversation operation, we wanted to include the populated conversation because we're going to need the participants inside of this resolver here to determine uh, the to determine if this user is a participant so that we can uh, return a Boolean to the width filter so that we know if we should emit this event to this particular client. Okay, so now we have an interface for this. We can say conversation deleted subscription payload. The second argument we are not going to need, so I'm just going to declare it as an underscore of type any, and the third one is going to be our context. GraphQL context. Okay. Let's now return true temporarily to make TypeScript happy. And let's destructure the context, sorry, the session from our context. We're going to add our classic check if there is no user. We want to throw an error. This should never happen, but I guess better be safe than sorry. <laughs> um, okay, and then we want to grab the ID from the session user. So we can say ID and alias this as user ID. And then we want to destructure the participants from the payload so that we can grab, so that we can pass those participants to our user is conversation participant function. So we can say uh, const is equal to payload and we want to destructure conversation deleted. And inside the conversation, we just want the participants. Then down here, we just want to create a new variable called user is conversation participant or user is participant, it doesn't really matter. And this is going to be equal to user is conversation participant, pass in the participants as well as the user ID. And then we can just return user is participant. Cool. And to simplify this, you could actually just say, return this, you don't actually need to create a new variable. Uh, totally up to you. I personally like this. So I'm going to leave it as that. And in fact, let's go up here and do that as well. Return this. Can delete that. There we go. Okay. So now this event is only going, or subscription, I guess, is only going to be emitted to uh, the conversation participants. Okay, so we have declared the type defs for the conversation deleted subscription, as well as the delete conversation mutation. Um, our server should be running successfully if there are no errors, which it is, so our schema is probably fine. The resolvers, for uh, the subscription as well as the delete conversation mutation have been defined. So now we can go to our front end, define the query string in our operations, and then call the delete conversation function from our conversation item um, menu item in this on delete conversation function. So that is where we're going. So let's go to our conversation operations. And as a third subscription, Let's define conversation deleted, which will be a GQL query string. And it's going to be a subscription. We are going to name conversation deleted. <clears throat> Let's indicate the name of the subscription resolver function, conversation deleted. This does not take in any input. And we are just simply querying for the ID of that conversation because that is going to be the that's what the subscription is uh, returning to us. 
Where did we specify that? I know we did somewhere. <laughs> Conversation deleted. Um, oh yeah, in, in the type as well. Yeah, just, just below here. Conversation deleted. Subscription payload, we're just simply returning the ID of the deleted entity. Cool, okay, so server is still running, fine. So let's go to our React app now and actually fire this off. So we're gonna go to our conversation list component and this is where we're going to define this function, um, the on delete conversation function. So let's do that here. We'll say const on delete conversation. This is going to be an asynchronous function that is going to take in the conversation ID that we are deleting. And inside of here, we're going to create a try catch block. And all we need to do is basically just fire off that mutation that we just created uh, a few minutes ago. Um, in order to actually call that mutation, we're going to need to bring in the use mutation hook. So let's do that at the top here. We can say const use mutation. So we need to bring in our conversation operations here. So we can say import conversation operations from how far do we have to go up? Three directories, <laughs> operations, conversation. Sorry, we defined the subscription, but we did not define the query string for the mutation. So that is what we're missing here. <clears throat> so um, let's do it between these two because it sort of represents like a CRUD operation, I guess. <clears throat> so we can say delete conversation, GQL. Um, inside of here, we are declaring a new mutation that we're going to call delete conversation. This is going to take in just a single ID. Um, this is going to be a conversation ID. So conversation ID of type string, sorry. Uh, and then this is going to be of type string and we're going to make it required. And then inside of here, we can specify the name of the resolver and pass in that argument conversation ID. Perfect, and this mutation only returns a Boolean, so we don't need to specify the return type here. Okay, let's go back to our conversations list. Now we actually have a way to call this delete conversation mutation. Okay, let's make this type safe. So let's pass in some generic types here. The first one is going to be the data we get back. That is going to be just an object with this resolver name on it with the Boolean that is being returned. And the variables we need to pass to this mutation is just a conversation ID. Awesome, that is it. That is all we need to do. Or actually, sorry, we need to actually bring in the function that is returned to us from the use mutation hook. So delete conversation. And this is the function we're going to call in this function on delete conversation down here. Okay, so in the on delete conversation, we want to log the error if one occurs. So let's add one on delete conversation error. And in the try block, I'm going to show you something cool you can do with toast, React toast. Um, there's this thing or there's a function on React toast called promise. And um, so rather than having to like send a promise, like by calling this delete conversation function, and like doing this, and then if it succeeds, display like a uh, toast message. We can actually do something pretty cool. If we go to the React docs, we can show like a loading state for our, our on our toast message, which is really cool. So we can say toast promise. I just wanna show you this um, React hot toast. React hot toast, I'm gonna show you the promise example. Promise, so if I click this, you see you have like this loading state. If I click it, saving, and then it tells you if it was successful or not. So yeah, we can, we can essentially um, pass in a asynchronous function to the toast.promise function. And when this function is 
resolved, like when it has successfully resolved, it will display the successful thing. Like, oh, could not save, or if an error occurred. Um, why is it saying an error occurred now? Okay, <laughs> so sometimes it displays, it, this shows you that there's an error state as well as a success state. The cool thing is, is, the, is the loading state. I think it's random, like what it returns. So yeah, there's some little little documentations here about, you know, you have toast.promise, you pass in an asynchronous function. As the promise is being resolved, it will show the loading state. If it is successful, it will show you whatever you define here. And if there's an error, it will show you whatever you can define here as the developer. Okay, so inside of here, as we can see from the docs, the first function needs to be an asynchronous function, and that's going to be our uh, delete conversation function. All we need to pass in here is just our variables, which is going to be our conversation ID. Okay, now the second argument that we need to pass in here is this object. Hang on, um, let me get the syntax right, I promise. I think it's below here. Yes, okay, so um, after this second, or this curly bracket here, we want to specify this object, and we need to tell React Hot Toast what we want to display in the toast message when these three states are occurring. So for our loading state, uh, we're just going to display deleting conversation. If this succeeds, we're going to display conversation deleted, and if there is an error, we're going to say fail to delete conversation. Perfect. Okay, um, one other thing we want to do if a conversation is deleted, like say I'm looking at this conversation with Safari, and Safari deletes this conversation with Chrome, and Chrome gets that event. I want to redirect Chrome to the home page and like deselect this conversation pretty much because uh, the conversation will not exist anymore. So from a user experience point of view, I guess it's good to just kind of redirect them. Okay, so how can we do that? Well, we can specify inside of our delete conversation function an update callback. Remember this update callback? We were using this to update our cache. Okay, so what we want to do inside of here when this query succeeds is basically remove this ID from the router. Sorry, not from the router, <laughs> from the query parameters using the router. So we can say router.replace, and we want to replace the current path with the home page. So we are going to be using our next public base URL environment variable here. Um, and so just to satisfy TypeScript, we need to check first that the type of that environment variable is a string. If it is, we can successfully or safely, I guess, push that um, value to the URL. If, if it's undefined, we just will push an empty string. So what we're gonna do is write a, boole or a turning operator here that uh, checks the type of that variable. And that variable is going to be process.env. And it's going to be the next public base URL. And we want to check if the type of this is equal to string. If it is, we just simply want to push that to the URL. So we want to return process.env <clears throat> dot next public base URL. <clears throat> if not, we're just going to push an empty string. And this is just to satisfy TypeScript. Cool. Okay. And that is it for this function. That is literally all we need to do. And we're going to test this out shortly here. So we are not calling this yet on delete conversation. Um, so we're not passing it to our conversation item yet. So let's do that. We're going to say on delete conversation. But first, let's go into the props here. I think we have this commented out on delete conversation. And let's come back here and declare that on delete conversation. It's going to be equal to on delete conversation. Okay, so now we should have a way to do this. All right, so what should happen here if everything went smoothly? Um, so let's talk about the data flow. So Safari should 
delete this, or he will click this. Actually, hang on. Okay, and then let's go make sure that we're actually calling the function. So here we can do that. And we need to destructure this from the props. Okay, and this is mad. Why is this mad? Can't invoke an object which is possibly undefined. Oh, I have this as optional, so that TypeScript didn't freak out, but now we can make it required. So if I fire off this mutation, we should delete the conversation, but we're not actually updating the cache yet to remove it from our client React application data. Like it's not going to be removed from the cache because we have not yet defined the deleted conversation or sorry, conversation deleted subscription. And that is where we're going to handle that. So if I delete this, see that's the toast thing. Cool, so it actually deleted the conversation, <laughs> redirected me to the homepage, which is good, that, that's, that's working. But the conversation is still in my UI. If I refresh this though, it should be gone. So I just deleted the conversation with Safari, which is over here. So yeah, it still exists, even though it was deleted because we haven't received the subscription yet. But if I refresh, it will be gone. Cool, so conversations are actually being deleted, which is good. Our toast is working. And so now to make our UI update in real time, we need to just invoke our conversation deleted subscription. Okay, so as you can see here, I have a bunch of borders and I've been digging into this weird problem with the width of this conversation wrapper component. And basically what was happening, which we saw before, is that if like a long message is sent, this container will grow due to the lengthy latest message body. And I have been diving into this for the past like 30 minutes and I couldn't figure out why it's this weird CSS bug because our CSS is the exact same as my demo project. However, I don't have that issue in the demo project. Um, so let me show you the current behavior just so we can revisit this. So we have, um, let me just write along this message here. So just watch how the, the width of this is going to increase with the latest message. So that's terrible. I dislike that a lot. Um, why this is happening, I have no idea because we have set the width of this box, of the conversation wrapper to 430 pixels. I actually increased it, it used to be 400. What I did was inside of conversation list, this, it's currently 100%, but that's problematic and I don't know why. For some reason, if I delete the long message, okay, so we should always have a width of 400 pixels because that's what we've specified, right? Like even, even the styles are being picked up here as 400 pixels. Um, but for some reason it's being computed as two, like less than 400. Like I, I, don't, I don't, I really don't understand what's happening here because this is specified to be with the width of 100% and the parent of this is this box here, which has a width of 400 pixels. So this should also have a width of 400 pixels. That makes no sense to me. I honestly have no idea what's going on and we have the same exact code as my demo. So uh, don't know why. So what I did to fix this was um, I increased the conversations, or I didn't increase, I changed the width of this to match the 400 pixels. Um, but then we run into this sort of like padding issue. So to fix that, I increased this to 430 um, I think I can actually make this 432. Yeah, so see, I, I don't really know what's going on. Something weird's happening with the computed styles. Honestly, I don't know, it's weird. I wish I had a better answer. I think I'm gonna investigate this after because I it's bugging me a lot because <laughs> um, it's the same as the demo. Anyway, uh, change this from 100% to 400 pixels and change this to 430 pixels. Don't know why this is happening. Um, I'm going to remove all these borders and we're just going to proceed. This is better than what we had before, but I'm still not totally thrilled with it. And I'm gonna dig into this a little bit after. Uh, one pixel solid blue, I'm just deleting these borders. <clears throat> okay, so that's that. Again, don't know what's happening. The, it's still responsive, which is like fine. Um, and it looks good at screen sizes. 
that are that are all screen sizes pretty much. Um, and so now if I write a long message, blah 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 blah, that con- container won't actually grow, which is good. That, that's much better than what we had before. So yeah, um, I wish the CSS was more explainable. <laughs> that's just how she goes sometimes. So let's move on. <laughs> um, okay. One other thing, actually, that we need to do inside of our conversation wrapper is add the ability for a user to log out. And actually, I think that's in conversation list. Yeah, we have a log out button that we're going to display at the bottom here. You may have been wondering how we're supposed to log out. Um, and it's actually going to be underneath this here. So here we're going to create a box and I'm gonna add a border of one pixel solid red so we can see what we're doing here. So this is currently right here. Uh, What I'm going to do is make this absolute positioning and position it at the very bottom of the container. So let's add some styles here. Okay, so we're gonna add um, position This is going to be equal to absolute. So this will change the the position a bit. And then we can specify where in this container we want this thing to be. And I'm gonna say bottom zero. So this means we want it zero pixels from the bottom of the screen. So you can see the little dots down there. Uh, I'm gonna make left also equal to zero to put it on the very left. Um, And I'm going to make the width 100%. Now I'm kind of scared about this width 100% thing. (laughs) Okay, so this made it 100% of the whole thing. So I think to fix that, we are going to want to make, is this the uppermost parent? Yeah, if we made the position of this relative. Okay, but this, does this not have a height of 100%? Like, I don't know, these styles are so much different than what I'm seeing. Uh, in the demo. Okay, so I'm not sure what side effects this is going to have, so I apologize if this is giving you like weird issues. Um, so if we add a relative positioning to this box here, this will be positioned absolute relative to the parent. That's sort of what that means. Without position relative here, it's uh, going to be relative to the entire window. So you can see it's like at the very bottom of the window and it goes across the whole thing. So we want to tell uh, CSS that we want it to be relative to this particular component here. Okay, Um, hmm. I'm kind of frustrated with CSS right now. CSS is just annoying sometimes. (laughs) Padding X, we're going to give this a value of eight and padding Y, we're going to give this a value of six. What is going on here? Okay. So inside of this, uh, so you can see that box looks like that. Inside of here, we're going to add a button and this button is going to have logout. And we're going to um, give this button a width of 100%. 100%, so it spans the whole thing. And then on click, we are just going to call that logout or sign out function, I guess. I don't know if this is going to, yeah. <clears throat> so import this from next auth react right here. So now we actually have a way to log out and actually I don't think we need that much padding. Mm, if I got rid of this, I think that looks fine. If I remove the border, it will look better. Okay, so what is this going to look like if I go to back? Okay, now we have this issue. <laughs> Wait, what was that? Oh man, okay, we just, we just, we just, I just came into another bug here and it has to do with this. <laughs> I might have to add a media query to this box here. I'm gonna, yeah, to the width, I'm gonna say, um, sorry guys, I know this is kind of annoying. At base, so screen sizes, I'm gonna make this 100%. And at medium, I'm gonna make it 400 pixels. Okay, so that's that. There we go. Okay, so now we don't have that weird thing. Okay, <clears throat> and this logout button looks pretty good as well. Perfect. We don't really need this padding Y, and we don't need that border anymore. 
Cool. So s- I apologize if this causes any styling issues on your end. Um, no idea what's happening here. Um, I'm also going to actually add an overflow of hidden to this so that if you had like a bunch of conversations, it doesn't grow the container. In theory, that's what it should do because that's what my demo does. <laughs> uh, again, I apologize if you're seeing weird behavior with the styling. But we now have a logout button, which is good, and it looks good on mobile. Click on this. The feed looks good and go back. Looks good on the tablet sizes as well as <clears throat> desktop. If I click log out, I get signed out. I can continue with Google if I want to sign back in. Cool. Okay. So, sorry, I just need to add that logout button because I kind of pushed that to the bottom of the list and then it slipped by me. <clears throat> Okay, so now after all that annoying CSS stuff, we can move on back to the conversation deletion flow. Sorry, that was a little bit of an interruption there. So let's close these front end components. Um, and let's go, okay, so our back end is done for the uh, conversation deleted subscription. We did that already. Uh, what we need to do is define that in the conversations wrapper and actually like trigger that subscription, similar to what we were doing with the uh, conversation updated subscription. It's going to look very similar. <clears throat> okay, so just underneath this conversation updated one, let's create our conversation deleted subscription. So we can bring in the use subscription hook. We can pass in two generic types. We're going to need to define an interface for the data here. So let's go ahead and do that just underneath conversation updated data. Um, oh, and by the way, we actually didn't have an issue with this that I've seen yet, <laughs> actually. Uh, so I'm just going to remove that. And let's create a interface for conversation deleted data. The structure of this is going to have the um, subscription name on it. And this is going to map to an object with the return type, which we are returning an ID of the deleted conversation. <clears throat> or not returning it, we're actually like receiving it um, through this subscription. That is the, the payload of the return type. Okay, now in here, we can pass this as a generic uh, to this first generic type. We can say conversation deleted data. We are not passing in any variables, so we can just say null. The first argument here is going to be our subscription GraphQL document. So subscriptions.conversation deleted. Perfect. And then as a second argument, whoops, as a second argument here, we can configure what we want to do with these callback functions. And we are again going to use our on data callback function because when we receive this data, um, when we when the subscription is fired on the client, we want to remove this conversation from the cache. And we're going to do that by reading queries and writing queries again. It's pretty straightforward uh, compared to the other one. Okay, so our on data function is a callback, and this callback is going to receive both the client as well as the actual subscription data. It's through this client instance that we're going to actually write to the cache. Um, before we do that though, let's just log the data to see if this is actually happening. So let's refresh Chrome, and um, I'm gonna create a conversation with Safari. open up Safari here and we'll be like, hey Safari. Okay, so we have a little chat here. Hey dude, whoops, I did not say hey dude. <laughs> okay, so now what I wanna do is make, I'm gonna have Chrome delete, sorry, no, I'm gonna have Safari delete this conversation with Chrome and we should in the console see this log here. Uh, here is sub data and the data should contain this ID, uh, of the, the ID of the deleted conversation which is this uh, one here. Okay, so let's see if this works. Our server is successfully running. Delete. Okay, yeah, so it worked. Conversation was deleted. Um, it wasn't removed from the, the UI, but that's what we're doing right now. We got that 
event here. Here is some data. So if I look inside of this, there's data, conversation deleted, and then the, yes, the ID of the deleted conversation is in there. And so now we can use this to remove it from the cache so that our UI actually updates. So here's how we can do that. <clears throat> um, we are going to destructure the data from the data. It's kind of like this nested thing. And this is going to be aliased as subscription data for a bit more clarity. And we're just going to say, if no subscription data, return early. Okay. Then what we're going to do is uh, grab the existing conversations query from the cache. Uh, and we're going to do that using our client instance. And we're going to say read query. The structure of the data that we're pulling from the cache here is going to have the type conversation data. So it's going to have uh, key conversations that maps to an array of populated conversations. And, uh, and then inside of here, we want to specify what query document we are reading from. And that is going to be conversation operations, whoops, conversation operations dot queries dot conversations. Okay, and that's like all of the conversations, all, all of this user's conversations. And what we want to do is filter this state to essentially um, remove the ID from the deleted one coming from the subscription data. So what we want to do is grab um, the conversations. Sorry, we're going to destructure the conversations from existing, but first let's add an if statement here to make sure that this exists. So we we'll say if no existing, then return. Then down here we can safely destructure conversations. Um, and then we want to grab the ID of the new conversation from the subscription data. So we want to grab the conversation deleted. Inside of here, we want to grab the ID and I'm going to alias this as deleted conversation ID. Perfect. Now what we need to do is write back to the cache. We need to somehow um, update or create some sort of representation of the updated conversations query and then write that back to the cache so that our UI will update. So we can say client dot write query. Again, we are going to specify the type of conversations data here. The query we are updating is the same one conversation operations dot queries dot conversations. Now the data that we're going to write into this part of the cache, we want to be a, well, we want it to be an array that no longer contains this particular conversation. So we want to filter this existing array. So the value of conversations is going to be conversations, whoops, um, which is coming from existing, but we want to filter this to remove that one that was deleted. So we want to say conversation and we want to write a filter function that checks to make sure that this particular conversation does not or the, the particular conversation ID does not equal to the deleted conversation ID. Awesome. That is it for that. So now uh, we should be able to, let's refresh here. Refresh. Ooh, okay, what is this? Header. So I seem to have solved the problem. I'm just changing the way we're doing things. I'm going to remove this if statement. I don't remember what the purpose of this was. I'm going to remove that. Um, and instead, what we're going to do to reroute the user is at the bottom here, inside of our on data function, I'm just going to push the home URL, so the index route, to the router uh, path. And this will take the user home. So now, if I show this between, this is again Chrome and Safari, if I create a conversation with Safari, and then I delete this, it should be removed from both users. Um, conversation list. Okay, so if I create one from here, Chrome, 
Uh, what's going on here? Do we just have to refresh? Sometimes there's like some weird hot reloading issues. Hey dude. Sup bro. <laughs> okay, anyway, the point of all of this is I should be able to delete this conversation. What should happen is it's removed from both Safari's and Chrome's list, and then they're both redirected to the home page. Or not the home page, but just it deselects the conversation. So delete. And there we go. And it does. So in real time, they're both brought to conversation selected, or sorry, the component that says no conversation selected, which we're actually going to create in a second here to make this look a bit better. So yeah, we can now delete conversations. Um, if I have this behavior, so here we have this group chat between all three of these people. I'm gonna refresh Firefox due to the hot reloading stuff. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, if I delete this, it should be removed from all of these users. Nice, and it is, that's perfect. So let's do that one more time. So let's create a conversation with Safari and Chrome. It appears in both their screens. And now let's uh, let's delete it from here. Chrome's like, I don't wanna be in this conversation. And then it deletes. Awesome, so this is a little bit different from the editing conversation functionality because we're not building the leaving of conversations in this tutorial. Um, so we're just deleting it for every other user in the conversation. Um, so if you want to build the leaving functionality, do see the source code in the main repo in my on my GitHub, and I will link that in the description. Cool, so now we can successfully delete conversations. Okay, um, one very last thing that we have to do is I'm just going to create this no conversation selected component. And this was inside of our feed wrapper. We're basically saying if the um, if there is no conversation ID in the URL, show this no conversation selected component. And we just had it at this like dummy div here. And so what I'm going to do is create a component called no conversation selected. I'm just going to paste this in from my demo project. Um, we can create a feed component here. Inside of feed, let's create a component called no conversation selected.tsx. And I'm going to paste this in here. So I'm going to remove this modal context code because that is created as part of like the editing of conversations flow. Uh, so we're not going to have that. This just needs to be, what is this? Conversation. There we go. We don't have this model here. Um, we're not gonna have the ability to create a conversation from here. So I'm going to remove this ternary operator. Save this. Let's come to our feed wrapper. Rather than this empty div, let's show our no conversation selected, or I guess that's what the component's called. And this is what that component looks like. So basically inside of this, um, this component here, we were querying for the user's conversations. And if they do have conversations, um, it's gonna prompt them to select one. And if they don't, it's like basically a new user. So it's saying, let's get started. Um, and yeah, that's kind of like the welcome message here. So if a user, creates, I wanna show you what I mean by the this logic here. So if we create a conversation with Safari, okay, so that changes to select conversation because now Safari has conversations. Um, so if I click on this, um, what I'll do is I'm gonna create another conversation here. Yeah, with Chrome from Firefox. Okay, so then if Chrome <laughs> deletes the conversation with Safari, yeah, he's rerouted to the home page, and it says select conversation now because he he has a, uh, at least one conversation. Uh, if he deletes this, it will change to let's get started. So that is that component there. There were some modifications we made. All right, you guys, that is going to conclude the iMessage build. This has been an absolutely wild ride. We have written so much code, um, and we've explored so many new topics and have built some really interesting features. I really hope you learned a lot following along this project about both front end and back end development. If you are having any issues with your project, 
please do join my Discord and chat with me or post in the um, in the question form there. The community is pretty active and is very willing to help you out. I'm trying to figure out how I can post more often, so I might be doing like smaller short form content, um, maybe like some like 10 to 12 minute videos. And I want to keep releasing builds as well. So I'm gonna try my best to produce as much content as I possibly can with the time I have. Um, so thank you all so much for the support on this channel and this series. I really, really appreciate you all. I hope you've learned a ton in this project. I hope you're feeling more comfortable with all these technologies that we have used. And again, if there's any feedback you have, please let me know in the comments or in my Discord. I would love to hear from you. Thank you guys so much once again, and I will see you next time.